It can't happen here, St. Clair Lewis, Chapter 18, in the little towns, ah, there is the abiding peace that I love, and that can never be disturbed by even the noisiest smart Alex from these haughty megalopolises like Washington, New York, and etc., zero hour, Basilius Windrip, Doremus's policy of wait and see, like most Fabian policies, had grown shaky. It seemed particularly shaky in June, 1937, when he drove to North Beulah for the 40th graduation anniversary of his class in Isaiah College. As the custom was, the returned alumni wore comic costumes. His class had sailor suits, but they walked about, bald-headed and lugubrious, in these well-meant garments of joy, and there was a look of instability even in the eyes of the three members who were ardent corpos, being local corpo commissioners. After the first hour Doremus saw little of his classmates. He had looked up his familiar correspondent, Victor Loveland, teacher in the classical department who, a year ago, had informed him of President Owen J. Peasley's ban on criticism of military training. At its best, Loveland's jerry-built imitation of an Anne Hathaway cottage had been no palace as our assistant professors did not customarily rent palaces. Now, with a pretentiously smart living room heaped with burlap-covered chairs and roll drugs and boxes of books, it looked like a junk shop. Amid the wreckage sat Loveland, his wife, his three children, and one Dr. Arnold King, experimenter in chemistry. What's all this? said Doremus. I've been fired. As too radical, growled Loveland. Yes. And his most vicious attack has been on Glicknose's treatment of the use of the aorist in Hesiod, wailed his wife. Well, I deserve it for not having been vicious about anything since AD 300. Only thing I'm ashamed of is that they're not firing me for having taught my students that the corpos have taken most of their ideas from Tiberius, or maybe for having decently tried to assassinate District Commissioner Reek. Said Loveland, where are you going? Inquired Doremus, that's just it. We don't know. Oh, first to my dad's house which is a six-room packing box in Burlington dad's got diabetes. But teaching President Peasley kept putting off signing my new contract and just informed me ten days ago that I'm through much too late to get a job for next year. Myself, I don't care a damn. Really I don't. I'm glad to have been made to admit that as a college professor I haven't been, as I so like to convince myself, any Erasmus Jr., inspiring noble young souls to dream of chaste classic beauty save the mark exclamation mark but just a plain hired man, another counter jumper in the markdown classics goods department, with students for board customers, and as subject to being hired and fired as any janitor. Do you remember that in Imperial Rome, the teachers, even the tutors of the nobility, were slaves allowed a lot of leeway, I suppose, in their theories about the anthropology of Crete, but just as likely to be strangled as the other slaves. I'm not kicking. Dr. King, the chemist, interrupted with a whoop, sure you're kicking. Why the hell not? With three kids? Why not kick? Now me, I'm lucky. I'm half Jew one of these sneaking, cunning Jews that Buzz Windrup and his boyfriend Hitler tell you about, so cunning I suspected what was going on months ago and so I've also just been fired, Mr. Jessup I arranged for a job with the Universal Electric Corporation. They don't mind Jews there as long as they sing at their work and find boondoggles worth a million a year to the company at 3,500 a year salary. A fond farewell to all my grubby students. Though and Doremus thought he was, at heart, sadder than Loveland I do kind of hate to give up my research. Oh, hell with them. The version of Owen J. Peasley, M.A. or Berlin, LL.D. Connecticut State, president of Isaiah College, was quite different. Why no, Mr. Jessup, we believe absolutely in freedom of speech and thought, here at Old Isaiah. The fact is that we are letting Loveland go only because the classics department is overstuffed so little demand for Greek and Sanskrit and so on, you know, with all this modern interest in quantitative biophysics and aeroplane repairing and so on. But as to Dr. King um, I'm afraid we did a little feel that he was riding for a fall, boasting about being a Jew and all, you know, and but can't we talk of pleasanter subjects? You have probably learned that Secretary of Culture McGoblin has now completed his plan for the appointment of a Director of Education in each province and district question mark and that Professor Amrick Trout of Ormbury University is slated for Director in our Northeastern province? Well, I have something very gratifying to add. Dr. Trout and what a profound scholar, what an eloquent orator he is exclamation mark did you knows that in Teutronic Amrick means noble prince question mark and he's been so kind as to designate me as director of education for the Vermont New Hampshire district. Isn't that thrilling? I wanted you to be one of the first to hear it, Mr. Jessup, 
because of course one of the chief jobs of the director will be to work with and through the newspaper editors in the great task of spreading correct corporate ideals and combating false theories yes, oh yes. It seemed as though a large number of people were zealous to work with and through the editors these days, thought Doemus. He noticed that President Peasley resembled a dummy made of faded grey flannel of a quality intended for petticoats in an orphan asylum. The minute men's organization was less favored in the state villages than in the industrial centers, but all through the summer it was known that a company of M. M's had been formed in Fort Beulah and were drilling in the armory under National Guard officers and County Commissioner Lee Jew, who was seen sitting up nights in his luxurious new room in Mrs. Ingert's boarding house, reading a manual of arms. But Doremus declined to go look at them, and when his rustic but ambitious reporter, Doc, otherwise Otis, Itchit, came in throbbing about the M. M's and wanted to run an illustrated account in the Saturday Informer, Doremus sniffed, it was not till their first public parade, in August, that Doremus saw them, and not gladly, the whole countryside had turned out, he could hear them laughing and shuffling beneath his office window, but he stubbornly stuck to editing an article on fertilizers for cherry orchards. And he loved parades, childishly, not even the sound of a band pounding out Bula, Bula drew him to the window. Then he was plucked up by Dan Wilgus, the veteran job compositor and head of the informer chapel, a man tall as a house and possessed of such a sweeping black moustache as had not otherwise been seen since the passing of the old-time bartender. You got to take a look, boss, great show implored Dan, through the Chester Arthur, red brick brissiness of President Street, Doremus saw marching a surprisingly well-drilled company of young men in the uniforms of Civil War cavalrymen, and just as they were opposite the informer office, the town band rollicked into marching through Georgia. The young men smiled, they stepped more quickly, and held up their banner with a steering wheel and demem upon it, when he was ten. Doremus had seen in this self-same street a Memorial Day parade of the G.A.R. The veterans were an average of under fifty then, and some of them only thirty-five, they had swung ahead lightly and gaily and to the tune of marching through Georgia. So now in 1937 he was looking down again on the veterans of Gettysburg and Missionary Ridge. Oh he could see the more Uncle Tom Vida, who had made him the willow whistles, old Mr. Crowley with his cornflower eyes. Jack Greenhill who played leapfrog with the kids and who was to die in Ethan Creek they found him with thick hair dripping. Doremus thrilled to the M.M. flags, the music, the valiant young men, even while he hated all they marched for, and hated the shad Jew whom he incredulously recognized in the brawny horseman at the head of the procession. He understood now why the young men marched to war. But oh you think so? He could hear shad sneering through the music. The unwieldy humor characteristic of American politicians persisted even through the eruption. Doremus read about and sardonically played up in the informer a minstrel show given at the National Convention of Boosters Clubs at Atlantic City, late in August. As Inman and Interlocutor appeared no less distinguished persons than Secretary of the Treasury Webster R. Skittle, Secretary of War Luthorne, and Secretary of Education and Public Relations, Dr. McGoblin. It was good, old-time Elks Club humor, uncorroded by any of the notions of dignity and of international obligations which, despite his great services, that queer stick Lee Saracen was suspected of trying to introduce. Why, marveled the boosters, the big boys were so democratic that they even kidded themselves and the corpos, that's how unassuming they were. Who was this lady I see in you going down the street with? Demanded the plump Mr. Secretary Skittle, disguised as a colored wench in polka-dotted cotton, of Mr. Secretary Luthorne in black face and large red gloves, that wasn't no lady, that was Walt Trowbridge's paper, ah don't think car cognosticates yous, Mr. Bones, why you know a nans for plutocracy, clean fun, not too confusingly subtle, drawing the people, several millions listened on the radio to the Boosters Club show, closer to their great-hearted masters, but the high point of the show was Dr. McGoblin's daring to tease his own faction by singing, buzz and booze and biz, what fun, this job gets drearier and drearier, when I get out of Washington, I'm going to Siberia, it seemed to Doremus that he was hearing a great deal about the Secretary of Education. Then, in late September, he heard something not quite pleasant about Dr. McGoblin. The story, as he got it, ran thus. Hector McGoblin, that great surgeon boxer poet sailor, had always contrived to have plenty of enemies, but after the beginning of his investigation of schools, to purge them of any teachers he did not happen to like, he made so unusually many that he was accompanied by bodyguards. At this time in September, he was in New York, finding quantities of subversive elements in Columbia University against the protests of President Nicholas Murray Butler, who insisted that he had already cleaned out all willful and dangerous thinkers, 
especially the pacifists in the medical school and Magoblin's bodyguards were two former instructors in philosophy who in their respective universities had been admired even by their deans for everything except the fact that they would get drunk and quarrelsome. One of them, in that state, always took off one shoe and hit people over the head with the heel, if they argued in defense of Jung. With these two in uniforms as a member battalion leaders his own was that of a brigadier after a day usefully spent in kicking out of Columbia all teachers who had voted for Trowbridge. Dr. McGoblin started off with his brace of bodyguards to try out a wager that he could take a drink at every bar on 52nd Street and still not pass out. He had done well when, at 10.30, being then affectionate and philanthropic, he decided that it would be a splendid idea to telephone his revered former teacher in Leland Stanford, the biologist Dr. Willy Schmidt, once of Vienna, now in Rockefeller Institute. McGoblin was indignant when someone at Dr. Schmidt's apartment informed him that the doctor was out. Furiously, out? Out? What do you mean he's out? Old goat like that got no right to be out. At midnight. Where is he? This is the police department speaking. Where is he? Dr. Schmidt was spending the evening with that gentle scholar, Rabbi Dr. Vincent de Veras. McGoblin and his learned gorillas went to call on de Veras. On the way nothing of note happened except that when McGoblin discussed the fare with the taxi driver, he felt impelled to knock him out. The three, and they were in the happiest, most boyish of spirits burst joyfully into Dr. Davieras's primeval house in the sixties. The entrance hall was shabby enough, with a humble show of the good rabbi's umbrellas and storm rubbers, and had the invaders seen the bedrooms they would have found them trappist cells. But the long living room, front and back parlor thrown together, was half museum, half lounge. Just because he himself liked such things and resented a stranger's possessing them, McGiblin looked sniffily at a Belushi prayer rug a Jacobean court cupboard, a small case of incunabula and of Arabic manuscripts in silver upon scarlet parchment, swell joint. Hello, Doc. How's the Dutchman? How's the antibody research going? These are Doc Nemo and Doc, ah, uh, Doc Wooses, the famous glue lifters. Great friends mine. Introduce us to your Jew friend. Now it is more than possible that Rabbi Davires had never heard of Secretary of Education McGoblin. The houseman who had let in the intruders and who nervously hovered at the living room door he is the sole authority for most of the story said that McGoblin staggered, slid on a rug, almost fell, then giggled foolishly as he sat down, waving his plug ugly friends to chairs and demanding, Hey, Rabbi, how about some whiskey? Lil scotch and soda. I know you Johnum never lap up anything but snow cooled nectar handed out by a maiden with a dulcimer, singing of Mountebra, or maybe just a little shot of Christian children's sacrificial blood ha, ha. Just a joke, Rabbi, I know these protocols of the elders of Zion are all the bunk, but awful handy in propaganda, just the same and but I mean, for plain goyim like us, a little real hooch. Hear me? Dr. Schmidt started to protest. The Rabbi, who had been carding his white beard, silenced him and, with a wave of his fragile old hand, signaled the waiting houseman, who reluctantly brought in whiskey and siphons. The three coordinators of culture almost filled their glasses before they poured in the soda. Look here. Daviras, why don't you kikes take a tumble to yourselves and get out, beat it, exeunt bearing corpses, and start a real Zion, say in South America. The rabbi looked bewildered at the attack. Dr. Schmidt snorted, Dr. McGiblin once a promising pupil of mine is secretary of education and a lot of things I don't know what exclamation mark at Washington. Corpo, oh. The rabbi sighed. I have heard of that cult, but my people have learned to ignore persecution. We have been so impudent as to adopt the tactics of your early Christian martyrs. Even if we were invited to your corporate feast which, I understand, we most warmly are not exclamation mark I am afraid we should not be able to attend. You see, we believe in only one dictator, God, and I am afraid we cannot see Mr. Windrup as a rival to Jehovah. Ah, that's all baloney, murmured one of the learned gunmen, and McGoblin shouted, Oh, can the two dollar words. There's just one thing where we agree with the dirty, Kike loving communists that's in chucking a whole bunch of divinities, Jehovah and all the rest of them, that have been on relief so long. The rabbi was unable even to answer, but little Dr. Schmidt, he had a donut moustache, a beer belly, and black button boots with soles half an inch thick, said, Magoblin, I suppose I may talk frank with an old student, there not being any reporters or loudspeakers around. Do you know why you are drinking like a pig? Because you are ashamed. Ashamed that you, once a promising researcher, should have sold out to freebooters with brains like decayed Livrand. That'll do from you, Professor. Say, we ought to tie those seditious sons of hounds up and beat the daylight out of them. Whimpered one of the watchdogs, 
Mugoblin shrieked, you highbrows you stinking intellectuals. You, you kike, with your lush luxurious library, while common people been starving would be now if the chief hadn't saved them. Your collection books stolen from the pennies of your poor, dumb, foot-kissing congregation of pushcart peddlers. The rabbi sat bespelled, fingering his beard, but Dr. Schmidt leapt up, crying, you three scoundrels were not invited here. You pushed your way in. Get out. Go. Get out. One of the accompanying dogs demanded of Mugoblin, going to stand for these two yiddles insulting us insulting the whole by God Corp estate and the MM uniform? Kill them. Now, to his already abundant priming, Mugoblin had added two huge whiskies since he had come. He yanked out his automatic pistol, fired twice. Dr. Schmidt toppled. Rabbi Davira slid down in his chair, his temple throbbing at blood. The houseman trembled at the door, and one of the guards shot at him, then chased him down the street firing, and whooping with the humor of a joke. This learned guard was killed instantly, at a street crossing, by a traffic policeman, Mugoblin and the other guard were arrested and brought before the commissioner of the Metropolitan District, the great Corpo Viceroy, whose power was that of three or four state governors put together. Dr. Daveras, though he was not yet dead, was too sunken to testify. But the commissioner thought that in a case so closely touching the federal government, it would not be seemly to postpone the trial against the terrified evidence of the rabbi's Russian-Polish houseman were the earnest, and by now sober, accounts of the federal secretary of education, and of his surviving aide, formerly assistant professor of philosophy in Polis University. It was proven that not only Daveras but also Dr. Schmidt was a Jew which, incidentally, he 100% was not. It was almost proven that this sinister bear had been coaxing innocent corpos into Daveras's house and performing upon them what a scared little Jewish stool pigeon called ritual murders, Megablin and Friend were acquitted on grounds of self-defense and handsomely complimented by the commissioner and later in telegrams from President Windrup and Secretary of State Saracen for having defended the Commonwealth against human vampires and one of the most horrifying plots known in history. The policeman who had shot the other guard wasn't, so scrupulous was corporal justice, heavily punished merely sent out to a dreary beat in the Bronx. So everybody was happy. But Doremus Jessup, on receiving a letter from a New York reporter who had talked privately with the surviving guard, was not so happy. He was not in a very gracious temper, anyway. County Commissioner Shad Liju, on grounds of humanitarianism, had made him discharge his delivery boys and employ M. M's to distribute, or cheerfully chuck into the river, the informer. Last straw plenty last, he raged. He had read about Rabbi Davira's and seen pictures of him. He had once heard Dr. Willie Schmidt speak, when the State Medical Association had met at Fort Beulah, and afterward had sat near him at dinner. If they were murderous Jews, then he was a murderous Jew too, he swore, and it was time to do something for his own people. That evening it was late in September, 1937 he did not go home to dinner at all but, with a paper container of coffee and a slab of pie untouched before him, he stooped at his desk in the informer office, writing an editorial which, when he had finished it, he marked, must. Twelve pint bowl face box top front P. The beginning of the editorial, to appear the following morning was, Believing that the inefficiency and crimes of the Corpo administration were due to the difficulties attending a new form of government, we have waited patiently for their end. We apologize to our readers for that patience, it is easy to see now, in the revolting crime of a drunken cabinet member against two innocent and valuable old men like Dr. Schmidt and the Reverend Dr. Daveras, that we may expect nothing but murderous extirpation of all honest opponents of the tyranny of Windrup and his Corpo gang, not that all of them are as vicious as Megiblin. Some are merely incompetent like our friends Lee Ju, Reek, and Haig. But their ludicrous incapability permits the homicidal cruelty of their chieftains to go on without check, buzzard Windrip. The chief, and his pirate gang, a smallish, neat, grey-bearded man, furiously rattling an aged typewriter, typing with his two forefingers. Dan Wilgus, head of the composing room, looked and barked like an old sergeant and, like an old sergeant, was only theoretically meek to his superior officer. He was shaking when he brought in this copy and, almost rubbing Doremus's nose in it, protested, Say, boss, you don't honest T God think we're going to set this up, do you? I certainly do. Well, I don't. Rattlesnake poison. It's all right you're getting thrown in the Husagau and probably shot at dawn, if you like that kind of sport, but we've held a meeting of the chapel, and we all say, damned if we'll risk our necks too. All right, you yellow pup. All right, Dan, I'll set it myself or, don't. Gosh, I don't want to have to go to your funeral after the M. M's get through with you, 
and say, don't he look unnatural, after working for me for twenty years, Dan. Traitor, look here. I'm no Enoch Arden or oh, what the hell was his name question mark Ethan Froome or Benedict Arnold or whatever it was exclamation mark and more and once I've licked some galoot that was standing around a saloon telling the world you were the lousiest highbrow editor in Vermont, and at that, I guess maybe he was telling the truth. But same time Dan's effort to be a humorous and coaxing broke, and he wailed, God, boss, please don't, I know, Dan. Probably our friend Chad Lee you will be annoyed. But I can't go on standing things like slaughtering old Daveras anymore and here. Gimme that copy. While compositors, pressmen, and the young devil stood alternately fretting and snickering at his clumsiness, Doremus ranged up before a typecase, in his left hand the first composing stick he had held in ten years and looked doubtfully at the case. It was like a labyrinth to him. Forgot how it's arranged. Can't find anything except the e-box. He complained, hell. I'll do it. All you pussyfooters get the hell out of this. You don't know one doggone thing about who set this up. Dan Wilkes roared, and the other printers vanished exclamation mark as far as the toilet door. In the editorial office, Doremus showed proofs of his indiscretion to Doc Hitchett, that enterprising though awkward reporter, and to Julian Falk, who was off now to Amherst but who had been working for the Informer all summer, combining unprintable articles on Adam Smith with extremely printable accounts of golf and dances at the country club. Gee, I hope you will have the nerve to go on and print it in same time, I hope you don't. They'll get you. Worried Julian, nor. Gwen and print it. They won't dare to do a thing. They may get funny in New York and Washington, but you're too strong in the Beulah Valley for lead you and Storbmeyer to dare lift a hand. Bray Doc Hitchett, while Doremus considered, I wonder if this smart young journalistic Judas wouldn't like to see me in trouble and get hold of the informer and turn it corpo. He did not stay at the office till the paper with his editorial had gone to press. He went home early, and showed the proof to Emma and Sissy. While they were reading it, with yelps of disapproval, Julian Falk slipped in. Emma protested, Oh, you can't you mustn't do it. What will become of us all? Honestly, Dormouse, I'm not scared for myself. But what would I do if they beat you or put you in prison or something? It would just break my heart to think of you in a cell. And without any clean underclothes. It isn't too late to stop it, is it? No. As a matter of fact the paper doesn't go to bed till eleven. Sissy, what do you think? I don't know what to think. Oh damn, why Sissy, from Emma, quite mechanically. It used to be, you did what was right and got a nice stick of candy for it, said Sissy. Now, it seems as if whatever's right is wrong. Julian funny face what do you think of Pops kicking Shad in his sweet hairy ears, why, sis, Julian blurted, I think it'd be fierce if somebody didn't try to stop these fellows. I wish I could do it. But how could I, you've probably answered the whole business, said Doremus. If a man is going to assume the right to tell several thousand readers what's what most agreeable, hitherto he's got a kind of you might say priestly obligation to tell the truth. Oh cursed spite. Well, I think I'll drop into the office again home about midnight. Don't sit up, anybody and sissy, and you, Julian, that particularly goes for you two night prowlers. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord and in Vermont, that means going to bed, and alone. Murmured sissy, why Cecilia's sup? As Doremus trotted out, foolish, who had sat adoring him, jumped up, hoping for a run, somehow, more than all of Emma's imploring. The dog's familiar devotion made Doremus feel what it might be to go to prison. He had lied, he did not return to the office. He drove up the valley to the tavern and to Lerinda Bike. But on the way he stopped in at the home of his son-in-law, bustling young Dr. Fowler Greenhill, not to show him the proof but to have perhaps in prison question mark another memory of the domestic life in which he had been rich. He stepped quietly into the front hall of the Greenhill house a jaunty imitation of Mount Vernon, very prosperous and secure, gay with a brass knobbed walnut furniture and painted Russian boxes which Mary Greenhill affected. Doremus could hear David, but surely it was past his bedtime question mark what time did nine-year-old kids go to bed these degenerate days? Excitedly chattering with his father, and his father's partner, old Dr. Marcus Elmstead, who was almost retired but who kept up the obstetrics and iron deer work for the firm, Doremus peeped into the living room, with its bright curtains of yellow linen. David's mother was writing letters, a crisp, fashionable figure at a maple desk complete with yellow quill pen, engraved notepaper and silver-backed blotter. Fowler and David were lounging on the two wide arms of Dr. Olmsted's chair. So you don't think you'll be a doctor, like your dad and me? Dr. Olmsted was quizzing, 
David's soft hair fluttered as he bobbed his head in the agitation of being taken seriously by grown-ups. Oh, oh, oh yes, I would like to. Oh, I think it'd be slick to be a doctor. But I want to be a newspaper, like Grandad. That'd be a wow. You said it, David. Where you ever pick up such language, you see, Uncle Doctor, a doctor, oh gee. He has to stay up all night, but an editor, he just sits in his office and takes it easy and never has to worry about nothing. That moment, Foul Greenhill saw his further-in-law making monkey faces at him from the door and admonished David, now, not always. Editors have to work pretty hard sometimes just think of when there's train wrecks and floods and everything. I'll tell you. Did you know I have magic power? What's magic power, Daddy? I'll show you. I'll summon your granddad here from Misty Deeps. But will he come? Grunted Dr. Olmstead. And have him tell you all the troubles an editor has. Just make him come flying through the air, or, gee, you couldn't do that, Dad. Oh, can't I? Fowler stood solemnly, the overhead lights making soft his harsh red hair, and he windmilled his arms, hooting, presto vesto ad sit grandad's sub voila, and there, coming through the doorway, sure enough was grandad Jessup. Doremus remained only ten minutes, saying to himself, anyway, nothing bad can happen here, in this solid household. When Fowler saw him to the door, Doremus sighed to him, wished Davy were right just had to sit in the office and not worry. But I suppose someday I'll have a run-in with the corpos, I hope not. Nasty bunch. What do you think, Dad? That swine Chad Liju told me yesterday they wanted me to join the M. M's as medical officer. Fat chance. I told him so, watch out for Shad, Fowler. He's vindictive. Made us rewire our whole building, I'm not scared of Captain General Liju or 50 like him. Hope he calls me in for a bellyache someday. I'll give him a good sedative potassium of cyanide. Maybe I'll someday have the pleasure of seeing that gent in his coffin. That's the advantage the doctor has, you know. Gee night, dad. Sleep tight. A good many tourists were still coming up from New York to view the colored autumn of the month. And when Doremus arrived at the Beulah Valley Tavern he had irritably to wait while Lorinda dug out extra towels and looked up tram schedules and was polite to old ladies who complained that there was too much or not enough sound from the Beulah River Falls at night. He could not talk to her apart until after ten. There was, meanwhile, a curious exalted luxury in watching each last minute threaten him with the approach of the final press time, as he sat in the tea room, imperturbably scratching through the leaves of the latest fortune. Lorinda led him, at 10.15, into her little office just a roll-top desk, a desk chair, one straight chair, and a table piled with heaps of defunct hotel magazines. It was spinsterishly neat yet smelled still of the cigar smoke and old letter files of proprietors long since gone. Let's hurry, door. I'm having a little dust up with that sniper nipper. She plumped down at the desk. Linda, read this proof. For tomorrow's paper. No. Wait. Stand up, eh? He himself took the desk chair and pulled her down on his knees. Oh, you. She snorted, but she nuzzled her cheek against his shoulder and murmured contentedly, Read this, Linda. For tomorrow's paper. I think I'm going to publish it. All right got to decide finally before eleven but ought I to? I was sure when I left the office, but Emma was scared. Oh, Emma. Sit still. Let me see it. She read quickly. She always did. At the end she said emotionlessly, yes. You must run it. Doremus. They've actually come to us here the corpus it's like reading about typhus in China and suddenly finding it in your own house. She rubbed his shoulder with her cheek again, and raged, think of it. That Shad Liju and I taught him for a year in district school, though I was only two years older than he was and what a nasty bully he was, too. He came to me a few days ago, and he had the nerve to propose that if I would give lower rates to the M. M's he sort of hinted it would be nice of me to serve MM officers free they would close their eyes to my selling liquor here, without a license or anything. Why, he had the inconceivable nerve to tell me, and condescendingly. My dear that he and his fine friends would be willing to hang out here a lot. Even Storb Myro, our professor is blossoming out as quite a sporting character. And when I chased Lee you out, with a flea in his ear well, just this morning I got a notice that I have to appear in the county court tomorrow some complaint from my endearing partner, Mr. Nipper seems he isn't satisfied with the division of our work here and, honestly, my darling, he never does one blame thing but sit around and bore my best customers to death by telling what a swell hotel he used to have in Florida. And Nipper has taken his things out of here and moved into town. I'm afraid I'll have an unpleasant time, trying to keep from telling him what I think of him, in court, good lord.
Look, sweet, have you got a lawyer for it, lawyer? Heavens no. Just a misunderstanding on Little Nipper's part, you'd better. The corpos are using the courts for all sorts of graft and for accusations of sedition. Get Mungo Kit Eric, my lawyer, he's dumb. Ice water in his veins, I know, but he's a tidier up, like so many lawyers. Likes to see everything all neat in pigeonholes. He may not care a damn for justice, but he'll be awfully pained by any irregularities. Please get him, Lindy, because they've got Effingham Swan presiding at court tomorrow. Who? Swan the military judge for District 3 that's a new corpo office. Kind of circuit judge with court-martial powers. This Effingham Swan I had Doc Hitchett interview him today, when he arrived he's the perfect gentleman fascist Oswald Mosley style. Good family whatever that means. Harvard graduate. Columbia Law School, year at Oxford. But went into finance in Boston. Investment banker. Major or something during the war. Plays polo and sailed in a yacht race to Bermuda. Itchit says he's a big brute, with manners smoother than a butterscotch Sunday and more language than a bishop. But I'll be glad to have a gentleman to explain things to, instead of shad. A gentleman's black jack hurts just as much as a mucker's, oh, you. With irritated tenderness, running her forefinger along the line of his jaw, outside, a footstep, she sprang up, sat down brimily in the straight chair. The footsteps went by. She mused. All this trouble and the corpos they are going to do something to you and me. We'll become so roused up that either we'll be desperate and really cling to each other and everybody else in the world can go to the devil or, what I'm afraid is more likely, we'll get so deep into rebellion against Windrip, we'll feel so terribly that we're standing for something, that we'll want to give up everything else for it, even give up you and me. So that no one can ever find out and criticize. We'll have to be beyond criticism, no. I won't listen. We will fight. But how can we ever get so involved detached people like us? You are going to publish that editorial tomorrow? Yes, it's not too late to kill it. He looked at the clock over her desk so ludicrously like a grade school clock that it ought to have been flanked with portraits of George and Martha. Well, yes, it is too late almost eleven. Couldn't get to the office till way past. You're sure you won't worry about it when you go to bed tonight? Dear, I so don't want you to worry. You're sure you don't want to telephone and kill the editorial? Sure. Absolute, I'm glad. Me. I'd rather be shot than go sneaking around, crippled with fear. Bless you. She kissed him and hurried off to another hour or two of work, while he drove home, whistling vain gloriously, but he did not sleep well, in his big black walnut bed. He startled to the night noises of an old frame house the easing walls, the step of bodiless assassins creeping across the wooden floors all night long. Chapter 19. An honest propagandist for any cause, that is one who honestly studies and figures out the most effective way of putting over his message, will learn fairly early that it is not fair to ordinary folks it just confuses them to try to make them swallow all the true facts that would be suitable to a higher class of people. And one seemingly small but almighty important point he learns, if he does much speechifying, is that you can win over folks to your point of view much better in the evening, when they are tired out from work and not so likely to resist you, than at any other time of day, zero hour. Basilius Windrip the Fort Buelling former had its own three-story and basement building, on President Street between Elm and Maple, opposite the side entrance of the Hotel Wessex. On the top story was the composing room, on the second, the editorial and photographic departments and the bookkeeper, in the basement, the presses, and on the first or street floor, the circulation and advertising departments, and the front office, open to the pavement, where the public came to pay subscriptions and insert want ads. The private room of the editor, Dor Emus Jessup, looked out on President Street through one not-too-dirty window. It was larger but little more showy than Lorinda Pike's office at the tavern, but on the wall it did have historic treasures in the way of a water-stained surveyor's map of Fort Beulah Township in 1891, a contemporary oleograph portrait of President McKinley, complete with eagles, flags, cannon, and the Ohio State Flower, the Scarlet Carnation, a group photograph of the New England Editorial Association, in which Dor Emus was the third blur in a derby hat in the fourth row and an entirely bogus copy of a newspaper announcing Lincoln's death. It was reasonably tidy in the patent letter file, otherwise empty. There were only two and one-half pairs of winter mittens, and an eighteen-gauge shotgun shell. Dor Emus was, by habit, extremely fond of his office. It was the only place aside from his study at home that was thoroughly his own. He would have hated to leave it or to share it with anyone possibly excepting Buck and Lorinda and every morning he came to it expectantly, from the ground floor up the wide brown stairs, through the good smell of printer's ink, 
he stood at the window of this room before eight, the morning when his editorial appeared, looking down at the people going to work in shops and warehouses. A few of them were in Minutemen uniforms. More and more even the part-time M. M's wore their uniforms when on civilian duties. There was a bustle among them. He saw them unfold copies of the informer, he saw them look up, point up, at his window. Heads close, they hear it had be discussed the front page of the paper. Ah. C. Crowley went by, early as ever on his way to open the bank, and stopped to speak to a clerk from Ed Howland's grocery, both of them shaking their heads. Old Dr. Olmsted, Fowler's partner, and Louis Rotenston halted on a corner. Doremus knew they were both friends of his, but they were dubious, perhaps frightened, as they looked at an informer. The passing of people became a gathering, the gathering a crowd, the crowd a mob, glaring up at his office, beginning to clamor. There were dozens of people there unknown to him, respectable farmers in town for shopping, unrespectables in town for a drink, laborers from the nearest work camp, and all the medying around M.M. -M uniforms. Probably many of them cared nothing about insults to the corp estate, but had only the unprejudiced, impersonal pleasure in violence natural to most people. Their mutter became louder, less human, more like the snap of burning rafters. Their glances joined in one. He was, frankly, scared. He was half conscious of Big Dan Wilgus, the head compositor, beside him, hand on his shoulder, but saying nothing, and of Doc Hitchett cackling, My my gracious hope they don't God, I hope they don't come up here. The mob acted then, swift and together, on no more of an incitement than an unknown M. M's shout, ought to burn the place, lynch the whole bunch of traitors. They were running across the street, into the front office. He could hear a sound of smashing, and his fright was gone in protective fury. He galloped down the wide stairs, and from five steps above the front office looked on a mob, equipped with axes and brush hooks grabbed from in front of Pridewell's nearby hardware store, slashing at the counter facing the front door, breaking the glass case of souvenir postcards and stationery samples, and with obscene hands reaching across the counter to rip the blouse of the girl clerk, Doremus cried, Get out of this, all you bums, they were coming toward him, claws hideously opening and closing, but he did not await that coming. He clumped down the stairs, step by step, trembling not from fear but from insane anger. One large burger seized his arm, began to bend it. The pain was atrocious. At that moment, Doremus almost smiled, so grotesquely was it like the nick of time rescued by the landing party of marines, into the front office commissioner Shad Liju marched, at the head of 20 M. M's with unsheathed bayonets, and, lumpishly climbing up on the shattered counter, bellowed. That'll do from you guys. Lamb out of this, the whole damn bunch of you, Doremus's assailant had dropped his arm. Was he actually, wondered Doremus, to be warmly indebted to Commissioner Liju, to Shad Liju? Such a powerful, dependable fellow the dirty swine, Shad roared on, we're not going to bust up this place. Jessup sure deserves lynching, but we got orders from Hanover the corpos are going to take over this plant and use it. Beat it, you a wild woman from the mountains in another existence she had knitted at the guillotine had thrust through to the counter and was howling up at Shad, their traitors. Hang em. We'll hang you, if you stop us. I want my five thousand dollars. Shad casually stooped down from the counter and slapped her. Doremus felt his muscles tense with the effort to get at Shad, to revenge the good lady who, after all, had as much right as Shad to slaughter him. But he relaxed, impatiently gave up all desire for mock heroism. The bayonets of the M. M's who were clearing out the crowd were reality, not to be attacked by hysteria. Shad, from the counter, was blatting in a voice like a sawmill, snap into it, Jessup. Take him along, men, and Doremus, with no volition whatever, was marching through President Street, up Elm Street, and toward the courthouse and county jail, surrounded by four armed minute men. The strangest thing about it, he reflected was that a man could go off thus, on an uncharted journey which might take years without fussing over plans and tickets, without baggage, without even an extra clean handkerchief, without letting Emma know where he was going, without letting Lorinda oh, Lorinda could take care of herself. But Emma would worry, he realized that the guard beside him, with the chevrons of a squad leader, or corporal, was Aras Dilly, the slatternly farmer from up on Mount Terra whom he had often helped. Or thought he had helped, ah, Aras, said he, ha, huh. said Aras, come on, shut up and keep moving said the M.M. behind Doremus, and prodded him with a bayonet, it did not, actually, hurt much, but Doremus spat with fury. So long now he had unconsciously assumed that his dignity, his body, was sacred. Ribble death might touch him. 
but no more vulgar stranger. Not till they had almost reached the courthouse could he realize that people were looking at him at Doemus Jessup exclamation mark as a prisoner being taken to jail. He tried to be proud of being a political prisoner. He couldn't. Jail was jail. The county lockup was at the back of the courthouse, now the center of Lee Ju's headquarters. Doemus had never been in that or any other jail except as a reporter, pityingly interviewing the curious, inferior sort of people who did mysteriously get themselves arrested to go into that shameful back door he who had always stalked into the front entrance of the courthouse, the editor, saluted by clerk and sheriff and judge, Shad was not in sight. Silently Doremus's four guards conducted him through a steel door, down a corridor, to a small cell reeking of chloride of lime and, still unspeaking, they left him there. The cell had a cot with a damp straw mattress and damp a straw pillow, a stool, a wash basin with one tap for cold water, a pot, two hooks for clothes, a small barred window, and nothing else whatever except a jaunty sign ornamented with embossed forget-me-nots and a text from Deuteronomy, he shall be free at home one year, I hope so, said Doremus, not very cordially, it was before nine in the morning. He remained in that cell, without speech, without food, with only tap water caught in his doubled palm and with one cigarette an hour, until after midnight, and in the unaccustomed stillness he saw how imprisoned men could eventually go mad, don't whine, though. You hear a few hours, and plenty of poor devils in solitary for years and years, put there by tyrants worse than Windrip. Yes, and sometimes put there by nice, good, social-minded judges that I've played bridge with, but the reasonableness of the thought didn't particularly cheer him. He could hear a distant babble from the bullpen, where the drunks and vagrants, and the petty offenders among the M. M's, were crowded in enviable comradeship, but the sound was only a background for the corroding stillness. He sank into a twitching numbness. He felt that he was choking, and gasped desperately. Only now and then did he think clearly then only of the shame of imprisonment or, even more emphatically, of how hard the wooden stool was on his ill upholstered drump, and how much pleasanter it was, even so, than the cot, whose mattress had the quality of crushed worms. Once he felt that he saw the way clearly. The tyranny of this dictatorship isn't primarily the fault of big business, nor of the demagogues who do their dirty work. It's the fault of Doremus Jessup. Of all the conscientious, respectable, lazy-minded Doremus Chessups who have let the demagogues wriggle in, without fierce enough protest, a few months ago I thought the slaughter of the Civil War, and the agitation of the violent abolitionists who helped bring it on, were evil. But possibly they had to be violent, because easy-going citizens like me couldn't be stirred up otherwise. If our grandfathers had had the alertness and courage to see the evils of slavery and of a government conducted by gentlemen for gentlemen only, there wouldn't have been any need of agitators and war and blood. It's my sort, the responsible citizens who felt ourselves superior because we've been well to do and what we thought was educated, who brought on the civil war, the French Revolution, and now the fascist dictatorship. It's I who murdered Rabbi de Veras. It's I who persecuted the Jews and the Negroes. I can blame no Aras Dilly, no Shad Lee Jew, no Buzz Windrip, but only my own timid soul and drowsy mind. Forgive, O oh Lord, is it too late? Once again as darkness was coming into his cell like the inescapable ooze of a flood. He thought furiously. And about Lorinda. Now that I've been kicked into reality got to be one thing or the other, Emma, who's my bread, or Lorinda, my wine, but I can't have both. Oh, damn. What twaddle. Why can't a man have both bread and wine and not prefer one before the other, unless, maybe, we're all coming into a day of battles when the fighting will be too hot to let a man stop for anything save bread. And maybe, even too hot to let him stop for that. The waiting the waiting in the smothering cell the relentless waiting while the filthy window glass turned from afternoon to a bleak darkness. What was happening out there? What had happened to Emma, to Lorinda, to the informer office, to Dan Wilgus, to Buck and Sissy and Mary and David? Why, it was today that Lorinda was to answer the action against her by Nipper. Today. Surely all that must have been done with a year ago, what had happened? Had military judge Effingham Swan treated her as she deserved? But Doema slipped again from this living agitation into the trance of waiting waiting, and, catnapping on a hideously uncomfortable little stool. He was dazed when at some unholily late hour. It was just after midnight. He was aroused by the presence of armed M. M's outside his barred cell door, and by the hillbilly drawl of squad leader Arras Dilly. Well, guess why better get up now, better get up. Jedge wants to see you Jedge says he wants to see you. Hey. Guess why I didn't ever think I'd be a squad leader? Did you, Miss Jessop, 
door Emus was escorted through angling corridors to the familiar side entrance of the courtroom the entrance where once he had seen Thodili, Aras's degenerate cousin, shamble in to receive sentence for clubbing his wife to death. He could not keep from feeling that Thod and he were kin, now, he was kept waiting waiting exclamation mark for a quarter hour outside the closed courtroom door. He had time to consider the three guards commanded by squad leader Aras. He happened to know that one of them had served a sentence at Windsor for robbery with assault, and one, a surly young farmer, had been rather doubtfully acquitted on a charge of barn burning in revenge against a neighbor. He leaned against the slightly dirty gray plaster wall of the corridor, stand straight there, you. What the hell do you think this is? And keeping us up late like this? Said the rejuvenated, the redeemed arrows, waggling his bayonet and shining with desire to use it on the dewy, Doremus stood straight. He stood very straight, he stood rigid, beneath a portrait of Horace Greeley, till now, Doremus had liked to think of that most famous of radical editors, who had been a printer in Vermont from 1825 to 1828, as his colleague and comrade. Now he felt colleague only to the revolutionary Carl Pascals, his legs, not too young, were trembling, his calf sacred. Was he going to faint? What was happening in there, in the courtroom, to save himself from the disgrace of collapsing, he studied Arrows Dilly. Though his uniform was fairly new, Arrows had managed to deal with it as his family and he had dealt with their house on Mount Terry once a sturdy Vermont cottage with shining white clapboards, now mud smeared and rotting. His cap was crushed in, his breeches spotted, his leggings gaping, and one tunic button hung by a thread. I wouldn't particularly want to be dictator over an Arrows, but I most particularly do not want him and his like to be dictators over me, whether they call them fascists or corpos or communists or monarchists or free democratic electors or anything else. If that makes me a reactionary Kulak, all right. I don't believe I ever really liked the shiftless brethren, for all my lying handshaking. Do you think the Lord calls on us to love the cowbirds as much as the swallows? I don't. Oh, I know, Arras has had a hard time, mortgage and seven kids. But cousin Henry Vida and Dan Wilgus yes, and Pete Vutong, the Canuck, that lives right across the road from Arras and has just exactly the same kind of land they were all born poor, and they've lived decently enough. They can wash their ears and their door sills, at least. I'm cursed if I'm going to give up the American Wesleyan doctrine of free will and of will to accomplishment entirely, even if it does get me read out of the liberal communion. Arras had peeped into the courtroom, and he stood giggling, then Arinda came out after midnight. Her partner, the wart nipper, was following her, looking sheepishly triumphant. Linda. Linda. Called Doremus, his hands out, ignoring the snickers of the curious guards, trying to move toward her. Arras pushed him back and Lorinda sneered go on move on, there. And she moved. She seemed twisted and rusty as Doremus would have thought her bright steeliness could never have been, Arras cackled, ha, ha, ha. Your friend, Sister Pike, my wife's friend, all right, boss. Have it your way. Your wife's friend, Sister Pike, got hers for trying to be fresh with Judge Swan. She's been kicked out of her partnership with Mr. Nipper he's going to manage that tavern of Anne, and Sister Pike goes back to pot walloping in the kitchen like she'd ought to exclamation mark like maybe some of your women folks, that think they're so almighty stylish and independent, will be having to, pretty soon. Again Doremus had sense enough to regard the bayonets, and a mighty voice from inside the courtroom trumpeted, next case. D. Jessup. On the judge's bench where she'd lead you in uniform as an airmen battalion leader, ex-superintendent Emil Storbmeyer presenting the role of Ensign, and a third man, tall, rather handsome, rather two-face massaged, with the letters MJ on the collar of his uniform as commander, or pseudo-colonel. He was perhaps fifteen years younger than Doremus, this, Doremus knew, must be military judge Effingham Swan, some time of Boston, the minute men marched him in front of the bench and retired, with only two of them, a milky-faced farm boy and a former's gas station attendant, remaining on guard inside the double doors of the side entrance. The entrance for criminals, Commander Swan loafed to his feet and, as though he were greeting his oldest friend, cooed at Doremus, my dear fellow, so sorry to have to trouble you. Just a routine query, you know. Do sit down. Gentlemen, in the case of Mr. Doremus, surely we need not go through the farce of formal inquiry. Let's all sit about that damn big silly table down the place where they always stick the innocent defendants and the guilty attorneys, why no get down from this high altar little too mystical for the taste of a vulgar bucket shop gambler like myself. After you, Professor, after you, my dear Captain and, to the guards, just wait outside in the hall, will you? 
close the doors, Stormeyer and Shad looking, despite Erfingham Swan's frivolity, as portentous as their uniforms could make them, clumped down to the table. Swan followed them merrily, and to Doremus, still standing, he gave his tortoise shell cigarette case, caroling, do have a smoke, Mr. Doremus. Must we all be so painfully formal? Doremus reluctantly took a cigarette, reluctantly sat down as Swan waved him to a chair with something not quite so airy and affable in the sharpness of the gesture. My name is Jessup, Commander. Doremus is my first name. Ah, I see. It could be. Quite so. Very New England. Doremus. Swan was leaning back in his wooden armchair, powerful trim hands behind his neck. I'll tell you, my dear fellow. One's memory is so wretched, you know. I'll just call you Doremus, sans mister. Then, do you see, it might apply to either the first, or Christian, as I believe one's wretched people in Back Bay insist on calling it either the Christian or the surname. Then we shall feel all friendly and secure. Now, Doremus, my dear fellow, I beg my friends in the M.M. I do trust they were not too importunate, as these parochial units sometimes do seem to be but I ordered them to invite you here, really, just to get your advice as a journalist. Does it seem to you that most of the peasants here are coming to their senses and ready to accept the corpo fet accompli? Doremus grumbled, but I understood I was dragged here and if you want to know, your squad was all of what you call importunate exclamation mark because of an editorial I wrote about President Windrip. Oh, was that you, Doremus? You see question mark I was right one does have such a wretched memory. I do seem now to remember some minor incident of the sort you know mentioned in the agenda. Do have another cigarette, my dear fellow. Swan. I don't care much for this cat and mouse game at least, not while I'm the mouse. What are your charges against me? Charges? Oh, my only aunt. Just trifling things criminal libel and conveying secret information to alien forces and high treason and homicidal incitement to violence you know. The usual bore SM line. And also easily got rid of, my Doremus, if you'd just be persuaded you see how quite pitifully eager I am to be friendly with you and to have the inestimable aid of your experience here if you just decide that it might be the part of discretion so suitable, why no, to your venerable years, damn it, I'm not venerable, nor anything like it. Only sixty. Sixty-one, I should say, matter of ratio, my dear fellow. I'm forty-seven myself, and I have no doubt the young pups already call me venerable. But as I was saying, Doemus, why was it he winced with fury every time Swan called him that? With your position as one of the Council of Elders, and with your responsibilities to your family it would be too sick making if anything happened to them. Why no exclamation mark you just can't afford to be too brash. And all we desire is for you to play along with us in your paper I would adore the chance of explaining some of the corpos and the chief's still unrevealed plans to you. You'd see such a new light, Shad grunted, him? Jessop couldn't see a new light if it was on the end of his nose. A moment, my dear captain. And also, Doemus. Of course we shall urge you to help us by giving us a complete list of every person in this vicinity that you know of who is secretly opposed to the administration. Spying? Me? Quite. If I'm accused of I insist on having my lawyer, Mungo Kid Eric, and on being dried, not all this bear baiting, quaint name. Mungo Kid Eric. Oh, my only aunt. Why does it give me so absurd a picture of an explorer with a Greek grammar in his hand? You don't quite understand, my Doremus habeas corpus due processes of law too, too bad exclamation mark all those ancient sanctities, dating, no doubt, from Magna Carta, been suspended oh, but just temporarily, why no state of crisis unfortunate necessity martial law, damn it, swan, commander, my dear fellow ridiculous matter of military discipline, why no such rot, you know mighty well and good it isn't temporary, it's permanent that is, as long as the corpus last, it could be, Swan Commander you get that it could be in my aunt from the Reggie Fortune stories, don't you? Now there is a fellow detective story fanatic. But how to bogus, and that's Evelyn War. You're quite a literary man for so famous a yachtsman and horseman, Commander, horseman, yachtsman, literary man. Am I, Doemus, even in my sanctum sanctorum, having, as the lesser breeds would say, the pants kidded off me? Oh, my Doemus, that couldn't be. And just when one is so feeble, after having been so, shall I say excoriated, by your so amiable friend, Mrs. Lorinda Pike? No, no. How too unbefitting the majesty of the law, Shad interrupted again, yea, we had a swell time with your girlfriend, Jessop. But I already had the dope about you and her before, Doremus sprang up, 
his chair crashing backward on the floor. He was reaching for Shad's throat across the table. Effingham Swan was on him, pushing him back into another chair. Doremus hiccuped with fury. Shad had not even troubled to rise, and he was going on contemptuously. You, you two'll have quite some trouble if you try to pull any spy stuff on the corpos. My, my, Doremus, ain't we had fun, Lindy and you, playing footy-footy these last couple years. Didn't nobody know about it, did they? But what you didn't know was Lindy and don't it beat her long-nosed, skinny old maid like her can have so much pep exclamation mark and she's been cheating on you right along, sleeping with every doggone man boarder she's had at the tavern, and of course with her little squirt of a partner, Nipper, Swan's great hand hand of an ape with a manicure held Doremus in his chair. Shad snickered. Emile Storbmeyer, who had been sitting with fingertips together, laughed amiably. Swan patted Doremus's back. He was less sunken by the insult to Lorinda than by the feeling of helpless loneliness. It was so late, the night so quiet. He would have been glad if even the MM guards had come in from the hall. Their rustic innocence, however barnyardishly brutal, would have been comforting after the easy viciousness of the three judges, Swan was placidly resuming, but I suppose we really must get down to business however agreeable, my dear clever literary detective. It would be to discuss Agatha Christie and Dorothy Sayers and Norman Klein. Perhaps we can someday, when the chief puts us both in the same prison. There's really, my dear Doremus, no need of your troubling your legal gentleman, Mr. Monkey Kitteridge. I am quite authorized to conduct this trial for quaintly enough, Doremus, it is a trial, despite the delightful street boat ilf's atmosphere. And as to testimony, I already have all I need, both in the good Miss Lorinda's inadvertent admissions, in the actual text of your editorial criticizing the chief and in the quite thorough reports of Captain Leeju and Dr. Storbmeyer. One really ought to take you out and shoot you and one is quite empowered to do so, oh quite exclamation mark but one has one's faults one is really too merciful. And perhaps we can find a better use for you than as fertilizer you are, you know, rather too much on the skinny side to make adequate fertilizer, you are to be released on parole, to assist and coach Dr. Storbmeyer who, by orders from Commissioner Reek, at Hanover, has just been made editor of the Informer but who doubtless lacks certain points of technical training. You will help him oh, gladly, I am sure exclamation mark until he learns. Then we'll see what we'll do with you. You will write editorials, with all your accustomed brilliance so, oh, I assure you. People constantly stop on Boston Common to discuss your masterpieces, have done for years. But you'll write only as Dr. Storbmeyer tells you. Understand? Oh. Today since tis already past the witching hour you will write an abject apology for your diatribe oh yes, very much on the abject side. You know you veteran journalists do these things so neatly just admit you were a cockeyed liar and that sort of thing bright and bantering you know. And next Monday you will, like most of the other ditch water dull hick papers, begin the serial publication of the chief's zero hour. You'll enjoy that, clatter and shouts at the door. Protests from the unseen guards. Dr. Fowl a Greenhill pounding in, stopping with arms akimbo, shouting as he strode down to the table, what do you three comic judges think you're doing, and who may our impetuous friend be? He annoys me, rather, Swan asked of Shad, Doc Fowler Jessop's son-in-law. And a bad actor. Why, couple days ago I offered him charge of medical inspection for all the M. M's in the county and he said this red-headed smart Alec here exclamation mark he said you and me and Commissioner Eek and Doc Storbmeyer and all this were a bunch of hobos that DB digging ditches in a labor camp if we hadn't stole some officers uniforms, ah, did he indeed? purred Swan, Fowler protested, he's a liar, I never mentioned you, I don't even know who you are, my name, good sir, is Commander Effingham Swan, M.J., well, M.J., that still doesn't enlighten me, never heard of you, Shad interrupted, how the hell did you get past the guards, Fowley? He who had never dared call that long-reaching, swift-moving redhead anything more familiar than Doc, oh, all your many mouses know me. I've treated most of your brightest gunmen for unmentionable diseases. I just told them at the door that I was wanted in here professionally, Swan was at his silkiest, oh, and how we did want you, my dear fellow though we didn't know it until this moment. So you are one of these brave rustic Esculapiuses, I am. And if you were in the war which I should doubt, from your pansy way of talking you may be interested to know that I am also a member of the American Legion quit Harvard and joined up in 1918 and went back afterwards to finish. And I want to warn you three half-baked Hitlers, ah. But my dear friend. A military man. How to too. 
then we shall have to treat you as a responsible person responsible for your idiocy is not just as the uncouth clodhopper that you appear. Fowler was leaning both fists on the table. Now I've had enough. I'm going to push in your boofal face. Shad had his fists up, was rounding the table, but Swan snapped. No. Let him finish. He may enjoy digging his own grave. You know people do have such quaint variant notions about sports. Some laddies actually like to go fishing all those slimy scales and the shocking odor. By the way, doctor, before it's too late, I would like to leave with you the thought for the day that I was also in the water end wars a major. But go on. I do so want to listen to you yet a little. Cut the cackle, will you, M. J. I've just come here to tell you that I've had enough everybody's had enough of your kidnapping Mr. Jessup the most honest and useful man in the whole Beulah Valley. Typical low-down sneaking kidnappers. If you think your phony Rhodes Scholar accent keeps you from being just another cowardly, murdering public enemy, in your toy soldier uniform, Swan held up his hand in his most genteel back bay manner. A moment, Doctor, if you will be so good. And to Shad, I should think we'd heard enough from the comrade, wouldn't you, Commissioner? Just take the bastard out and shoot him, okay swell. Shad chuckled, and, to the guards at the half-open door, get the corporal of the guard and a squad six men loaded rifles make it snappy. See, the guard were not far down the corridor, and their rifles were already loaded. It was in less than a minute that Aras Dilly was saluting from the door, and Shad was shouting, Come here. Grab this dirty crook. He pointed at Fowler. Take him along outside. They did, for all of Fowler's struggling. Aras Dilly jabbed Fowler's right wrist with a bayonet. It spilled blood down on his hand, so scrubbed for surgery, and like blood his red hair tumbled over his forehead, Shad marched out with them pulling his automatic pistol from its holster and looking at it happily, Doremus was held. His mouth was clapped shut, by two guards as he tried to reach Fowler. Emil Storbmeyer seemed a little scared, but Effingham Swan, suave and amused, leaned his elbows on the table and tapped his teeth with a pencil. From the courtyard, the sound of a rifle volley, a terrifying wail, one single emphatic shot, and nothing after. Chapter 20. The real trouble with the Jews is that they are cruel. Anybody with a knowledge of history knows how they tortured poor debtors in secret catacombs, all through the Middle Ages. Whereas the Nordic is distinguished by his gentleness and his kind-heartedness to friends, children, dogs, and people of inferior races, zero hour. Basilius Windrip. The review in Dewey Hake's provincial court of Judge Swan's sentence on Greenhill was influenced by County Commissioner Leeju's testimony that after the execution he found in Greenhill's house a cache of the most seditious documents, copies of Trowbridge's Lance for Democracy, books by Marx and Trotsky, communistic pamphlets surging citizens to assassinate the chief. Mary, Mrs. Greenhill, insisted that her husband had never read such things, that, if anything, he had been too indifferent to politics. Naturally, her word could not be taken against that of Commissioner Lee Jew, Assistant Commissioner Storbmeyer, known everywhere as a scholar and man of probity, and military judge Effingham Swan. It was necessary to punish Mrs. Greenhill or, rather, to give a strong warning to other Mrs. Greenhills by seizing all the property and money Greenhill had left her. Anyway, Mary did not fight very vigorously. Perhaps she realized her guilt. In two days she turned from the crispest, smartest, most swift-spoken woman in Fort Beulah into a silent hag dragging about in shabby and unkempt black. Her son and she went to live with their father, Doremus Jessup. Some said that Jessup should have fought for her and her property. But he was not legally permitted to do so. He was on parole, subject, at the will of the properly constituted authorities, to a penitentiary sentence. So Mary returned to the house and the over-furnished bedroom she had left as a bride. She could not, she said, endure its memories. She took the attic room that had never been quite finished off, she sat up there all day, all evening, and her parents never heard a sound. But within a week her David was playing about the yard most joyfully. Playing that he was an M.M. officer, the whole house seemed dead, and all that were in it seemed frightened, nervous, forever waiting for something unknown all save David and, perhaps, Mrs. Candy, bustling in her kitchen. Meals had been notoriously cheerful at the Jessup's, Doremus chatted to an audience of Mrs. Candy and Sissy flustering Emma with the most outrageous assertions that he was planning to go to Greenland, that President Windrup had taken to riding down Pennsylvania Avenue on an elephant, and Mrs. Candy was as unscrupulous as all good cooks in trying to render them speechlessly drowsy after dinner and to encourage the stealthy expansion of Doremus's already rotund little belly, with her mince pie, her apple pie with enough shortening to make the eyes pop out in sweet anguish, the fat corn fritters and candied potatoes with the broiled chicken, 
the clam chowder made with cream. Now, there was little talk among the adults at Tableland, though Mary was not surely brave, but colorless as a glass of water, they were nervously watching her. Everything they spoke of seemed to point toward the murder and the corpus, if you said, it's quite a warm fall, you felt that the table was thinking, so the M. M's can go on marching for a long time yet before snow flies, and then you choked and asked sharply for the gravy. Always Mary was there, a stone statue chilling the warm and commonplace people packed in beside her, so it came about that David dominated the table talk, for the first delightful time in his nine years of experiment with life, and David liked that very much indeed, and his grandfather liked it not nearly so well, he chattered, like an entire palm full of monkeys, about foolish, about his new playmates, children of Medary Cole, the miller, about the apparent fact that crocodiles are rarely found in the Beulah River, and the more moving fact that the rodents and young had driven with their father clear to Albany, now Doremus was fond of children, approved of them, felt with an earnestness uncommon to parents and grandparents that they were human beings and as likely as the next one to become editors. But he hadn't enough sap of the Christmas holly in his veins to enjoy listening without cessation to the bright prattle of children. Few males have, outside of Louisa May Alcott. He thought, though he wasn't very dogmatic about it, that the talk of a Washington correspondent about politics was likely to be more interesting than Davy's remarks on cornflakes and garter snakes, so he went on loving the boy and wishing he would shut up. And escaped as soon as possible from Mary's gloom and Emma's suffocating thoughtfulness, wherein you felt, every time Emma begged, oh, you must take just a little more of the nice chestnut dressing, Mary dearie, that you really ought to burst into tears. Doremus suspected that Emma was, essentially, more appalled by his having gone to jail than by the murder of her son-in-law. Jessops simply didn't go to jail. People who went to jail were bad, just as barn burners and men accused of that fascinatingly obscure amusement, a statutory offence, were bad, and as for bad people, you might try to be forgiving and tender, but you didn't sit down to meals with them. It was also irregular, and most upsetting to the household routine so Emma loved him and worried about him till he wanted to go fishing and actually did go so far as to get out his flies. But Lorinda had said to him, with eyes brilliant and unworried, and I thought you were just a cud-chewing liberal that didn't mind being milked. I am so proud of you. You've encouraged me to fight against listen, the minute I heard about your imprisonment I chased Nipper out of my kitchen with a bread knife. Well, anyway, I thought about doing it. The office was deader than his home. The worst of it was that it wasn't so very bad that, he saw, he could slip into serving the corporate state with, eventually, no more sense of shame than was felt by old colleagues of his who in pre corpo days had written advertisements for fraudulent mouthwashes or tasteless cigarettes, or written for supposedly reputable magazines mechanical stories about young love. In a waking nightmare after his imprisonment, Doremus had pictured Storbmeyer and Leeju in the informer office standing over him with whips, demanding that he turn out sickening praise for the corpos yelling at him until he rose and killed and was killed. Actually, Shad stayed away from the office, and Doremus's master, Storbmeyer, was ever so friendly and modest and rather nauseatingly full of praise for his craftsmanship. Storbmeyer seemed satisfied when, instead of the apology demanded by Swan, Doremus stated that henceforth his paper will cease all criticisms of the present government. Doremus received from District Commission Rika Jolly Telegram thanking him for gallantly deciding turn your great talent service people and correcting errors doubtless made by us in effort set up a new more realistic state. Er, uh, said Doremus and did not chuck the message at the clothes basket waste basket, but carefully walked over and rammed it down amid the trash. He was able, by remaining with the informer in her prostitute days, to keep Storbmeyer from discharging Dan Wilgus who was sniffy to the new boss and unnaturally respectful now to Doremus. And he invented what he called the Yao Yao editorial. This was a dirty device of stating as strongly as he could an indictment of corporism, then answering it as feebly as he could, as with a whining Yao 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 that's what you say. Neither Storbmeyer nor Shad caught him at it, but Doremus hoped fearfully that the shrewd Effingham Swan would never see the Yao Yaos. So week on week he got along not too badly and there was not one minute when he did not hate this filthy slavery, when he did not have to force himself to stay there, when he did not snarl at himself, then why do you stay? His answers to the challenge came glibly and conventionally enough, he was too old to start in life again. And he had a wife and family to support Emma, Sissy, and now Mary and David. All these years he had heard responsible men who weren't being quite honest radio announcers who soft-soaped speakers who were fools and wares that were trash and who canarishly chirped thank you, 
Major Blister when they would rather have kicked Major Blister, preachers who did not believe the decayed doctrines they dealt out, doctors who did not dare tell lady invalids that they were sex-hungry exhibitionists, merchants who peddled brass for gold heard all of them complacently excuse themselves by explaining that they were too old to change and that they had a wife and family to support. Why not let the wife and family die of starvation or get out and hustle for themselves, if by no other means the world could have the chance of being freed from the most boresom, most dull, and foulest disease of having always to be a little dishonest, so he raged and went on grinding out a paper dull and a little dishonest but not forever. Otherwise the history of Doremus Jessup would be too drearily common to be worth recording. Again and again, figuring it out on rough sheets of copy paper, adorned also with concentric circles, squares, whirls, and the most improbable fish, he estimated that even without selling the informer or his house, as under corpo espionage he certainly could not if he fled to Canada, he could cash in about $20,000. Say enough to give him an income of a thousand a year $20 a week, provided he could smuggle the money out of the country, which the corpos were daily making more difficult. Well, Emma and Sissy and Mary and he could live on that, in a four-room cottage, and perhaps Sissy and Mary could find work, but as for himself, it was all very well to talk about men like Thomas Mann and Lion Fouque Dwanger and Romain Rowland, who in exile remained writers whose every word was in demand, about Professors Einstein or Salvemini, or, under corporism, about the recently exiled or self-exiled Americans, Walt Trowbridge, Mike Gold, William Allen White, John Dos Passos, H. L. Mencken, Rexford Tugwell, Oswald Villard. Nowhere in the world, except possibly in Greenland or Germany, would such stars be unable to find work and soothing respect. But what was an ordinary newspaper hack, especially if he was over forty-five, to do in a strange land and more especially if he had a wife named Emma, or Carolina or Nancy or Griselda or anything else, who didn't at all fancy going and living in a sod hut on behalf of honesty and freedom, so debated Doremus, like some hundreds of thousands of other craftsmen, teachers, lawyers, what not, in some dozens of countries under a dictatorship, who were aware enough to resent the tyranny, conscientious enough not to take its bribes cynically, yet not so abnormally courageous as to go willingly to exile or dungeon or chopping block particularly when they had wives and families to support. Doremus hinted once to Emil Storbmeyer that Emil was getting onto the ropes so well that he thought of getting out, of quitting newspaper work for good. The hitherto friendly Mr. Storbmeyer said sharply, What did you do? Sneak off to Canada and join the propagandists against the chief? Nothing doing. You'll stay right here and help me help us. And that afternoon Commissioner Shadley you shouldered in and grumbled. Dr. Storbmeyer tells me you're doing pretty fairly good work, Jessup. But I want to warn you to keep it up. Remember that Judge Swan only let you out on parole. To me. You can do fine if you just set your mind to it. If you just set your mind to it. The one time when the boy Doremus had hated his father had been when he used that condescending phrase. He saw that for all the apparent prosaic calm of day after day on the paper, he was equally in danger of slipping into acceptance of his serfdom and of whips and bars if he didn't slip. And he continued to be just as sick each time he wrote. The crowd of 50,000 people who greeted President Windrup in the university stadium at Iowa City was an impressive sign of the constantly growing interest of all Americans in political affairs, and Storbmeyer changed it to the vast and enthusiastic crowd of 70,000 loyal admirers who wildly applauded and listened to the stirring address of the chief in the handsome university stadium in beautiful Iowa City. Iowa, is an impressive yet quite typical sign of the growing devotion of all true Americans to political study under the inspiration of the corpo government. Perhaps his worst irritations were that Storbmeyer had pushed a desk and his sleek, sweaty person into Doremus's private office, once sacred to his solitary grouches, and that Doc Hitchett, hitherto his worshipping disciple, seemed always to be secretly laughing at him. Under a tyranny, most friends are a liability. One quarter of them turn reasonable and become your enemies, one quarter are afraid to stop and speak and one quarter are killed and you die with them. But the blessed final quarter keep you alive. When he was with Lorinda, gone was all the pleasant toying and sympathetic talk with which they had relieved boredom. She was fierce now, and vibrant. She drew him close enough to her but instantly she would be thinking of him only as a comrade in plots to kill off the corpos. And it was pretty much a real killing off that she meant, there wasn't left of you any great amount of her plausible pacifism, she was busy with good and perilous works. Partner Nipper had not been able to keep her in the tavern kitchen, she had so systematized the work that she had many days and evenings free, and she had started a cooking class for farm girls and young farm wives who, caught between the provincial and the industrial generations, 
had learned neither good rural cooking with a wood fire, nor yet how to deal with canned goods and electric grills and who most certainly had not learned how to combine so as to compel the tight-fisted little locally owned power and light companies to furnish electricity at tolerable rates, heaven's sake, keep this quiet, but I'm getting acquainted with these country gals getting ready for the day when we begin to organize against the corpos. I depend on them, not the well-to-do women that used to want suffrage but that can't endure thought of revolution, Lorinda whispered to him. We've got to do something, all right, Lorinda B. Anthony, he sighed, and Carl Pascal stuck, at Polycop's garage, when he first saw Doremus after the jailing, he said, God, I was sorry to hear about their pinching you, Mr. Jessup. But say, aren't you ready to join us communists now? He looked about anxiously as he said it, I thought there weren't any more bolos, oh, we're supposed to be wiped out. But I guess you'll notice a few mysterious strikes starting now and then, even though there can't be any more strikes. Why aren't you joining us? There's where you belong, see Conrad. Look here, Cal, you've always said the difference between the socialists and the communists was that you believed in complete ownership of all means of production, not just utilities, and that you admitted the violent class war and the socialists didn't. That's poppycock. The real difference is that you communists serve Russia. It's your holy land. Well Russia has all my prayers, right after the prayers for my family and for the chief. But what I'm interested in civilizing and protecting against its enemies isn't Russia but America. Is that so banal to say? Well, it wouldn't be banal for a Russian comrade to observe that he was for Russia. And America needs our propaganda more every day. Another thing, I'm a middle class intellectual. I'd never call myself any such a damn silly thing. But since you red coined it, I'll have to accept it. That's my class, and that's what I'm interested in. The proletarians are probably noble fellows, but I certainly do not think that the interests of the middle class intellectuals and the proletarians are the same. They want bread. We want well, all right, say it, we want cake. And when you get a proletarian ambitious enough to want cake, too why, in America, he becomes a middle class intellectual just as fast as he can if he can, look here. When you think of 3% of the people owning 90% of the wealth, I don't think of it. It does not follow that because a good many of the intellectuals belong to the 97% of the broke that plenty of actors and teachers and nurses and musicians don't get any better paid than stagehands or electricians, therefore their interests are the same. It isn't what you earn but how you spend it that fixes your class whether you prefer bigger funeral services or more books. I'm tired of apologizing for not having a dirty neck, honestly. Mr. Jessup, that's damn nonsense, and you know it, is it? Well, it's my American covered wagon damn nonsense, and not the propaganda aeroplane damn nonsense of Marx and Moscow. Oh, you'll join us yet, listen, Comrade Cal, Windrup and Hitler will join Stalin long before the descendants of Daniel Webster. You see, we don't like murder as a way of argument that's what really marks the liberal. About his future father Perefix was brief, I'm going back to Canada where I belong away to the freedom of the king. Hate to give up, Doemus, but I'm no Thomas A. Beckett, but just a plain, scared, fat little clerk. The surprise among old acquaintances was Medry Cole, the miller, a little younger than Francis Dasbro and R.C. Crowley, less intensely aristocratic than those noblemen, since only one generation separated him from a chin-whiskered Yankee farmer and not two, as with them. He had been their satellite at the country club and, as to solid virtue, been president of the Rotary Club. He had always considered Doremus a man who, without such excuse as being a Jew or a hunky or poor, was yet flippant about the sanctities of Main Street and Wall Street. They were neighbors, as Cole's Cape Cod Cottage was just below Pleasant Hill, but they had not by habit been droppers in. Now, when Cole came bringing David home, or calling for his daughter Angela, David's new mate, towards supper time of a chilly fall evening, he stopped gratefully for a hot rum punch, and asked Doremus whether he really thought inflation was such a good thing. He burst out, one evening, Jessup, there isn't another person in this town I dare say this to, not even my wife, but I'm getting awful sick of having these many mouses dictate where I have to buy my gunny sacks and what I can pay my men. I won't pretend I ever cared much for labor unions. But in those days, at least the union members did get some of the swag. Now it goes to support the M. M's. We pay them and pay them big to bully us. It don't look so reasonable as it did in 1936. But, golly, don't tell anybody I said that, and Cole went off shaking his head, bewildered he who had ecstatically voted for Mr. Windrip. On a day in late October, 
suddenly striking in every city and village and back hill hideout, the corpus and did all crime in America forever, so titanic a feat that it was mentioned in the London Times. 70,000 selected minute men, working in combination with town and state police officers, all under the chiefs of the government's secret service, arrested every known or faintly suspected criminal in the country. They were tried under court-martial procedure, one in ten was shot immediately, four in ten were given prison sentences, three in ten released as innocent, and two in ten taken into the M. M's as inspectors. There were protests that at least six in ten had been innocent, but this was adequately answered by Windrup's courageous statement, the way to stop crime is to stop it. The next day, Medary Cole crowed at Doemus, sometimes I've felt like criticizing certain features of corpo policy, but it did you see what the chief did to the gangsters and racketeers? Wonderful. I've told you right along what this country's needed is a firm hand like Windrup's. No shilly-shallying about that fellow. He saw that the way to stop crime was to just go out and stop it. Then was revealed the new American education, which, as Saracen so justly said, was to be ever so much newer than the new educations of Germany, Italy, Poland, or even Turkey. The authorities abruptly closed some scores of the smaller, more independent colleges such as Williams, Bodoin, Oberlin, Georgetown, Antioch, Carlton, Lewis Institute, Commonwealth, Princeton, Swarthmore, Canyon, all vastly different one from another but alike in not yet having entirely become machines. Few of the state universities were closed, they were merely to be absorbed by central corpo universities, one in each of the eight provinces. But the government began with only two. In the metropolitan district, Windrup University took over the Rockefeller Center and Empire State buildings, with most of Central Park the playground, excluding the general public from it entirely, for the rest was an MM drill ground. The second was McGoblin University, in Chicago and vicinity, using the buildings of Chicago and Northwestern Universities, and Jackson Park. President Hutchins of Chicago was rather unpleasant about the whole thing and declined to stay on as an assistant professor, so the authorities had politely to exile him. Tattlemongers suggested that the naming of the Chicago plant after McGoblin instead of Saracen suggested a beginning coolness between Saracen and Windrip, but the two leaders were able to quash such canards by appearing together at the great reception given to Bishop Cannon by the Women's Christian Temperance Union and being photographed shaking hands. Each of the two pioneer universities started with an enrollment of 50,000, making ridiculous the pre corpus schools, none of which, in 1935, had had more than 30,000 students. The enrollment was probably helped by the fact that anyone could enter upon presenting a certificate showing that he had completed two years in a high school or business college, and a recommendation from a corpo commissioner. Dr. McGoblin pointed out that this founding of entirely new universities showed the enormous cultural superiority of the corpus state to the Nazis, Bolsheviks, and fascists. Where these amateurs in recivilization had merely kicked out all treacherous so-called intellectual teachers who mulishly declined to teach physics, cookery, and geography according to the principles and facts laid down by the political bureaus, and the Nazis had merely added the sound measure of discharging Jews who dared attempt to teach medicine, the Americans were the first to start new and completely orthodox institutions, free from the very first of any taint of intellectualism, all corporate universities were to have the same curriculum, entirely practical and modern, free of all snobbish tradition, entirely omitted were Greek, Latin, Sanskrit, Hebrew, biblical study, archaeology, philology, all history before 1500 except for one course which showed that, through the centuries, the key to civilization had been the defense of Anglo-Saxon purity against barbarians. Philosophy and its history, psychology, economics, anthropology were retained, but, to avoid the superstitious errors in ordinary textbooks, they were to be conned only in new books prepared by able young scholars under the direction of Dr. McGiblin. Students were encouraged to read, speak, and try to write modern languages, but they were not to waste their time on the so-called literature. Reprints from recent newspapers were used instead of antiquated fiction and sentimental poetry. As regards English, some study of literature was permitted, to supply quotations for political speeches, but the chief courses were in advertising, party journalism, and business correspondence, and no authors before 1800 might be mentioned, except Shakespeare and Milton. In the realm of so-called pure science, it was realized that only too much and too confusing research had already been done but no pre corpo university had ever shown such a wealth of courses in mining engineering, lakeshore cottage architecture, modern foremanship and production methods, exhibition gymnastics, the higher accountancy, therapeutics of athlete's foot, canning and fruit dehydration, kindergarten training, 
organization of chess, checkers, and bridge tournaments, cultivation of willpower, banned music for mass meetings, schnauzer breeding, stainless steel formula, cement road construction, and all other really useful subjects for the formation of the new world mind and character. And no scholastic institution, even West Point, had ever so richly recognized sport as not a subsidiary but a primary department of scholarship. All the more familiar games were earnestly taught, and to them were added the most absorbing speed contests in infantry drill, aviation, bombing, and operation of tanks, armored cars, and machine guns. All of these carried academic credits, though students were urged not to elect sports for more than one-third of their credits. What really showed the difference from old fogey inefficiency was that with the educational speed-up of the corporate universities, any bright lad could graduate in two years. As he read the prospectuses for these Olympian, these Ringling Barnum and Bailey universities, Doremus remembered that Victor Loveland, who a year ago had taught Greek in a little college called Isaiah, was now grinding out reading and arithmetic in a corpo labor camp in Maine. Oh well, Isaiah itself had been closed, and its former president, Dr. Owen J. Peasley, district director of education, was to be right-hand man to Professor Ramerick Trout when they founded the University of the Northeastern Province, which was to supplant Harvard, Radcliffe, Boston University, and Brown. He was already working on a university yell, and for that project had sent out letters to 167 of the more prominent poets in America, asking for suggestions. Chapter 21. It was not only the November sleet, setting up a forbidding curtain before the mountains, turning the roadways into slipperiness on which a car would swing around and crash into poles, that kept Doremus stubbornly at home that morning, sitting on his shoulder blades before the fireplace. It was the feeling that there was no point in going to the office, no chance even of a picturesque fight. But he was not contented before the fire. He could find no authentic news even in the papers from Boston or New York, in both of which the morning papers had been combined by the government into one sheet, rich in comic strips in syndicated gossip from Hollywood, and, indeed, lacking only any news, he cursed, threw down the New York Daily Corporate, and tried to read a new novel about a lady whose husband was indelicate in bed and who was too absorbed by the novels he wrote about lady novelists whose husbands were too absorbed by the novels they wrote about lady novelists to appreciate the fine sensibilities of lady novelists who wrote about gentlemen novelists anyway. He chucked the book after the newspaper. The lady's woes didn't seem very important now in a burning world. He could hear Emma in the kitchen discussing with Mrs. Candy the best way of making a chicken pie. They talked without relief, really, they were not so much talking as thinking aloud. Doremus admitted that the nice making of a chicken pie was a thing of consequence, but the blur of voices irritated him. Then Sissy slammed into the room, and Sissy should an hour ago have been at high school, where she was a senior to graduate next year and possibly go to some new and horrible provincial university. What ho? What are you doing home? Why aren't you in school, oh, that? She squatted on the padded fender seat, chin in hands, looking up at him, not seeing him. I don't know s I'll ever go there anymore. You have to repeat a new oath every morning, I pledge myself to serve the corporate state, the chief, all commissioners, the mystic wheel, and the troops of the republic in every thought and deed. Now I ask you. Is that tribe, how are you going to get into the university, huh? Smile at Professor Storb my riff it doesn't gag me. Oh, well well he could not think of anything meatier to say. The doorbell, a shuffling in the hall as of snowy feet, and Julian Falk came sheepishly in, Sissy snapped, Well, I'll be what are you doing home? Why aren't you in Amherst? Oh, that. He squatted beside her. He absently held her hand, and she did not seem to notice it, either. Amherst's got hers. Corpo's closing it today. I got tipped off last Saturday and beat it. They have a cute way of rounding up the students when they close a college and arresting a few of them, just to cheer up the profs, to Doremus, well, sir, I think you'll have to find a place for me on the informer, wiping presses. Could you? Afraid not, boy. Give anything if I could. But I'm a prisoner there. God. Just having to say that makes me appreciate what a rotten position I have. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I understand, of course. Well, I don't just know what I am going to do. Remember back in 33 and 34 and 35 how many good eggs there were and some of them medics and law graduates and trained engineers and so on that simply couldn't get a job? Well, it's worse now. I looked over Amherst, and had a try at Springfield, and I've been here in town two days I'd hoped to have something before I saw you, sis why, I even asked Mrs. Pike if she didn't need somebody to wash dishes at the tavern, but so far there isn't a thing. 
young gentleman, two years in college, 99.3 pure and thorough knowledge 39 articles, able drive car, teach tennis and contract, amiable disposition, desires position digging ditches, you will get something. I'll see you do, my poppet. Insisted Sissy. She was less modernistic and cold with Julian now than Doremus had thought her. Thanks, sis, but honest to God I hope I'm not whining, but looks like I'd either have to enlist in the lousy M. M's, or go to a labor camp. I can't stay home and sponge on Grandad. The poor old reverend hasn't got enough to keep a pussycat in face powder, look it. Look it. Sissy clinched with Julian and bust him, unabashed. I've got an idea new stunt. You know, one of these new careers for youth things. Listen. Last summer there was a friend of Lindy Pike's staying with her and she was an interior decorator from Buffalo, and she said they have a hell of a, sissy. Time getting real, genuine, old hand hewn beans that everybody wants so much now in these phony old English suburban living rooms. Well, look. Round here there's ten million old barns with hand adzed beams just falling down farmers probably be glad to have you haul them off. I kind of thought about it for myself being an architect, you know and John Polycop said he'd sell me as well, dirty looking old five ton truck for four hundred bucks in pre-inflation real money, I mean and on time. Let's you and me try a load of assorted fancy beams, swell. Said Julian, well said Doemus, come on. Sissy leapt up. Let's go ask Lindy what she thinks. She's the only one in this family that's got any business sense, I don't seem to hanker much after going out there in this weather nasty roads. Doremus puffed, nonsense, Doremus. With Julian driving? He's a poor speller and his backhand is fierce, but as a driver, he's better than I am. Why, it's a pleasure to skid with him. Come on. Hey, mother. We'll be back in Raw too, if Emma ever got beyond her distant. Why, I thought you were in school, already, none of the three musketeers heard it. They were bundling up and crawling out into the sleet. Lorinda Pike was in the tavern kitchen, in a calico print with rolled sleeves, dipping donuts into deep fat a picture right out of the romantic days, which Buzz Windrup was trying to restore, when a female who had brought up eleven children and been midwife to dozens of cows was regarded as too fragile to vote. She was ruddy-faced from the stove, but she cocked a lively eye at them, and her greeting was have a donut. Good. She led them from the kitchen with its attendant and eavesdropping horde of a Canuck kitchen maid and two cats, and they sat in the beautiful butler's pantry, with its shelved rows of Italian majolica plates and cups and saucers entirely unsuitable to Vermont, attesting a certain artiness in Lorinda, yet by their cleanness and order revealing her as a sound worker. Sissy sketched her plan behind the statistics there was an agreeable picture of herself and Julian, gypsies in khaki, on the seat of a gypsy truck, peddling silvery old bine rafters, nope. Not a chance, said Lorinda regretfully. The expensive suburban villa business oh, it isn't gone. There's a surprising number of middlemen and professional men who are doing quite well out of having their wealth taken away and distributed to the masses. But all the building is in the hands of contractors who are in politics good old Windrup is so consistently American that he's kept up all our traditional graft, even if he has thrown out all our traditional independence. They wouldn't leave you one cent profit, she's probably right, said Doemus, be the first time I ever was, then. Sniffed Lorinda. Why, I was so simple that I thought women voters knew men too well to fall for noble words on the radio. They sat in the sedan, outside the tavern, Julian and Sissy in front, Doemus in the back seat, dignified and miserable in mummy swathings. That's that, said Sissy. Swell period for young dreamers the dictators brought in. You can march to military bands or you can sit home or you can go to prison. Prime Avery Bells, sir. Yes. Well, I'll find something to do. Sissy. Are you going to marry me soon as I get a job? It was incredible, thought Doemus, how these latter-day unsentimental sentimentalists could ignore him. Like animals, before, if you want to. Though marriage seems to me absolute rot now, Julian. They can't go and let us see that every dog on one of our old institutions is a rotten fake. The way church and state and everything has laid down to the corpus, and still expect us to think they're so hot. But for unformed minds like your grandfather and Doemus, I suppose we'll have to pretend to believe that the preachers who stand for Big Chief Windrup are still so sanctified that they can sell God's license to love, sissy. Oh. I forgot you were there, Dad, but anyway, we're not going to have any kids. Oh, I like children. I'd like to have a dozen of the little devils around. But if people have gone so soft and turned the world over to stuffed shirts and dictators, they needn't expect any decent woman to bring children into such an insane asylum. Why? 
The more you really do love children, the more you'll want M not to be born, now, Julian boasted, in a manner quite as lover-like and naive as that of any sutra a hundred years ago, yes. But just the same, we'll be having children, hell. I suppose so, said the golden girl. It was the unconsidered Doremus who found the jobs for Julian. Old Dr. Marcus Elmstead was trying to steal himself to carry on the work of his sometime partner, Fowler Greenhill. He was not strong enough for much winter driving, and so hotly now did he hate the murderers of his friend that he would not take on any youngster who was in the M. M's or who had half acknowledged their authority by going to a labor camp. So Julian was chosen to drive him, night and day, and presently to help him by giving anesthetic, bandaging hurt legs, and the Julian who had within one week decided that he wanted to be an aviator, a music critic, an air conditioning engineer, an archaeologist excavating in Yucatan, was dead set on medicine and replaced for Doremus his dead doctor son-in-law. And Doremus heard Julian and Sissy boasting and squabbling and squeaking in the half-lighted parlor and from them from them and from David and Lorinda and Buck Titus got resolution enough to go on in the informer office without choking Storbmeyer to death. Chapter 22 December 10th was the birthday of Berzelius Windrip, though in his earlier days as a politician, before he fruitfully realized that lies sometimes get printed and unjustly remembered against you. He had been wont to tell the world that his birthday was on December 25th, like one whom he admitted to be an even greater leader, and to shout, with real tears in his eyes, that his complete name was Basilius Noel Winnacht Windrip. His birthday in 1937 he commemorated by the historical order of regulation, which stated that though the corporate government had proved both its stability and its goodwill, there were still certain stupid or vicious elements who, in their foul envy of corpus success, wanted to destroy everything that was good. The kind-hearted government was fed up, and the country was informed that, from this day on, any person who by word or act sought to harm or discredit the state, would be executed or interned. Inasmuch as the prisons were already too full, both for these slanderous criminals and for the persons whom the kind-hearted state had to guard by protective arrest, there were immediately to be opened, all over the country, concentration camps. Doremus guessed that the reason for the concentration camps was not only the provision of extra room for victims but, even more, the provision of places where the livelier young M. M's could amuse themselves without interference from old-time professional policemen and prison keepers, most of whom regarded their charges not as enemies, to be tortured, but just as cattle, to be kept safely. On the 11th, a concentration camp was enthusiastically opened, with band music, paper flowers, and speeches by District Commissioner Eek and Shad Liju, at Trianon, nine miles north of Fort Beulah, in what had been a modern experimental school for girls. The girls and their teachers, no sound material for corpism anyway, were simply sent about their business, and on that day and every day afterward, Doima Scott from journalist friends all over the country secret news of corpo terrorism and of the first bloody rebellions against the corpos. In Arkansas, a group of 96 former sharecroppers, who had always bellyached about their misfortunes yet seemed not a bit happier in well-run, hygienic labor camps with free weekly band concerts attacked the superintendent's office at one camp and killed the superintendent and five assistants. They were rounded up by an M.M. regiment from Little Rock, stood up in a winter ragged cornfield, told to run, and shot in the back with machine guns as they comically staggered away. In San Francisco, dock workers tried to start an absolutely illegal strike, and their leaders, known to be communists, were so treasonable in their speeches against the government that an M.M. commander had three of them tied up to a bale of rattan, which was soaked with oil and set afire. The commander gave warning to all such malcontents by shooting off the criminals' fingers and ears while they were burning, and so skilled a marksman was he, so much credit to the efficient M.M. training, that he did not kill one single man while thus trimming them up. He afterward went in search of Tom Mooney, released by the Supreme Court of the United States, early in 1936, but that notorious anti-corpo agitator had had the fear of God put into him properly, and had escaped on a schooner for Tahiti. In Portucket, a man who ought to have been free from the rotten seditious notions of such so-called labor leaders, in fact a man who was a fashionable dentist and director in a bank, absurdly resented the attentions which half a dozen uniformed M. M's they were all on leave, and merely full of youthful spirits, anyway bestowed upon his wife at a cafe and, in the confusion, shot and killed three of them. Ordinarily, since it was none of the public's business anyway, the M. M's did not give out details of their disciplining of rebels, but in this case, where the fool of a dentist had shown himself to be a homicidal maniac, the local M.M. commander permitted the papers to print the fact that the dentist had been given 69 lashes with a flexible steel rod, then, when he came to, 
left to think over his murderous idiocy in a cell in which there was two feet of water in the bottom but, rather ironically, none to drink. Unfortunately, the fellow died before having the opportunity to seek religious consolation. In Scranton, the Catholic pastor of a working-class church was kidnapped and beaten. In central Kansas, a man named George W. Smith pointlessly gathered a couple of hundred farmers armed with shotguns and sporting rifles and an absurdly few automatic pistols, and led them in burning an M.M. barracks. M.M. tanks were called out, and the Hick would-be rebels were not, this time, used as warnings, but were overcome with mustard gas, then disposed of with hand grenades, which was an altogether intelligent move, since there was nothing of the scoundrels left for sentimental relatives to bury and make propaganda over. But in New York City the case was the opposite instead of being thus surprised. The M. M's rounded up all suspected communists in the former boroughs of Manhattan and the Bronx, and all persons who were reported to have been seen consorting with such communists, and interned the lot of them in the 19 concentration camps on Long Island. Most of them wailed that they were not communists at all. For the first time in America, except during the Civil War and the World War, people were afraid to say whatever came to their tongues. On the streets, on trains, at theaters, men looked about to see who might be listening before they dared so much as say there was a drought in the West, for someone might suppose they were blaming the drought on the chief. They were particularly skittish about waiters, who were supposed to listen from the ambush which every waiter carries about with him anyway, and to report to the M. M's. People who could not resist talking politics spoke of Windrup as Colonel Robinson or Dr. Brown and of Saracen as Judge Jones or my cousin Casper, and you would hear gossips hissing shhh. At the seemingly innocent statement, my cousin doesn't seem to be as keen on playing bridge with the doctor as he used to I'll bet sometime they'll quit playing. Every moment everyone felt fear, nameless and omnipresent. They were as jumpy as men in a plague district. Any sudden sound, any unexplained footstep, any unfamiliar script on an envelope, made them startle, and for months they never felt secure enough to let themselves go, in complete sleep. And with the coming of fear went out their pride. Daily common now as weather reports were the rumors of people who had suddenly been carried off under protective arrest, and daily more of them were celebrities. At first the M. M's had, outside of the one stroke against Congress, dared to arrest only the unknown and defenseless. Now, incredulously for these leaders had seemed invulnerable, above the ordinary law you heard of judges, army officers, ex-state governors, bankers who had not played in with the corpos, Jewish lawyers who had been ambassadors, being carted off to the common stink and the mud of the cells, to the journalist or Emus and his family it was not least interesting that among these imprisoned celebrities were so many journalists, Raymond Moley, Frank Simmons, Frank Kent, Hayward Brown, Mark Sullivan, Earl Browder, Franklin P. Adams, George Seltz, Frazier Hunt, Garrett Garrett, Granville Hicks, Edwin James, Robert Morse loved men who differed grotesquely except in their common dislike of being little disciples of Saracen and McGiblin. Few writers for Hearst were arrested, however. The plague came nearer to Doremus when unrenowned editors in Lowell and Providence and Albany, who had done nothing more than fail to be enthusiastic about the corpos, were taken away for questioning, and not released for weeks months, it came much nearer at the time of the book burning. All over the country, books that might threaten the Pax Romana of the corporate state were gleefully being burned by the more scholarly minute men. This form of safeguarding the state so modern that it had scarce been known prior to AD 1300 was instituted by Secretary of Culture Mugablin, but in each province the Crusaders were allowed to have the fun of picking out their own paper and ink traitors. In the northeastern province, Judge Effingham Swan and Dr. Owen J. Peasley were appointed censors by Commissioner Dewey Hake, and their index was lyrically praised all through the country, for Swan saw that it was not such obvious anarchists and swords as Darrow, Stephens, Norman Thomas, who were the real danger, like rattlesnakes, their noisiness betrayed their venom. The real enemies were men whose sanctification by death had appallingly permitted them to sneak even into respectable school libraries men so perverse that they had been traitors to the corpus state years and years before there had been any corpus state, and Swan, with peacefully chirping agreement, barred from all sale or possession the books of Thoreau, Emerson, Whittier, Whitman, Mark Twain, Howells, and the New Freedom, by Woodrow Wilson, for though in later life Wilson became a sound manipulative politician, he had earlier been troubled with itching ideals. It goes without saying that Swan denounced all such atheistic foreigners, dead or alive, as Wells, Marx, Shaw, the Mann brothers, Tolstoy, and P.G. Wodehouse with his unscrupulous propaganda against the aristocratic tradition. Who could tell? Perhaps, someday, in a corporate empire, he might be Sir Effingham Swan, 
But, and in one item Swan showed blinding genius he had the foresight to see the peril of that cynical volume, the collected sayings of Will Rogers, of the book burnings in Syracuse and Schenectady and Hartford, or Emus had heard, but they seemed improbable as ghost stories. The Jessup family were at dinner, just after seven, when on the porch they heard the tramping they had half expected, altogether dreaded. Mrs. Candy even the icicle, Mrs. Candy, held her breast in agitation before she stalked out to open the door. Even David sat at table, spoon suspended in air, Shad's voice, in the name of the chief. Harsh feet in the hall, and Shad waddling into the dining room, cap on, hand on pistol, but grinning, and with leering geniality bawling, H.R.U., folks. Search for bad books. Orders of the district commissioner. Come on, Jessup. He looked at the fireplace to which he had once brought so many armfuls of wood, and snickered, if you'll just sit down in the other room, I will like hell just sit down in the other room. We're burning the books tonight. Snap to it, Jessup. Shad looked at the exasperated Emma, he looked at Sissy, he winked with heavy deliberation and chuckled, H.R.U., Ms. Jessup. Hello, sis. How's the kid? But at Mary Greenhill he did not look, nor she at him, in the hall, door Emus found Shad's entourage, four sheepish M. M's and a more sheepish Emil Storbmeyer, who whimpered, just orders you know just orders, door Emus safely said nothing, led them up to his study, now a week before he had removed every publication that any sane corpo could consider radical, his Das Kapital and Veblen and all the Russian novels and even Sumner's Folkways and Freud's Civilization and its discontents, Thoreau and the other hoary scoundrels banned by Swan, old files of the nation and new republic and such copies as he had been able to get of Walt Trowbridge's lance for democracy, had removed them and hidden them inside an old horsehair sofa in the upper hall. I told you there was nothing, said Storbmeyer, after the search. Let's go, said Shad, ha. Huh. I know this house, Ensign. I used to work here had the privilege of putting up those storm windows you can see there, and of getting bawled out right here in this room. You won't remember those times, Doc when I used to mow your lawn, too, and you used to be so snotty. Storbmeyer blushed. You bet. I know my way around, and there's a lot of fool books downstairs in the sitting room. Indeed in that apartment variously called the drawing room, the living room, the sitting room, the parlor and once, even, by a spinster who thought editors were romantic, the studio. There were two or three hundred volumes, mostly in standard sets. Shad glumly stared at them, the while he rubbed the faded Brussels carpet with his spurs. He was worried. He had to find something seditious. He pointed at Doremus's dearest treasure, the 34-volume extra-illustrated edition of Dickens which had been his father's, and his father's only insane extravagance. Shad demanded of Storbmeyer, that guy Dickens didn't he do a lot of complaining about conditions about schools and the police and everything? Storbmeyer protested, yes, but Shad but, Captain Leeju, that was a hundred years ago, makes no difference. Dead skunk stinks worse than a live one, Doremus cried. Yes, but not for a hundred years. Besides, the M. M's, obeying Shad's gesture, were already yanking the volumes of Dickens from the shelves, dropping them on the floor, covers cracking. Doremus seized an M. M's arm, from the door sissy shrieked. Shad lumbered up to him, enormous red fist at Doremus's nose, growling, want to get the daylight beaten out of you now. Instead of later, Doremus and sissy, side by side on a couch, watched the books thrown in a heap. He grasped her hand, muttering to her, hush hush. Oh, Sissy was a pretty girl, and young, but a pretty girl school teacher had been attacked, her clothes stripped off, and been left in the snow just south of town, two nights ago. Doremus could not have stayed away from the book burning. It was like seeing for the last time the face of a dead friend. Kindling, Excelsior, and spruce logs had been heaped on the thin snow on the green. Tomorrow there would be a fine patch burned in the hundred-year-old sward, round the pyre danced M. M. schoolboys, students from the rather ratty business college on Elm Street, and unknown farm lads, seizing books from the pile guarded by the broadly cheerful Shad and skimming them into the flames. Doremus saw his Martin Chuzzlewit fly into air and land on the burning lid of an ancient commode. It lay there open to a fizz drawing of Sari Gamp, which withered instantly. As a small boy he had always laughed over that drawing. He saw the old rector, Mr. Falk, squeezing his hands together. When Doremus touched his shoulder, Mr. Falk mourned, they took away my urn burial, my imitatio Christi. I don't know why, I don't know why. And they're burning them there, who owned them, Doremus did not know, nor why they had been seized, 
but he saw Alice in Wonderland and Omar Khayyam and Shelley and the man who was Thursday and a farewell to arms all burning together, to the greater glory of the dictator and the greater enlightenment of his people. The fire was almost over when Carl Pascal pushed up to Shad Liju and shouted, I hear you stink as I've been out driving a guy, and I hear you raided my room and took off my books while I was away, you bet we did, comrade, and you're burning them burning my, oh no, comrade. Not burning em. Worth to blame much, comrade. Shad laughed very much. They're at the police station. We've just been waiting for you. It was awful nice to find all your little communist books. Here. Take him along. So Carl Pascal was the first prisoner to go from Fort Beulah to the Trianon concentration camp. No, that's wrong, the second. The first, so inconspicuous that one almost forgets him, was an ordinary fellow, an electrician who had never so much as spoken of politics. Braden, his name was. A minute man who stood well with Shad and Storbmeyer wanted Braden's job. Braden went to concentration camp. Braden was flogged when he declared, under Shad's questioning, that he knew nothing about any plots against the chief. Braden died, alone in a dark cell, before January. An English globetrotter who gave up two weeks of December to a thorough study of conditions in America, wrote to his London paper, and later said on the wireless for the BBC, after a thorough glance at America I find that, far from there being any discontent with the Corbo administration among the people, they have never been so happy and so resolutely set on making a brave new world. I asked a very prominent Hebrew banker about the assertions that his people were being oppressed, and he assured me, when we hear about such silly rumors, we are highly amused. Chapter 23. Doremus was nervous. The minute men had come, not with Shad but with Emil and a strange battalion leader from Hanover, to examine the private letters in his study. They were polite enough, but alarmingly thorough. Then he knew, from the disorder in his desk at the informer, that someone had gone over his papers there. Emil avoided him at the office. Doremus was called to Shad's office and gruffly questioned about correspondence which some denouncer had reported his having with the agents of Wall Drobridge, so Doremus was nervous. So Doremus was certain that his time for going to concentration camp was coming. He glanced back at every stranger who seemed to be following him on the street. The fruitman, Tony Mogliani, flowery advocate of Windrip, of Mussolini, and of tobacco quid as a cure for cuts and burns asked him too many questions about his plans for the time when he should get through on a paper, and once the tramp tried to quiz Mrs. Candy, meantime peering at the pantry shelves, perhaps to see if there was any sign of their being understocked, as if for closing the house and fleeing. But perhaps the tramp really was a tramp, in the office, in mid-afternoon, Doremus had a telephone call from that scholar farmer, Buck Titus. Going to be home this evening, about nine? Good. Got to see you. Important. Say, See if you can have all your family and Linda Pike and young Falk there, too, will you? Got an idea. Important, as important ideas, just now, usually concerned being imprisoned, Doremus and his women waited jumpily. Lorinda came in twittering, for the sight of them always did make her twitter a little, and in Lorinda there was no relief. Julian came in shyly, and there was no relief in Julian. Mrs. Candy brought in unsolicited tea with a dash of rum, and in her was some relief but it was all a dullness of fidgety waiting till Buck slammed in, ten minutes late and very snowy, so keep waiting but I've been telephoning. Here's some news you won't have even in the office yet, Dormouse. The forest fire's getting nearer. This afternoon they arrested the editor of the Rutland Herald no charge laid against him yet no publicity I got it from a commission merchant I deal with in Rutland. You're next, Doremus. I reckon they've just been laying off you till Storbmeyer picked your brains or maybe lead you has some nice idea about torturing you by keeping you waiting. Anyway, you've got to get out. And tomorrow. To Canada. To stay. By automobile. No can do by plane any more Canadian governments stop that. You and Emma and Mary and Dave and Sis and the whole damn shooting match and maybe foolish and Mrs. Candy and the Canary, couldn't possibly. Take me weeks to realize on what investments I've got. Guess I could raise 20,000, but it'd take weeks. Sign M over to me if you trust me and you better. I can cash in everything better than you can stand in with the corpos better been selling M horses and they think I'm the kind of loud-mouthed walking gent that will join M. I've got fifteen hundred Canadian dollars for you right here in my pocket, for a starter. We'd never get across the border. The M. M's are watching every inch, just looking for suspects like me. I've got a Canadian driver's license and Canadian registration plates ready to put on my car we'll take mine less suspicious. 
I can look like a real farmer that's because I'm one, I guess I'm going to drive you all, by the way. I got the plates smuggled in underneath the bottles in a case of ale. So we're all set, and we'll start tomorrow night, if the weather isn't too clear hope there'll be snow. But Buck. Good lord. I'm not going to flee. I'm not guilty of anything. I haven't anything to flee for, just your life, my boy, just your life, I'm not afraid of em, oh yes you are, oh well if you look at it that way, probably I am. But I'm not going to let a bunch of lunatics and gunmen drive me out of the country that I and my ancestors made. Emma choked with the effort to think of something convincing, Mary seemed without tears to be weeping, Sissy squeaked, Julian and Lorinda started to speak and interrupted each other, and it was the uninvited Mrs. Candy who, from the doorway, led off, now isn't that like a man? Stubborn as mules. All of em. Everyone. And show offs, the whole lot of em. Course you just wouldn't stop and think how your women folks will feel if you get took off and shot. You just stand in front of the locomotive and claim that because you were on the section gang that built the track, you got more right there than the engine has, and then when it's gone over you and gone away, you expect us all to think what a hero you were. Well, maybe some call it being a hero, but, well, confound it all, all of you picking on me and trying to get me all mixed up and not carry out my duty to the state as I see it, you're over sixty, do Emus. Maybe a lot of us can do our duty better now from Canada than we can here like Walt Trowbridge. Besought Lorinda. Emma looked at her friend Lorinda with no particular affection. But to let the corpos steal the country and nobody protest. No, that's the kind of argument that sent a few million out to die, to make the world safe for democracy and a cinch for fascism. Scoffed Buck, Dad. Come with us. Because we can't go without you. And I'm getting scared here. Sissy sounded scared, too. Sissy the Unconquerable. This afternoon Shad stopped me on the street and wanted me to go out with him. He tickled my chin, the little darling. But honestly, the way he smirked, as if he was so sure of me I got scared. I'll get a shotgun and why, I'll kill the dirty wait till I get my hands on cried Doremus, Julian, and Buck, all together, and glared at one another, then looked sheepish as foolish barked at the racket, and Mrs. Candy, leaning like a frozen codfish against the door jam, snorted some more locomotive batters, Doremus laughed. For one only time in his life he showed genius, for he consented, all right. We'll go. But just imagine that I'm a man of strong willpower and I'm taking all night to be convinced. We'll start tomorrow night. What he did not say was that he planned, the moment he had his family safe in Canada, with money in the bank and perhaps a job to amuse Sissy, to run away from them and come back to his proper fight. He would at least kill Shad before he got killed himself. It was only a week before Christmas, a holiday always greeted with good cheer and quantities of coloured ribbons in the Jessup household, and that wild day of preparing for flight had a queer Christmas joyfulness. To dodge suspicion, Doremus spent most of the time at the office, and a hundred times it seemed that Storbmeyer was glancing at him with just the ruler-threatening hidden eye he had used on whisperers and like young criminals in school. But he took off two hours at lunchtime, and he went home early in the afternoon and his long depression was gone in the prospect of Canada and freedom, in an excited inspection of clothes that was like preparation for a fishing trip. They worked upstairs, behind drawn blinds, feeling like spies in an E. Philip's Oppenheim story, beleaguered in the dark and stone-floored ducal bedroom of an ancient inn just beyond grass. Downstairs, Mrs. Candy was pretentiously busy looking normal after their flight, she and the canary were to remain and she was to be surprised when the M. Ems reported that the Jessups seemed to have escaped. Doremus had drawn five hundred from each of the local banks, late that afternoon, telling them that he was thinking of taking an option on an apple orchard. He was too well trained a domestic animal to be raucously amused, but he could not help observing that while he himself was taking on the flight to Egypt only all the money he could get hold of, plus cigarettes, six handkerchiefs, two extra pairs of socks, a comb, a toothbrush, and the first volume of Spengler's Decline of the West decidedly it was not his favorite book, but one he had been trying to make himself read for years, on train journeys while, in fact, he took nothing that he could not stuff into his overcoat pockets, Sissy apparently had need of all her newest lingerie and of a large framed picture of Julian, Emma of a Kodak album showing the three children from the ages of 1 to 20, David of his new model aeroplane, and Mary of her still, dark hatred that was heavier to carry than many chests. Julian and Lorinda were there to help them, Julian off in corners with Sissy, with Lorinda, Doremus had but one free moment. In the old-fashioned guest bathroom, Linda. Oh, Lord, 
will come through. In Canada you'll have time to catch your breath. Join Trowbridge. Yes, but to leave you I'd hoped somehow, by some miracle, you and I could have maybe a month together, say in Monterey or Venice or the Yellowstone. I hate it when life doesn't seem to stick together and get somewhere and have some plan and meaning, it's had meaning. No dictator can completely smother us now. Come, goodbye, my Linda, not even now did he alarm her by confessing that he planned to come back, into danger, embracing beside an aged tin-lined bathtub with woodwork painted a dreary brown, in a room which smelled slightly of gas from an old hot water heater embracing in sunset-colored mist upon a mountain top. Darkness, edged wind, wickedly deliberate snow and in it Buck Titus boisterously cheerful in his veteran Nash, looking as farmer-like as he could, in sealskin cap with rubbed bare patches and an atrocious dogskin overcoat. Doremus thought of him again as a Captain Charles King cavalryman chasing the Sioux across blizzard-blinded prairies. They packed alarmingly into the car, Mary beside Buck, the driver, in the back, Doremus between Emma and Sissy, on the floor, David and Foolish and the toy aeroplane indistinguishably curled up together beneath a robe. Trunk rack and front fenders were heaped with tarpaulin covered suitcases. Lord, I wish I were going. moaned Julian. Look. Sis. Grand spy story idea. But I mean seriously, send souvenir postcards to my granddad views of churches and so on. Just sign M. Jane and whatever you say about the church, I'll know you really mean it about you and oh, damn all mystery. I want you, sissy. Mrs. Candy whisked a bundle in among the already intolerable mess of baggage which promised to descend on Doremus's knees and David's head, and she snapped, Well, if you folks must go flying around the country it's a coconut layer cake. Savagely, soon's you get around the corner, throw the full thing in the ditch if you want to. She fled sobbing into the kitchen, where Lorinda stood in the lighted doorway, silent, her trembling hands out to them. The car was already lurching in the snow before they had sneaked through Fort Beulah by shadowy back streets and started streaking northward. Sissy sang out cheerily, Well, Christmas in Canada. Skittles and beer and lots of holly. Oh, do they have Santa Claus in Canada? Came David's voice, wondering, childish, slightly muffled by lap robe and the furry ears of foolish. Of course they do, dearie. Emery assured him and, to the grown-ups, now wasn't that the cutest thing, to Doremus, Sissy whispered, Done well ought to be cute. Took me ten minutes to teach him to say it, this afternoon. Hold my hand. I hope Buck knows how to drive. Buck Titus knew every back road from Fort Beulah to the border, preferably in filthy weather, like tonight. Beyond Triamon he pulled the car up deep rutted roads, on which you would have to back if you were to pass anyone. Upgrades on which the car knocked and panted, into lonely hills, by a zigzag of roads, they jerked toward Canada. Wet snow sheathed the windshield, then froze, and Buck had to drive with his head thrust out through the open window, and the blast came in and circled round their stiff necks. Doremus could see nothing save the back of Buck's twisted, taut neck, and the icy windshield, most of the time. Just now and then a light far below the level of the road indicated that they were sliding along a shelf road, and if they skidded off, they would keep going a hundred feet, two hundred feet, downward probably turning over and over. Once they did skid, and while they panted in an eternity of four seconds, Buck yanked the car up a bank beside the road, down to the left again, and finally straight speeding on as if nothing had happened, while Doremus felt feeble in the knees, for a long while he kept going rigid with fear, but he sank into misery, too cold and deaf to feel anything except a slow desire to vomit as the car lurched. Probably he slept at least, he awakened, and awakened to a sensation of pushing the car anxiously uphill, as she bucked and stuttered in the effort to make a slippery rise. Suppose the engine died suppose the brakes would not hold and they slid back downhill, reeling, bursting off the road and down a great many suppositions tortured him, hour by hour, then he tried being awake and bright and helpful. He noticed that the ice-lined windshield, illuminated from the light on the snow ahead, was a sheet of diamonds. He noticed it, but he couldn't get himself to think much of diamonds, even in sheets, he tried conversation, cheer up. Breakfast at dawn across the border. He tried on sissy breakfast. She said bitterly, and they crunched on, in that moving coffin with only the sheet of diamonds and Buck's silhouette alive in all the world, after unnumbered hours the car reared and tumbled and reared again. The motor raced, its sound rose to an intolerable roaring, yet the car seemed not to be moving. The motor stopped abruptly. Buck cursed, popped his head back into the car like a turtle, and the starter ground long and whiningly. The motor again roared, again stopped. They could hear stiff branches rattling hear foolish moaning in sleep. The car was a storm-menaced cabin in the wilderness. 
The silence seemed waiting, as they were waiting. Strubble? said Doemus, stuck. No traction. Hit a drift of wet snow drainage from a busted culvert, ish think. Hell. Have to get out and take a look, outside the car, as Doemus crept down from the slippery running board, it was cold in a vicious wind. He was so stiff he could scarcely stand, as people do, feeling important and advisory, Doemus looked at the drift with an electric torch, and Sissy looked at the drift with the torch, and Buck impatiently took the torch away from them and looked twice. Get some and brush would help, said Sissy and Buck together, while Doremus rubbed his chilly ears, they three trotted back and forth with fragments of brush, laying it in front of the wheels, while Mary politely asked from within, can I help? And no one seemed particularly to have answered her, the headlights picked out an abandoned shack beside the road, an unpainted grey pine cabin with broken window glass and no door. Emma, sighing her way out of the car and stepping through the lumpy snow as delicately as a pacer at a horse show, said humbly, that little house the maybe I could go in and make some hot coffee on the alcohol stove didn't have room for a thermos. Hot coffee, Dormouse, to Doremus she sounded, just now, not at all like a wife, but as sensible as Mrs. Candy, when the car did kick its way up on the pathway of twigs and stand panting safely beyond the drift, they had, in the sheltered shack, coffee with slabs of Mrs. Candy's voluptuous coconut cake. Doremus bonded, this is a nice place. I like this place. It doesn't bounce or skid. I don't want to leave this place. He did. The secure immobility of the shack was behind them, dark miles behind, and they were again pitching and rolling and being sick and inescapably chilly. David was alternately crying and going back to sleep. Foolish woke up to cough inquiringly and returned to his dream of rabbiting. And Doremus was sleeping, his head swaying like a masthead in long rollers, his shoulder against Emma's, his hand warm about Sissy's, and his soul in nameless bliss. He roused to a half-dawn filmy with snow. The car was standing in what seemed to be a crossroads hamlet, and Buck was examining a map by the light of the electric torch. Got anywhere yet? Doremus whispered. Just a few miles to the border. Anybody stopped us? Nope. Oh, we'll make it, all right, oh man. Out of East Berkshire, Buck took not the main road to the border but an old wood lane so little used that the ruts were twin snakes. Though Doremus said nothing, the others felt his intensity his anxiety that was like listening for an enemy in the dark. David sat up, the blue motor robe about him. Foolish started, snorted, looked offended but, catching the spirit of the moment, comfortingly laid a paw on Doremus's knee and insisted on shaking hands, over and over, as gravely as a Venetian senator or an undertaker. They dropped into the dimness of a tree-walled hollow. A searchlight darted, and rested hotly on them, so dazzling them that Buck almost ran off the road, confounded, he said gently. No one else said anything, he crawled up to the light, which was mounted on a platform in front of a small shelter hut. Two minute men stood out in the road, dripping with radiance from the car. They were young and rural, but they had efficient repeating rifles, where you headed for? Demanded the elder, good-naturedly enough, Montreal, where we live. Buck showed his Canadian license. Gasoline motor and electric light, yet Doremus saw the frontier guard as a sentry in 1864, studying a pass-by lantern light beside a farm wagon in which hid General Joe Johnston's spies disguised as plantation hands, I guess it's all right. Seems in order. But we've had some trouble with refugees. You'll have to wait till the battalion leader comes maybe long about noon, but good lord, inspector, we can't do that. My mother's awful sick, in Montreal, you, I've heard that one before. And maybe it's true, this time. But afraid you'll have to wait for the bat. You folks can come in and set by the fire, if you want to but we've got to, you heard what I said. The M. M's were fingering their rifles, all right. But tell you what we'll do. We'll go back to East Berkshire and get some breakfast and a wash and come back here. Noon, you said, okay. And say, brother, it does seem kind of funny, you're taking this back road, when there's a first-rate highway. S long. Be good. Just don't try it again. The bat might be here next time and he ain't a farmer like you or me, the refugees as they drove away, had an uncomfortable feeling that the guards were laughing at them, three border posts they tried, and at three posts they were turned back, well? said Buck, yes, I guess so, back home, my turn to drive, said Doremus wearily, the humiliation of retreat was the worse in that none of the guards had troubled to do more than laugh at them, they were trapped too tightly for the trappers to worry, Doremus's only clear emotion as, tails between their legs, they backtracked to Shadley Jew's sneer and to Mrs. Candy's well, 
I never was regret that he had not shot one guard, at least, and he raged. Now I know why men like John Brown became crazy killers. Chapter 24. He could not decide whether Emil Storbmeyer, and through him Shad Lee Jew, knew that he had tried to escape. Did Storbmeyer really look more knowing, or did he just imagine it? What the deuce had Emil meant when he said, I hear the roads aren't so good up north not so good. Whether they knew or not, it was grinding that he should have to shiver lest an illiterate roust about like Shad Lee Jew find out that he desired to go to Canada, while a ruler slapper like Storbmeyer, a squeers with certificates in pedagogy, should now be able to cuff grown men instead of urchins and should be editor of the informer. Doremus's informer. Storbmeyer. That human blackboard, daily Doremus found it more cramping, more instantly stirring to fury, to write anything mentioning Windrip. His private office the cheerfully rattling linotype room the shouting press room with its smell of ink that to him hitherto had been like the smell of grease paint to an actor they were hateful now, and choking. Not even Lorinda's faith, not even Sissy's jibes and Buck's stories, could rouse him to hope. He rejoiced the more, therefore, when his son Philip telephoned him from Worcester. Be home Sunday. Merrill is in New York, gadding, and I'm all alone here. Thought I'd just drive up for the day and see how things are in your neck of the woods. Come on. Splendid. So long since we've seen you. I'll have your mother start a pot of bins right away. Doremus was happy. Not for some time did his cursed two-way mindedness come to weaken his joy as he wondered whether it wasn't just a myth held over from boyhood that Philip really cared so much for Emma's bins and brown bread, and wondered just why it was that up-to-date Americans like Philip always used the long-distance telephone rather than undergo the dreadful toil of dictating a letter a day or two earlier. It didn't really seem so efficient, the old-fashioned village editor reflected, to spend 75 cents on a telephone call in order to save 5 cents worth of time, oh hush. Anyway, I'll be delighted to see the boy. I'll bet there isn't a smarter young lawyer in Worcester. There's one member of the family that's a real success. He was a little shocked when Philip came, like a one-man procession, into the living room, late on Saturday afternoon. He had been forgetting how bald this upstanding young advocate was growing even at thirty-four. And it seemed to him that Philip was a little heavy and senatorial in speech and a bit too cordial. By Jove, Dad, you don't know how good it is to be back in the old digs. Mother and the girls upstairs? By Jove, sir that was a horrible business, the killing of poor Fowler. Horrible. I was simply horrified. There must have been a mistake somewhere. Because Judge Swan has a wonderful reputation for scrupulousness, there was no mistake. Swan is a fiend. Literally. Doema sounded less paternal than when he had first bounded up to shake hands with the beloved prodigal. Really? We must talk it over. I'll see if there can't be a stricter investigation. Swan? Really? We'll certainly go into the whole business. But first I must just skip upstairs and give Mammy a good smack, and Mary and little sis, and that was the last time that Philip mentioned Effingham Swan or any stricter investigation of the acts thereof. All afternoon he was relentlessly filial and fraternal, and he smiled like an automobile salesman when Sissy griped at him, what's the idea of all the tender hand dusting, Philco, Doremus and he were not alone till nearly midnight, they sat upstairs in the sacred study. Philip lighted one of Doremus's excellent cigars as though he were a cinema actor playing the role of a man lighting an excellent cigar, and breathed amiably. Well, sir, this is an excellent cigar. It certainly is excellent. Why not? Oh, I just mean I was just appreciating it. What is it, Phil? There's something on your mind. Shoot. Not rowing with Marilla, are you? Certainly not. Most certainly not. Oh, I don't approve of everything Mary does she's a little extravagant but she's got a heart of gold. And let me tell you, Pater, there isn't a young society woman in Worcester that makes a nicer impression on everybody, especially at nice dinner parties. Well then? Let's have it, Phil. Something serious? Yes, I'm afraid there is. Look, Dad. Oh, do sit down and be comfortable. I've been awfully perturbed to hear that you've, ah, uh, that you're in slightly bad odor with some of the authorities. You mean the corpos, naturally. Who else? Maybe I don't recognize them as authorities. Oh, listen, Pater. Please don't joke tonight. I'm serious. As a matter of fact, I hear you're more than just slightly in wrong with them. And who may your informant be? Oh, just let us old school friends. Now you aren't really pro corpo, are you? How did you ever guess? Well, I've been I didn't vote for Windrip, personally, but I begin to see where I was wrong. I can see now that he has not only great personal magnetism, but real constructive power real sure enough statesmanship. Some say it's Lee Saracen's doing, 
but it don't you believe it for a minute. Look at all Buzz did back in his home state, before he ever teamed up with Saracen. And some say Windrup is crude. Well, so were Lincoln and Jackson. Now what I think of Windrup, the only thing you ought to think of Windrup is that his gangsters murdered your fine brother-in-law. And plenty of other men just as good. Do you condone such murders? No. Certainly not. How can you suggest such a thing, Dad? No one abhors violence more than I do. Still, you can't make an omelette without breaking eggs, hell and damnation. Why, Pater, don't call me Pater. If I ever hear that can't make an omelette phrase again, I'll start doing a little murder myself. It's used to justify every atrocity under every despotism, fascist or Nazi or communist or American labor war. Omelette. Eggs. By God, sir, men's souls and blood are not eggshells for tyrants to break. Oh, sorry, sir. I guess maybe the phrase is a little sharp-worn. I just mean to say I'm just trying to figure this situation out realistically, realistically. That's another buttered bun to excuse murder, but honestly, you know horrible things do happen, thanks to the imperfection of human nature, but you can forgive the means if the end is a rejuvenated nation that, I can do nothing of the kind. I can never forgive evil and lying and cruel means, and still less can I forgive fanatics that use that for an excuse. If I may imitate Romain Roland a country that tolerates evil means evil manners, standards of ethics for a generation, will be so poisoned that it never will have any good end. I'm just curious, but do you know how perfectly you're quoting every Bolshevik apologist that sneers at decency and kindness and truthfulness in daily dealings as bourgeois morality? I hadn't understood that you'd gone quite so Marxo-materialistic, I. Marxian. Good God. Doremus was pleased to see that he had stirred his son out of his if you're on a please smugness. Why? One of the things I most admire about the corpos is that, as I know, absolutely I have reliable information from Washington they have saved us from a simply ghastly invasion by red agents of Moscow communists pretending to be decent labor leaders, not really. Had the fool forgotten that his father was a newspaperman and not likely to be impressed by reliable information from Washington, really? And to be realistic sorry, sir, if you don't like the word, but to be, to be, in fact, to be realistic, well, yes, then. Doremus recalled such tempers in Philip from years ago. Had he been wise, after all, to restrain himself from the domestic pleasure of licking the brat? The whole point is that Windrip, or anyway the corpos, are here to stay, Pater, and we've got to base our future actions not on some desired utopia but on what we really and truly have. And think of what they've actually done. Just, for example, how they've removed the advertising billboards from the highways, and ended unemployment and their simply stupendous feat in getting rid of all crime, good God, pardon me what why say, Dad, nothing, nothing, go on, but I begin to see now that the corpo gains haven't been just material but spiritual, eh, really, they revitalize the whole country, formerly we had gotten pretty sordid, just thinking about material possessions and comforts about electric refrigeration and television and air conditioning, kind of lost the sturdiness that characterized our pioneer ancestors, why, ever so many young men were refusing to take military drill, and the discipline and willpower and good fellowship that you only get from military training oh, pardon me. I forgot you were a pacifist, Doremus grimly muttered, not any more, of course there must be any number of things we can't agree on, dad. But after all, as a publicist you ought to listen to the voice of youth. You? Youth? You're not youth. You're two thousand years old, mentally. You date just about 100 before Christ in your fine new imperialistic theories, no, but you must listen, Dad. Why do you suppose I came clear up here from Worcester just to see you, God only knows, I want to make myself clear. Before Windrip, we'd been lying down in America, while Europe was throwing off all her bonds both monarchy and this antiquated parliamentary democratic liberal system that really means rule by professional politicians and by egotistic intellectuals. We've got to catch up to Europe again got to expand it's the rule of life. A nation, like a man, has to go ahead or go backward. Always, I know, Phil. I used to write that same thing in those same words, back before 1914. Did you? Well, anyway got to expand. Why, what we ought to do is to grab all of Mexico, and maybe Central America, and a good big slice of China. Why, just on their own behalf we ought to do it, misgoverned the way they are. Maybe I'm wrong but, impossible. Windrup and Saracen and Dewey Hake and Migablin, all those fellows, they're big they are making me stop and think. And now to come down to my errand here, you think I ought to run the informer according to corpo theology, why why yes. 
That was approximately what I was going to say. I just don't see why you haven't been more reasonable about this whole thing you with your quick mind, after all. The time for selfish individualism is gone. We've got to have mass action. One for all and all for one, Philip, would you mind telling me what the deuce you're really heading toward? Cut the cackle, well, since you insist to cut the cackle, as you call it not very politely, seems to me, seeing I've taken the trouble to come clear up from Worcester exclamation mark I have reliable information that you're going to get into mighty serious trouble if you don't stop opposing or at least markedly failing to support the government, all right. What of it? It's my serious trouble, that's just the point. It isn't. I do think that just for once in your life you might think of mother and the girls, instead of always of your own selfish ideas that you're so proud of. In a crisis like this, it just isn't funny any longer to pose as a quaint liberal, Dor Emus's voice was like a firecracker. Cut the cackle, I told you. What you after? What's the corporal gang to you? I have been approached in regard to the very high honor of an assistant military judgeship, but your attitude, as my father, Philip, I think, I rather think that I give you my parental curse not so much because you are a traitor as because you have become a stuffed shirt. Good night, Chapter 25. Holidays were invented by the devil, to coax people into the heresy that happiness can be won by taking thought. What was planned as a rackety day for David's first Christmas with his grandparents was, they saw too well, perhaps David's last Christmas with them. Mary had hidden her weeping, but the day before Christmas, when Chad Liju tramped into demand of Doremus whether Carl Pascal had ever spoken to him of communism, Mary came on Shad in the hall, stared at him, raised her hand like a boxing cat, and said with dreadful quietness, You murderer! I shall kill you and kill Swan. For once Shad did not look amused. To make the holiday as good an imitation of mirth as possible, they were very noisy, but their holly, their tinsel stars on a tall pine tree, their family devotion in a serene old house in a little town was no different at heart from despairing drunkenness in the city night. Doremus reflected that it might have been just as well for all of them to get drunk and let themselves go, elbows on slopped cafe tables, as to toil at this pretense of domestic bliss. He now had another thing for which to hate the corpos for stealing the secure affection of Christmas. For noon dinner, Louis Rotenstern was invited, because he was a lawn bachelor and, still more, because he was a Jew, now insecure and snubbed and threatened in an insane dictatorship. There is no greater compliment to the Jews than the fact that the degree of their unpopularity is always the scientific measure of the cruelty and silliness of the regime under which they live, so that even a commercial-minded money-fondling heavily humorous Jew burger like Rotenstein is still a sensitive meter of barbarism. After dinner came Buck Titus, David's most favorite person, bearing staggering amounts of wool with tractors and fire engines and a real bow and arrow, and he was raucously insisting that Mrs. Candy dance with him what he not very precisely called the light fantastic when the hammering sounded at the door, Arisdilly tramped in with four men, looking for Rotenstein. Oh, that you, Louis? Get your coat and come on orders, what's the idea? What do you want of him? What's the charge? Demanded Buck, still standing with his arm about Mrs. Candy's embarrassed waist. Dunno's there be any charges. Just ordered to headquarters for questioning. District Commission Reek in town. Just asked a few people a few questions. Come on, you. The hilarious celebrants did not, as they had planned, go out to Lorinda's tavern for skiing. Next day they heard that Rotenstein had been taken to the concentration camp at Trianon, along with that crabbed old Tory, Raymond Pridewell, the hardware dealer. Both imprisonments were incredible. Rotenstein had been too meek. And if Pridewell had not ever been meek, if he had constantly and testily and loudly proclaimed that he had not cared for Liju as a hired man and now cared even less for him as a local governor, yet why? Pridewell was a sacred institution. As well think of dragging the Brownstone Baptist Church to prison. Later, a friend of Shad Liju took over Rotenstein's shop. It can happen here, meditated Doremus. It could happen to him. How soon? Before he should be arrested. He must make amends to his conscience by quitting the informer. Professor Victor Loveland, once a classicist of Isaiah College, having been fired from a labor camp for incompetence in teaching arithmetic to lumberjacks, was in town with wife and babies, on his way to a job clerking in his uncle's slate quarry near Fairhaven. He called on Doremus and was hysterically cheerful. He called on Clarence Little dropped in to visit with him, Clarence would have said. Now that twitchy, intense jeweler, Clarence, who had been born on a Vermont farm and had supported his mother till she died when he was thirty, had longed to go to college and, especially, to study Greek. Though Loveland was his own age, in the mid-thirties, he looked on him as a combination of Keats and Liddell. 
His greatest moment had been hearing Loveland read Homer. Loveland was leaning on the counter. Gone ahead with your Latin grammar, Clarence, golly, professor, it just doesn't seem worthwhile anymore. I guess I'm kind of a weak sister, anyway, but I find that these days it's about all I can do to keep going, me too. And don't call me professor. I'm a timekeeper in a slate quarry. What a life, they had not noticed the clumsy looking man in plain clothes who had just come in. Presumably he was a customer. But he grumbled, so you two pansies don't like the way things go nowadays. Don't suppose you like the corpos. Don't think much of the chief. He jabbed his thumb into Loveland's ribs so painfully that Loveland yelped, I don't think about him at all, oh, you don't, eh? Well, you two fairies can come along to the courthouse with me, and who may you be, oh, just an ensign in the M. M's, that's all, he had an automatic pistol. Loveland was not beaten much, because he managed to keep his mouth shut. But Little was so hysterical that they laid him on a kitchen table and decorated his naked back with forty slashes of a steel ramrod. They had found that Clarence wore yellow silk underwear, and the M. M's from factory and Plowland laughed particularly one broad young inspector who was rumored to have a passionate friendship with a battalion leader from Nashua who was fat, eyeglassed, and high-pitched of voice. Little had to be helped into the truck that took Loveland and him to the Trianon concentration camp. One eye was closed and so surrounded with bruised flesh that the M.M. driver said it looked like a Spanish omelette. The truck had an open body, but they could not escape, because the three prisoners on this trip were chained hand to hand. They lay on the floor of the truck. It was snowing. The third prisoner was not much like Loveland or Little. His name was Ben Drippen. He had been a mill hand for Medry Cole. He cared no more about the Greek language than did a baboon, but he did care for his six children. He had been arrested for trying to strike Cole and for cursing the Corpo regime when Cole had reduced his wages from $9 a week, in pre-Corpo currency, to $7.50. As to Loveland's wife and babies, Lorinda took them until she could pass the hat and collect enough to send them back to Mrs. Loveland's family on a rocky farm in Missouri. But then things went better. Mrs. Loveland was favored by the Greek proprietor of a lunchroom and got work washing dishes and otherwise pleasing the proprietor, who brilliantened his moustache. The county administration, in a proclamation signed by Emil Storbmeyer, announced that they were going to regulate the agriculture on the submarginal land high up on Mount Terror. As a starter, half a dozen of the poorer families were moved into the large, square, quiet, old house of that large, square, quiet, old farmer, Henry Vida, cousin of Doremus Jessup. These poorer families had many children, a great many so that there were four or five persons bedded on the floor in every room of the home where Henry and his wife had placidly lived alone since their own children had grown. Henry did not like it, and said so, not very tactfully, to the M. M's herding the refugees. What was worse? The dispossessed did not like it any better. Tiant much, but we got a house of our own. Dunno why we should get shoved in on Henry, said one. Don't expect other folks to bother me, and don't expect to bother other folks. Never did like that fool kind of yellow color Henry painted his barn, but guess that's his business. So Henry and two of the regulated agriculturists were taken to the Trianon concentration camp, and the rest remained in Henry's house, doing nothing but finish up Henry's large larder and wait for orders. And before I'm sent to join Henry and Carlin Loveland, I'm going to clear my skirts, Doremus vowed, along in late January, he marched in to see County Commissioner Leju. I want to quit the informer. Storbmeyer has learned all I can teach him. Storbmeyer? Oh. You mean Assistant Commissioner Storbmeyer, chuck it, will you? We're not on parade, and we're not playing soldiers. Mind if I sit down? Don't look like you cared a hell of a lot whether I mind or not. But I can tell you, right here and now, Jessup, without any monkey business about it, you're not going to leave your job. I guess I could find enough grounds for sending you to Trianon for about a million years, with ninety lashes, but you've always been so stuck on yourself as such an all-fired honest editor. It kind of tickles me to watch you kissing the chief's foot and mine, I'll do no more of it. That's certain. And I admit that I deserve your scorn for ever having done it, well, isn't that elegant? But you'll do just what I tell you to, and like it. Jessup, I suppose you think I had a swell time when I was your hired man. Watching you and your old woman and the girls go off on a picnic while I owe, I was just your hired man, with dirt in my ears, your dirt. I could stay home and clean up the basement. Maybe we didn't want you along, Shad. Good morning, Shad laughed. There was a sound of the gates of Trianon concentration camp in that laughter. It was really Sissy who gave Doremus his lead. He drove to Hanover to see Shad's superior, 
District Commissioner John Sullivan Reek, that erstwhile jovial and red-faced politician. He was admitted after only half an hour's waiting. He was shocked to see how pale and hesitant and frightened Reek had become. But the commissioner tried to be authoritative. Well, Jessup, what can I do for you? May I be frank? What? What? Why, certainly. Frankness has always been my middle name, I hope so. Governor, I find I'm of no use on the informer, at Fort Beulah. As you probably know, I've been breaking in Emil Storbmeyer as my successor. Well, he's quite competent to take hold now, and I want to quit. I'm really just in his way, why don't you stick around and see what you can still do to help him? There'll be little jobs cropping up from time to time, because it's got on my nerves to take orders where I used to give them for so many years. You can appreciate that, can't you? My God, can I appreciate it? And how? Well, I'll think it over. You wouldn't mind writing little pieces for my own little sheet, at home? I own part of a paper though, no. Sure. Delighted. Does this mean that Reek believes the corpo tyranny is going to blow up, in a revolution, so that he's beginning to trim? Or just that he's fighting to keep from being thrown out? Yes, I can see how you might feel, Brother Jessup, thanks. Would you mind giving me a note to County Commissioner Lee Ju, telling him to let me out, without prejudice question mark making it pretty strong? No. Not a bit. Just wait a minute, ole fellow, I'll write it right now. Doremus made as little ceremony as possible of leaving the informer which had been his throne for thirty-seven years. Storbmeyer was patronizing, Doc Hitchett looked quizzical, but the chapel, headed by Dan Wilgus, shook hands profusely. And so, at sixty-two, stronger and more eager than he had been in all his life, Doremus had nothing to do more important than eating breakfast and telling his grandson stories about the elephant. But that lasted less than a week. Avoiding suspicion from Emma and Sissy and even from Buck and Lorinda, he took Julian aside. Look here, boy. I think it's time now for me to begin doing a little high treason. Heaven's sake keep all of this under your hat don't even tip off sissy, I guess you know. The communists are too theocratic for my tastes. But looks to me as though they have more courage and devotion and smart strategy than anybody since the early Christian martyrs whom they also resemble in hairiness and a fondness for catacombs. I want to get in touch with them and see if there's any dirty work at the crossroads I can do for em say distributing a few early Christian tracts by street linen but of course, theoretically, the communists have all been imprisoned. Could you get to Carl Pascal, in Trianon, and find out whom I could see? said Julian, I think I could. Dr. Olmsted gets called in there sometimes on cases they hate him, because he hates them, but still, their camp doctor is a drunken bum, and they have to have a real doc in when one of their warders busts his wrist beating up some prisoner. I'll try, sir. Two days afterward Julian returned. My God, what a sue that Trianon place is. I'd waited for Elmstead before, in the car, but I never had the nerve to butt inside. The buildings they were nice buildings, quite pretty, when a girl's school had them. Now the fittings are all torn out, and they've put up wallboard partitions for cells, and the whole place stinks of carbolic acid and excrement, and the air there isn't any you feel as if you were nailed up in a box I don't know how anybody lives in one of those cells for an hour and yet there's six men bunked in a cell twelve feet by ten, with a ceiling only seven feet high and no light except a 25 watt, I guess it is, bulb in the ceiling you couldn't read by it. But they get out for exercise two hours a day walk around and around the courtyard they are all so stooped, and they all look so ashamed, as if they'd had the defiance just licked out of M even Carl a little, and you remember how proud and sort of sardonic he was. Well, I got to see him, and he says to get in touch with this man here, I wrote it down and for God's sake, burn it up soon as you've memorized it, was he had they? Oh, yes they've beaten him, all right. He wouldn't talk about it. But there was a scar right across his cheek, from his temple right down to his chin. And I had just a glimpse of Henry Vida. Remember how he looked like an oak tree? Now he twitches all the time, and jumps and gasps when he hears a sudden sound. He didn't know me. I don't think he'd know anybody. Doremus announced to his family and told it loudly and Gath that he was still looking for an option on an apple orchard to which they might retire, and he journeyed southward with pajamas and a toothbrush and the first volume of Spengler's Decline of the West in a briefcase, the address given by Carl Pascal was that of a most gentlemanly dealer in altar cloths and priestly robes, who had his shop and office over a tea room in Hartford, Connecticut. He talked about the Sembolo and the Spinetto di Serenata and the music of Palestrina for an hour before he sent Doremus on to a busy engineer constructing a dam in New Hampshire, 
who sent him to a tailor in a side street shop in Lynn, who at last sent him to northern Connecticut and to the eastern headquarters of what was left of the communists in America, still carrying his little briefcase he walked up a greasy hill, impassable to any motorcar, and knocked at the faded green door of a squat New England farm cottage masked in wintry old lilac bushes and spear shrubs. A stringy farm wife opened and looked hostile, I'd like to speak to Mr. Rayleigh, Mr. Bailey, or Mr. Cayley, none of them home. You'll have to come again, then I'll wait. What else should one do, these days, all right? Come in, thanks. Give them this letter. The tailor had warned him, it will all sound very foolish, the passports and everything, but if any of the Central Committee gets caught he made a squirting sound and drew his scissors across his throat. Doremus sat now in a tiny hall off a flight of stairs steep as the side of a roof, a hall with sprigged wallpaper and courier and Ives prints, and black painted wooden rocking chairs with calico cushions. There was nothing to read but a Methodist hymnal and a desk dictionary. He knew the former by heart, and anyway, he always loved reading dictionaries often had one seduced him from editorial writing. Happily he sat conning. Fnil. N. Chem. The univalent radical C6H5 regarded as the basis of numerous benzene derivatives, as, phenylhydroxid C6H5O, fricotian, N. A choriambic trimeter catalectic, or catalectic glyconic, composed of a spondee, a choriambus, and a catalectic syllable, well, I never knew any of that before. I wonder if I do now? Thought Doemus contentedly, before he realized that glowering from a very narrow doorway was a very broad man with wild grey hair and a patch over one eye. Doremus recognized him from pictures. He was Bilitabury, minor, longshoreman, veteran IWW leader, old A. F. of Al. Strike leader, five years in San Quentin and five honored years in Moscow, and reputed now to be the secretary of the illegal Communist Party, I'm Mr. Rayleigh. What can I do for you? Bill demanded. He led Doremus into a musty back room where, at a table which was probably mahogany underneath the scars and the clots of dirt sat a squat man with kinky toe-colored hair and with deep wrinkles in the thick pale skin of his face, and a slender young elegant who suggested Park Avenue. How are you? said Mr. Bailey, in a Russian-Jewish accent. Of him Doremus knew nothing save that he was not named Bailey. Morning, snapped Mr. Cayley whose name was Elfrey, if Doremus guessed rightly, and who was the son of a millionaire private banker, the brother of one explorer, one bishop's wife, and one countess and himself a former teacher of economics in the University of California, Doremus tried to explain himself to these hard-eyed, quick-glancing plotters of ruin, are you willing to become a party member, in the extremely improbable case that they accept you, and to take orders, any orders, without question? asked Elfrey, so suavely, do you mean, am I willing to kill and steal, you've been reading detective stories about the Reds? No. What you'd have to do would be much more difficult than the amusement of using a Tommy gun. Would you be willing to forget you ever were a respectable newspaper editor, giving orders, and walk through the snow, dressed like a bum, to distribute seditious pamphlets even if, personally, you should believe the pamphlets were of no slightest damn good to the cause? Why, I, I don't know. Seems to me that as a newspaper men have quite a little training, hell. Our only trouble is keeping out the trained newspapermen. What we need is trained bill posters that like the smell of flour paste and hate sleeping and but you're a little old for this crazy fanatics that go out and start strikes, knowing they'll get beaten up and thrown in the bullpen, no, I guess I look here. I'm sure Walt Trowbridge will be joining up with the socialists and some of the left-wing radical ex-senators and the farm ebrides and so on, Billy Tiberi Gafford. It was a tremendous, somehow terrifying blast. Yes, I'm sure they'll join up all the dirty, sneaking, half-headed, reformist social fascists like Trowbridge that are doing the work of the capitalists and working for war against Soviet Russia without even having sense enough to know they're doing it and to collect good pay for their crookedness, I admire Trowbridge. Snarled Doremus, you would, Elfrey rose, almost cordial, and dismissed Doremus with, Mr. Jessop, I was brought up in a sound bourgeois household myself, unlike these two roughnecks, and I appreciate what you're trying to do, even if they don't. I imagine that your rejection of us is even firmer than our rejection of you. Dots right, Comrade Elfrey. Both you and this fellow got ants in your dewy pants, like your huge Johnson would say. Chuckled the Russian Mr. Bailey, but I just wonder if Walt Trowbridge won't be chasing out Buzz Windrup while you boys are still arguing about whether Comrade Trotsky was once guilty of saying mass facing the North. Good day, said Doremus, when he recounted it to Julian, two days later, and Julian puzzled, I wonder whether you won or they did. 
Dr. Emus asserted, I don't think anybody won except the ants. Anyway, now I know that man is not to be saved by black bread alone but by everything that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord our God. Communists, intense and narrow, Yankees, tolerant and shallow, no wonder a dictator can keep us separate and all working for him. Even in the 1930s, when it was radiantly believed that movies and the motor car and glossy magazines had ended the provinciality of all the larger American villages, in such communities as Fort Beulah all the retired businessmen who could not afford to go to Europe or Florida or California, such as Doremus, were as aimless as an old dog on Sunday afternoon with the family away. They poked uptown to the shops, the hotel lobbies, the railway station, and at the barber shop were pleased rather than irritated when they had to wait a quarter hour for the tri-weekly shave. There were no cafes as there would have been in continental Europe, and no club save the country club, and that was chiefly a sanctuary for the younger people in the evening and late afternoons. The superior Doremus Jessup, the bookman, was almost as dreary in retirement as Banker Crowley would have been. He did pretend to play golf, but he could not see any particular point in stopping a good walk to wallop small balls and, worse, the links were now bright with MM uniforms. And he hadn't enough brass, as no doubt made a recall would have, to feel welcome hour on hour in the Hotel Wessex lobby. He stayed in his third story study and read as long as his eyes would endure it. But he irritably felt Emma's irritation and Mrs. Candy's ire at having a man around the house all day. Yes. He'd get what he could for the house and for what small share in informer stock the government had left him when they had taken it over, and go well, just go the Rockies or anywhere that was new but he realized that Emma did not at all wish to go new places, and realized that the Emma to whose billowy warmth it had been comforting to come home after the office, bored him and was bored by him when he was always there. The only difference was that she did not seem capable of admitting that one might, without actual fiendishness or any signs of hot-footing it for Reno, be bored by one's faithful spouse, why don't you drive out and see Buck or Linda? She suggested, don't you ever get a little jealous of my girl, Linda? He said, very likely because he very heavily wanted to know. She laughed. You? At your age? As if anybody thought you could be a lover. Well, Lorinda thought so, he raged, and promptly he did drive out and see her, a little easier in mind about his divided loyalties. Only once did he go back to the informer office. Storbmeyer was not in sight, and it was evident that the real editor was at Sly Bumpkin, Doc Hitchett, who didn't even rise at Doremus's entrance nor listen when Doremus gave his opinion of the new makeup of the rural correspondence pages. That was an apostasy harder to endure than Shad Leeds, for Shad had always been rustically certain that Doremus was a fool, almost as bad as real city folks, while Doc Hitchett had once appreciated the tight joints and smooth surfaces and sturdy bases of Doremus's craftsmanship. Day on day he waited. So much of the revolution for so many people is nothing but waiting. That is one reason why tourists rarely see anything but contentment in a crushed population. Waiting, and its brother death, seems so contented. For several days now, in late February, Doremus had noticed the insurance man. He said he was a Mr. Dimmick, a Mr. Dimmick of Albany. He was a grey and tasteless man, in grey and dusty and wrinkled clothes, and his pop eyes stared with meaningless fervor. All over town you met him, at the four drugstores, at the shoe shine parlor, and he was always droning. My name is Dimmick Mr. Dimmick of Albany Albany, New York. I wonder if I can interest you in a wonderful new form of life insurance policy. Wonderful. But he didn't sound as though he himself thought it was very wonderful. He was a best. He was always dragging himself into some unwelcoming shop, and yet he seemed to sell few policies, if any. Not for two days did Doremus perceive that Mr. Dimmick of Albany managed to meet him an astonishing number of times a day. As he came out of the Wessex, he saw Mr. Dimmick leaning against a lamppost, ostentatiously not looking his way, yet three minutes later and two blocks away, Mr. Dimmick trailed after him into the Vert Montana pool and tobacco headquarters, and listened to Doremus's conversation with Tom Aiken about fish hatcheries. Doremus was suddenly cold. He made it a point to sneak up town that evening and saw Mr. Dimmick talking to the driver of a Beulah Montpelier bus with an intensity that wasn't in the least grey. Doremus glared. Mr. Dimmick looked at him with watery eyes, croaked, Divinin, Mr. Dreamus, like tea talk to you about insurance sometime when you got the time, and shuffled away, later, Doremus took out and cleaned his revolver, said, oh, rats, and put it away. He heard a ring as he did so, and went downstairs to find Mr. Dimmick sitting on the oak hat track in the hall, rubbing his hat, I'd like to talk to you, if you ain't too busy, whined Mr. Dimmick, all right, go in there, sit down, anybody hear us, no, 
What of it? Mr. Dimmick's grayness and lassitude fell away. His voice was sharp. I think your local corpos are on to me. Got to hustle. I'm from Walt Drobridge. You probably guessed I've been watching you all week, asking about you. You've got to be Trowbridge's and our representative here. Secret war against the corpos. The NU, the new underground, we call it like secret underground that got the slaves into Canada before the Civil War. Four divisions, printing propaganda, distributing it, collecting and exchanging information about corpo outrages, smuggling suspects into Canada or Mexico. Of course you don't know one thing about me. I may be a corpo spy. But look over these credentials and telephone your friend Mr. Samson of the Burlington Paper Company. God's sake be careful. Wire may be dapped. Ask him about me on the grounds you're interested in insurance. He's one of us. You're going to be one of us. Now phone, do Emus telephone to Samson, say, Ed, is a fellow named Dimmick, kind of weedy looking, pop-eyed fellow, all right? Shall I take his advice on insurance? Yes. Works for Wellbridge. Sure. You can ride along with him. I'm riding, chapter 26, the informer composing room closed down at 11 in the evening, for the paper had to be distributed to villages 40 miles away and did not issue a later city edition. Dan Wilgus, the foreman, remained after the others had gone, setting a Minuteman poster which announced that there would be a grand parade on March 9, and incidentally that President Windrup was defying the world, Dan stopped, looked sharply about, and tramped into the storeroom. In the light from a dusty electric bulb, the place was like a tomb of dead news, with ancient red and black posters of Scotland County fairs and proofs of indecent limericks pasted on the walls. From a case of eight point, once used for the setting of pamphlets but superseded by a monotype machine, Dan picked out bits of type from each of several compartments, wrapped them in scraps of print paper, and stored them in the pocket of his jacket. The raped type boxes looked only half filled, and to make up for it he did something that should have shocked any decent printer even if he were on strike. He filled them up with type not from another eight-point case, but with old ten-point. Daniel, the large and hairy, thriftily pinching the tiny types, was absurd as an elephant playing at being a hen. He turned out the lights on the third floor and clumped downstairs. He glanced in at the editorial rooms. No one was the save Doc Itchett, in a small circle of light that through the visor of his eye shade cast a green tint on his unwholesome face. He was correcting an article by the titular editor, Ensign Emil Storbmeyer, and he snickered as he carved it with a large black pencil. He raised his head, startled, Hello, Doc, hello, Dan. Staying late, you. Just finished some job work. Gnight, say, Dan, do you ever see old Jessup, these days? Don't know when I've seen him, Doc. Oh yes, I ran into him at the Reeks All Store, couple days ago, still as sour as ever about the regime, oh he didn't say anything. Darned old fool. Even if he don't like all the brave boys in uniform, he ought to see the chief is here for keeps, by golly, certainly ought to. And it's a swell regime. Fellow can get ahead in newspaper work now, and not be held back by a bunch of snobs that think they're so doggone educated just because they went to college, that's right. Well, hell with Jessup and all the old stiffs. Ignite, Doc. Dan and Brother Richard unsmilingly gave the MM salute, arms held out. Dan thumped down to the street and homeward. He stopped in front of Billy's bar, in the middle of a block, and put his foot up on the hub of a dirty old Ford, to tie his shoelace. As he tied it after having untied it he looked up and down the street, emptied the bundles in his pockets into a battered sap bucket on the front seat of the car, and majestically moved on. Out of the bar came Pete Vuitton, a French-Canadian farmer who lived up on Mount Terror. Pete was obviously drunk. He was singing the prehistoric ditty highly, high low in what he conceived to be German, viz. By uns gazimmer, you longer you slimmer. He was staggering so that he had to pull himself into the car, and he steered in fancy patterns till he had turned the corner. Then he was amazingly and suddenly sober, and amazing was the speed with which the Ford clattered out of town. Pete Vutron wasn't a very good secret agent. He was a little obvious. But then, Pete had been a spy for only one week. In that week Dan Wilgus had four times dropped heavy packages into a sap bucket in the Ford. Pete passed the gate to Buck Titus's domain, slowed down, dropped the sap bucket into a ditch, and sped home. Just at dawn, Buck Titus, out for a walk with his three Irish wolfhounds, kicked up the sap bucket and transferred the bundles to his own pocket, and next afternoon Dan Wilgus, in the basement of Buck's house, was setting up, in eight point, a pamphlet entitled How Many People Have the Corpus Murdered? It was signed Spartan, 
and Spartan was one of several pen names of Mr. Doremus Jessup. They were all all the ringleaders of the local chapter of the New Underground rather glad when once, on his way to Bucks, Dan was searched by M. M's unfamiliar to him, and on him was found no printing material, nor any documents more incriminating than cigarette papers. The corpos had made a regulation licensing all dealers in printing machinery and paper and compelling them to keep lists of purchases, so that except by bootlegging it was impossible to get supplies for the issuance of treasonable literature. Dan Wilgers stole the type, Dan and Doremus and Julian and Buck together had stolen an entire old hand printing press from the informer basement, and the paper was smuggled from Canada by that veteran bootlegger, John Polycop, who rejoiced at being back in the good old occupation of which repeal had robbed him. It is doubtful whether Dan Wilgers would ever have joined anything so divorced as this from the time clock and the office cuspidors out of abstract indignation at Twindrapore County Commissioner Lee Jew. He was moved to sedition partly by fondness for Doremus and partly by indignation at Doc Hitchett, who publicly rejoiced because all the printers' unions had been sunk in the governmental confederations. Or perhaps because Doc jeered at him personally on the few occasions not more than once or twice a week when there was tobacco juice on his shirt front. Dan grunted to Doremus, all right, boss, I guess maybe I'll come in with you. And say, when we get this man's revolution going, let me drive the tumbril with Doc in it. Say, remember Tale of Two Cities? Good book. Say, how about getting out a humorous life of Windrip? You just have to tell the facts, Buck Titus, pleased as a boy invited to go camping, offered his secluded house and, in a special, its huge basement for the headquarters of the new underground, and Buck, Dan, and Doremus made their most poisonous blots with the assistance of hot rum punches at Buck's fireplace, the Fort Beulah cell of the NU, as it was composed in mid-March, a couple of weeks after Doremus had founded it, consisted of himself, his daughters, Buck, Dan, Lorinda, Julian Falk, Dr. Olmsted, John Polycop, Father Perefix, and he argued with the agnostic Dan, the atheist Polycop, more than ever he had with Buck, Mrs. Henry Vida, whose farmer husband was in Trianon concentration camp, Harry Kinderman, the dispossessed Jew, Mungo Kitterick, that most unJewish and unsocialistic lawyer, Pete Vuitton and Daniel Babcock, farmers, and some dozen others. The Reverend Mr. Falk, Emma Jessup, and Mrs. Candy, were more or less unconscious tools of the NU but whoever they were, of whatever faith or station, Doremus found in all of them the religious passion he had missed in the churches, and if altars, if windows of many colored glass, had never been peculiarly holy objects to him, he understood them now as he gloated over such sacred trash as scarred type and a creaking hand press. Once it was Mr. Dimmock of Albany again, once, another insurance agent who guffawed at the accidental luck of insuring Shadley Jew's new Lincoln, once it was an Armenian peddling rugs, once, Mr. Samson of Burlington, looking for pine slashing for paper pulp. But whoever it was, Doremus heard from the new underground every week. He was busy as he had never been in newspaper days, and happy as on youth's adventure in Boston. Humming and most cheerful, he ran the small press, with the hearty bump 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 of the foot treadle, admiring his own skill as he fed in the sheets. Lorinda learned from Dan Wilgers to set type, with more fervor than accuracy about I and e. Emma and Sissy and Mary folded news sheets and sewed up pamphlets by hand, all of them working in the high old brick-walled basement that smelled of sawdust and lime and decaying apples, aside from pamphlets by Spartan and by Anthony B. Susan who was Lorinda, except on Fridays their chief illicit publication was Vermont Vigilance, a four-page weekly which usually had only two pages and, such was Doremus's unfettered liveliness, came out about three times a week. It was filled with reports smuggled to them from other NU cells, and with reprints from Walt Trowbridge's Lance for Democracy and from Canadian, British, Swedish, and French papers, whose correspondence in America got out, by long-distance telephone, News which Secretary of Education McGoblin, head of the government press department, spent a good part of his time denying. An English correspondent sent news of the murder of the president of the University of Southern Illinois, a man of 72 who was shot in the back while trying to escape, out of the country by long-distance telephone to Mexico City, from which the story was relayed to London. Doremus discovered that neither he nor any other small citizen had been hearing one hundredth of what was going on in America. Windrup and company had like Hitler and Mussolini, discovered that a modern state can, by the triple process of controlling every item in the press, breaking up at the start any association which might become dangerous, and keeping all the machine guns, artillery, armored automobiles, and aeroplanes in the hands of the government, dominate the complex contemporary population better than had ever been done in medieval days, 
when rebellious peasantry were armed only with pitchforks and goodwill, but the state was not armed much better, dreadful, incredible information came into Doremus, until he saw that his own life, and Sissy's and Lorinda's and Buck's, were unimportant accidents, in North Dakota, two would-be leaders of the farmers were made to run in front of an MM automobile, through February drifts, till they dropped breathless, were beaten with a tire pump till they staggered on, fell again, then were shot in the head, their blood smearing the prairie snow, President Windrip, who was apparently becoming considerably more jumpy than in his old, brazen days, saw two of his personal bodyguards snickering together in the anteroom of his office and, shrieking, snatching an automatic pistol from his desk, started shooting at them. He was a bad marksman. The suspects had to be finished off by the pistols of their fellow guards, a crowd of young men, not wearing any sort of uniforms, tore the clothes from a nun on the station plaza in Kansas City and chased her, smacking her with bare hands. The police stopped them after a while. There were no arrests. In Utah a non-Mormon county commissioner staked out a Mormon elder on a bare rock where, since the altitude was high, the elder at once shivered and felt the glare rather bothersome to his eyes since the commissioner had thoughtfully cut off his eyelids first. The government press releases made much of the fact that the torturer was rebuked by the district commissioner and removed from his post. It did not mention that he was reappointed in a county in Florida, the heads of the reorganized steel cartel, a good many of whom had been officers of steel companies in the days before Windrip, entertained Secretary of Education McGoblin and Secretary of War Luthorne with an aquatic festival in Pittsburgh. The dining room of a large hotel was turned into a tank of rose-scented water, and the celebrants floated in a gilded Roman barge. The waitresses were naked girls, who amusingly swam to the barge holding up trays and, more often, wine buckets. Secretary of State Lee Saracen was arrested in the basement of a handsome boys' club in Washington on unspecified charges by a policeman who apologized as soon as he recognized Saracen, and released him, and who that night was shot in his bed by a mysterious burglar, Albert Einstein, who had been exiled from Germany for his guilty devotion to mathematics, world peace, and the violin, was now exiled from America for the same crimes, Mrs. Leonard Nimitt, wife of Congregational Pastor in Lincoln, Nebraska, whose husband had been sent to concentration camp for a pacifist sermon, was shot through the door and killed when she refused to open to an MM raiding section looking for seditious literature. In Rhode Island, the door of a small Orthodox synagogue in a basement was locked from the outside after thin glass containers of carbon monoxide had been thrown in. The windows had been nailed shut, and anyway, the nineteen men in the congregation did not smell the gas until too late. They were all found slumped to the floor, beards sticking up. They were all over sixty. Tom Crelbert his was a really nasty case, because he was actually caught with a copy of Lance for Democracy and credentials proving that he was a new underground messenger strange thing, too, because everybody had respected him as a good, decent, unimaginative baggageman at a village railroad depot in New Hampshire was dropped down a well with five feet of water in it, a smooth-sided cement well, and just left the ex-Supreme Court Justice Hoblin of Montana was yanked out of bed late at night and examined for sixty hours straight on a charge that he was in correspondence with Trowbridge. It was said that the chief examiner was a man whom, years before, Judge Hoblin had sentenced for robbery with assault. In one day Doremus received reports that four several literary automatic societies Finnish, Chinese, Iowan, and one belonging to a mixed group of miners on the Mississippi Range, Minnesota had been broken up, their officers beaten, their clubrooms smashed up and their old pianos wrecked, on a charge that they possessed illegal arms, which, in each case, the members declared to be antiquated pistols used in theatricals. And in that week three people were arrested in Alabama, Oklahoma, and New Jersey for the possession of the following subversive books, The Murder of Roger Ackroyd, by Agatha Christie, and fair enough, too, because the sister-in-law of a county commissioner in Oklahoma was named Ackroyd, Waiting for Lefty, by Clifford Odets, and February Hill by Victoria Lincoln. But plenty things like this happened before Buzz Windrup ever came in, Doremus, insisted John Polycop. Never till they had met in the delightfully illegal basement had he called Doremus anything save Mr. Jessup, you never thought about them, because they was just routine news, to stick in your paper. Things like the sharecroppers and the Scottsboro boys and the plots of the California wholesalers against the agricultural union and dictatorship in Cuba and the way phony deputies in Kentucky shot striking miners. And believe me, Doremus, the same reactionary crowd that put over those crimes are just the big boys that are chummy with Windrip. And what scares me is that if Walt Drobridge ever does raise a kind of uprising and kick Buzz out, the same vultures will get awful patriotic and democratic and parliamentarian along with Walt, and sit in on the spoils just the same, 
So Karl Pascal did convert you to communism before he got sent to Trianon, jeered Doemus. John Polycop jumped four straight feet up in the air, or so it looked, and came down screaming, communism. Never get him to make a united front. We, that fellow Pascal he was just a propagandist, and I tell you I tell you. Doemus's hardest job was the translation of items from the press in Germany, which was most favorable to the corpus. Sweating, even in the March coolness in Buck's high basement, Doemus leaned over a kitchen table, ruffling through a German-English lexicon, grunting, tapping his teeth with a pencil, scratching the top of his head, looking like a schoolboy with a little false grey beard, and wailing to Lorinda, now how in the heck would you translate her er halt nach emmerines with utaj stellung den juden jeji nuba? She answered, why, darling, the only German I know is the phrase that Buck taught me for God bless you verfluchte Schwenhund. He translated word for word, from the Volkes of Obita, and later turned into comprehensible English, this gratifying tribute to his chief and inspirer. America has a brilliant beginning begun. No one congratulates President Windrup with greater sincerity than we Germans. The tendency points as goal to the founding of a folkish state. Unfortunately is the president not yet prepared with a liberal tradition to break. He holds still ever a two-meaning attitude the Jews of his avis. We can but presume that logically this attitude change must as the movement forced is the complete consequences of its philosophy to draw. Ahusava the wandering Jew will always the enemy of a free self-conscious people be, and America will also learn that one even so much with Jewry compromise can as with the bubonic plague. From the new masses, still published surreptitiously by the communists, at the risk of their lives, Doemus got many items about miners and factory workers who were near starvation and who were imprisoned if they so much as criticized a straw boss. But most of the new masses, with a pious smugness unshaken by anything that had happened since 1935, was given over to the latest news about Marx, and to vilifying all agents of the new underground, including those who had been clubbed and jailed and killed, as reactionary stool pigeons for fascism, and it was all nicely decorated with a grop a cartoon showing Walt Trowbridge, in M.M. uniform, kissing the foot of Windrip. The news bulletins came to Doemus in a dozen insane ways carried by messengers on the thinnest of flimsy tissue paper, mailed to Mrs. Henry Vida and to Daniel Babcock between the pages of catalogues, by an N.O. operative who was a clerk in the mail order house of Middlebury and Row, shipped in cartons of toothpaste and cigarettes to Earl Tyson's drugst or one clerk there was an N.U. agent, dropped near Buck's mansion by a tough-looking and therefore innocent-looking driver of an interstate furniture moving truck. Come by so precariously. The news had none of the obviousness of his days in the office when, in one batch of AP flimsies, were tidings of so many millions dead of starvation in China, so many statesmen assassinated in Central Europe, so many new churches built by kind-hearted Mr. Andrew Mellon, that it was all routine. Now, he was like an 18th century missionary in northern Canada, waiting for the news that would take all spring to travel from Bristol and down Hudson Bay, wondering every instant whether France had declared war, whether Her Majesty had safely given birth. Doemus realized that he was hearing, all at once, of the Battle of Waterloo, the Diaspora, the invention of the Telegraph, the discovery of Basilii, and the Crusades, and if it took him ten days to get the news, it would take historians ten decades to appraise it. Would they not envy him, and consider that he had lived in the very crisis of history? Or would they just smile at the flag-waving children of the 1930s playing at being national heroes? for he believed that these historians would be neither communists nor fascists nor bellicose American or English nationalists but just the sort of smiling liberals that the warring fanatics of today most cursed as weak waverers. In all this secret tumult Doemus's most arduous task was to avoid suspicions that might land him in concentration camp, and to give appearance of being just the harmless old loafer he veritably had been, three weeks ago. Befogged with sleep because he had worked all night at headquarters, he yawned all afternoon in the lobby of the Hotel Wessex and discussed fishing the picture of a man too discouraged to be a menace. He dropped now and then, on evenings when there was nothing to do at Bucks and he could loaf in his study at home and shamefully let himself be quiet and civilized, into renewed longing for the ivory tower. Often, not because it was a great poem but because it was the first that, when he had been a boy, had definitely startled him by evoking beauty. He reread Tennyson's Arabian Nights. A realm of pleasance, many a mound and many a shadow-checkered lawn, full of the city's stilly sound, and deep myrrh thickets blowing round, and stately cedar, tamarisks, thick rosaries of scented thorn, tall orient shrubs, and obelisks, graven with emblems of the time, in honour of the golden prime, of good Haran al-Rasid, a while then he could wander with Romeo and Jurgen, 
with Ivanhoe and Lord Peter Wimsey, the Piazza San Marco he saw, and immemorial towers of Baghdad that never were, with Don John of Austria he was going forth to war, and he took the golden road to Samarkand without a visa. But Dan Wilgers setting type on proclamations of rebellion, and Buck Titus distributing them at night on a motorcycle, may be as romantic as Xanadu. Living in a blooming epic, right now, but no Homer come up from the city room yet to write it down. Whitbibby was an ancient and wordless fishmonger, and as ancient appeared his horse, though it was by no means silent, but given to a variety of embarrassing noises. For twenty years his familiar wagon, like the smallest of cabooses, had conveyed mackerel and cod and lake trout and tinned oysters to all the farmsteads in the Beulah Valley. To have suspected Whitbibby of seditious practices would have been as absurd as to have suspected the horse. Older men remembered that he had once been proud of his father, a captain in the Civil War and afterward a very drunken failure at farming but the young fry had forgotten that there ever had been a civil war. Unconcealed in the sunshine of the late March afternoon that touched the worn and ashen snow, Whit jogged up to the farmhouse of Truman Webb. He had left ten orders of fish, just fish, at farms along the way, but at Webb's he also left, not speaking of it, a bundle of pamphlets wrapped in very fishy newspaper. By next morning these pamphlets had all been left in the post boxes of farmers beyond Keesmit, a dozen miles away. Late the next night, Julian Falk drove Dr. Olmsted to the same Truman Webb's. Now Mr. Webb had an ailing aunt. Up to a fortnight ago she had not needed the doctor often, but as all the countryside could, and decidedly did, learn from listening in on the rural party telephone line, the doctor had to come every three or four days now. Well, Truman, how's the old lady? Dr. Olmsted called cheerily, from the front stoop Webb answered softly, safe. Shoot. I've kept a good lookout, Julian rapidly slid out, opened the rumble seat of the doctor's car, and there was the astonishing appearance from the rumble of a tall man in urban morning coat and striped trousers, a broad felt hat under his arm, rising, rubbing himself, groaning with the pain of stretching his cramped body. The doctor said, Truman, we've got a pretty important Eliza, with the bloodhounds right after him, tonight. Congressman Ingram Comrade Webb, ha! Huh. Never thought I'd live to be called one of these comrades. But mighty pleased to see you, Congressman. We'll put you across the border in Canada in two days we've got some paths right through the woods along the border and there's some good hot bins waiting for you right now. The attic in which Mr. Ingram slept that night, an attic approached by a ladder concealed behind a pile of drunks, was the underground station which, in the 1850s, when Truman's grandfather was agent, had sheltered 72 various black slaves escaping to Canada, and on the wall above Ingram's weary threatened head was still to be seen, written in charcoal long ago. Thou preparest a table for me in the presence of mine enemies. It was a little after six in the evening, near Tasbro and Scarlet's quarries. John Polycop, with his wrecker car, was towing Buck Titus, in his automobile. They stopped now and then, and John looked at the motor in Buck's car very ostentatiously, in the sight of MM patrols, who ignored so obvious a companionship. They stopped once at the edge of Tasbro's deepest pit. Buck strolled about, yawning, while John did some more tinkering. Right snapped Buck. Both of them leapt at the overlarge toolbox in the back of John's car, lifted out each an armful of copies of Vermont Vigilance and hurled them over the edge of the quarry. They scattered in the wind. Many of them were gathered up and destroyed by Tasbro's foreman, next morning, but at least a hundred, in the pockets of quarrymen, were started on their journey through the world of Fort Beulah workmen. Sissy came into the Jessup dining room wearily rubbing her forehead. I've got the story, Dad. Sister Candy helped me. Now we'll have something good to send on to other agents. Listen. I've been quite chummy with Shad. No. Don't blow up. I know just how to yank his gun out of his holster if I should ever need to. And he got to boasting, and he told me Frank Tasbro and Shad and Commission Reek were all in together on the racket, selling granite for public buildings, and he told me you see. He was sort of boasting about how chummy he and Mr. Tasbro have become how Mr. Tasbro keeps all the figures on the graft in a little red notebook in his desk of course old Frankie would never expect anybody to search the house of as loyal a corpo as him. Well, you know Mrs. Candy's cousin is working for the Tasbros for a while, and damn if, sissy. These two old gals didn't pinch the little red notebook this afternoon, and I photographed every page and had em stick it back. And the only comment our Candy makes is... That stove tea the Tasbros don't draw well. Couldn't bake a decent cake in a stove like that. Chapter 27. Mary Greenhill, revenging the murdered Fowler, was the only one of the conspirators who seemed moved more by homicidal hate than by a certain incredulous feeling that it was all a good but slightly absurd game. 
but to her, hate and the determination to kill were tonic. She soared up from the shadowed pit of grief, and her eyes lighted, her voice had a trembling gaiety. She threw away her weeds and came out in defiant colors oh, they had to economize, these days, to put every available penny into the missionary fund of the new underground, but Mary had become so far drawn that she could wear Sissy's giddiest told frocks, she had more daring than Julian, or even Buck indeed led Buck into his riskiest expeditions, in mid-afternoon, Buck and Mary, looking very matrimonial, domestically accompanied by David in the rather doubtful foolish, ambled through the centre of Burlington, where none of them were known though a number of dogs, city slickers and probably con dogs, insisted to the rustic and embarrassed foolish that they had met him somewhere, it was Buck who muttered right. From time to time, when they were free from being observed, but it was Mary who calmly, a yard or two from M. M's or policemen, distributed crumpled up copies of A Little Sunday School Life of John Sullivan Reek, Second Class Political Crook, and Certain Entertaining Pictures of Colonel Dewey Hake, Torturer. These crumpled pamphlets she took from a specially made inside pocket of her mink coat, one reaching from shoulder to waist. It had been recommended by John Polycop, whose helpful lady had aforetime used just such a pocket for illicit booze. The crumpling had been done carefully. Seen from two yards away, the pamphlets looked like any waste paper, but each was systematically so wadded up that the words, printed in bold red type, Haig himself kicked an old man to death, caught the eye. And, lying in corner trash baskets, in innocent toy wagons before hardware stores, among oranges in the fruit store where they had gone to buy David a bar of chocolate, they caught some hundreds of eyes in Burlington that day, on their way home, with David sitting in front beside Buck and Mary in the back, she cried, that will stir Rem up. But oh, when Daddy has finished his booklet on Swan God, David peeped back at her. She sat with eyes closed, with hands clenched, he whispered to Buck, I wish Mother wouldn't get so excited, she's the finest woman living. Dave, I know it, but she scares me so, one scheme Mary devised and carried out by herself. From the magazine counter in Tyson's drugstore, she stole a dozen copies of the Reader's Digest and a dozen larger magazines. When she returned them, they looked untouched, but each of the larger magazines contained a leaflet, get ready to join Walt Trowbridge, and each digest had become the cover for a pamphlet, Lies of the Corpo Press, to serve as center of their plot to be able to answer the telephone and receive fugitives and put off suspicious snoopers twenty-four hours a day, when Buck and the rest might be gone, Lorinda chucked her small remaining interest in the Beulah Valley Tavern and became Buck's housekeeper, living in the place. There was scandal. But in a day when it was increasingly hard to get enough bread and meat, the town folk had little time to suck scandal like lollipops, and anyway, who could much suspect this nagging uplifter who so obviously preferred tuberculin tests to toying with Corydon in the glade? and as Doremus was always about, as sometimes he stayed overnight, for the first time these timid lovers had space for passion. It had never been their loyalty to the good Emma since she was too contented to be pitied, too sure of her necessary position in life to be jealous so much as hatred of a shabby hole and corner intrigue which had made their love cautious and grudging. Neither of them was so simple as to suppose that, even with quite decent people, love is always as monogamic as bread and butter, yet neither of them liked sneaking, her room at Bucks, large and square and light, with old landscape paper showing an endlessness of little mandarins daintily stepping out of sedan chairs beside pools laced with willows, with a four-poster, a colonial highboy, and a crazy coloured rag carpet, became in two days, so fast did one live now in time of revolution, the best loved home Doremus had ever known. As eagerly as a young bridegroom he popped into and out of the room, and he was not overly particular about the state of her toilet. And Buck knew all about it and just laughed. Released now, Doremus saw her as physically more alluring. With parochial superiority, he had noted, during vacations on Cape Cod, how often the fluffy women of fashion when they stripped to bathing suits were skinny, to him unwomanly, with thin shoulder blades and with backbones as apparent as though they were chains fastened down their backs. They seemed passionate to him and a little devilish, with their thin restless legs and avid lips, but he chuckled as he considered that the Lorinda whose prim grey suits and blouses seemed so much more virginal than the gay flaunting summer cottons of the bright young things were softer of skin to the touch, much richer in the curve from shoulder to breast. He rejoiced to know that she was always there in the house, that he could interrupt the high seriousness of a tract on bond issues to dash out to the kitchen and brazenly let his arm slide round her waist. She, the theoretically independent feminist, became flatteringly demanding about every attention. Why hadn't he brought her some candy from town? Would he mind awfully calling up Julian for her? 
Why hadn't he remembered to bring her the book he had promised well, would have promised if she had only remembered to ask him for it. He trotted on her errands, idiotically happy. Long ago Emma had reached the limit of her imagination in regard to demands. He was discovering that in love it is really more blessed to give than to receive, a proverb about which, as an employer and as a steady fellow whom forgotten classmates regularly tried to touch for loans, he had been very suspicious. He lay beside her, in the wide fork poster, at dawn, March dawn with the elm branches outside the wind how ugly and writhing in the wind, but with the last coals still snapping in the fireplace, and he was utterly content. He glanced at Lorinda, who had on her sleeping face a frown that made her look not older but schoolgirlish, a schoolgirl who was frowning comically over some small woe, and who defiantly clutched her old-fashioned lace-bordered pillow. He laughed. They were going to be so adventurous together. This little printing of pamphlets was only the beginning of their revolutionary activities. They would penetrate into press circles in Washington and get secret information. He was drowsily vague about what information they were going to get and how they would ever get it, which would explode the corp state. And with the revolution over, they would go to Bermuda, to Martinique lovers on purple peaks, buy a purple see everything purple and grand. Or, and he sighed and became heroic as he exquisitely stretched and yawned in the wide warm bed, if they were defeated, if they were arrested and condemned by the M. M's, they would die together, sneering at the firing squad, refusing to have their eyes bandaged, and their fame like that of Servetus and Mattiotti and Professor Ferrer and the Haymarket Martyrs, would roll on forever, acclaimed by children waving little flags, give me a cigarette, darling, Lorinda was regarding him with obedient skeptical eye, you oughtn't to smoke so much, you oughtn't to boss so much, oh, my darling, she sat up, kissed his eyes and temples, and sturdily climbed out of bed, seeking her own cigarette, Doemus, it's been marvellous to have this companionship with you, but she looked a little timid, sitting cross-legged on the rattan topped stool before the old mahogany dressing table no silver or lace or crystal was there, but only plain wooden hairbrush and scanned luxury of small drugs or bottles. But darling, this cause oh, curse that word cause can't I ever get free of it question mark but anyway, this new underground business seems to me so important, and I know you feel that way too, but I've noticed that since we've settled down together, to a full sentimentalists, you aren't so excited about writing your nice venomous attacks, and I'm getting more cautious about going out distributing tracts. I have a foolish idea I have to save my life, for your sake. And I ought to be only thinking about saving my life for the revolution. Don't you feel that way? Don't you? Don't you? Doremus swung his legs out of bed, also lighted an unhygienic cigarette, and said grumpily, Oh, I suppose so. But tracts. Your attitude is simply a holdover of your religious training that you have a duty toward the dull human race which probably enjoys being bullied by Windrup and getting bread and circuses except for the bread, of course it's religious, a revolutionary loyalty. Why not? It's one of the few real religious feelings. A rational, unsentimental Stalin is still kind of a priest. No wonder most preachers hate the Reds and preach against M. They're jealous of their religious power. But oh, we can't unfold the world, this morning, even over breakfast coffee, Doemus. When Mr. Dimmock came back here yesterday, he ordered me to Beecher Falls you know, on the Canadian border to take charge of the NU cell the ostensibly to open up a tea room for this summer. So, hang it, I've got to leave you, and leave Buck and Sis, and go. Hang it, Linda, she would not look at him. She made much, too much, of grinding out her cigarette, Linda, yes, you suggested this to Dimmock. He never gave any orders till you suggested it, well, Linda. Linda. Do you want to get away from me so much? You my life. She came slowly to the bed, slowly sat down beside him. Yes. Get away from you and get away from myself. The world's in chains, and I can't be free to love till I help tear them off. It will never be out of chains, then I shall never be free to love. Oh, if we could only have run away together for one sweet year, when I was eighteen. Then I would have lived two whole lives. Well, Nobody seems to be very lucky at turning the clock back almost twenty-five years back, too. I'm afraid now is a fact you can't dodge. And I've been getting so just this last two weeks, with April coming in that I can't think of anything but you. Kiss me. I'm going. Today, Chapter 28, as usually happens in Secret Service, no one detail that Sissy ferreted out of Shadley Jew was drastically important to the NU, but, like necessary bits of a picture puzzle, when added to other details picked up by Doremus and Buck and Mary and Father Perefix, 
the trained extractor of confessions, they showed up the rather simple schemes of this gang of corpo racketeers who were so touchingly accepted by the people as patriotic shepherds. Sissy lounged with Julian on the porch, on a deceptively mild April day. Golly, like to take you off camping, couple months from now, sis. Just the two of us. Canoe and sleep in a pup tent. Oh, sis, do you have to have supper with Lee Ju and Storbmeyer tonight? I hate it. God, how I hate it. I warn you, I'll kill Shad. I mean it, yes, I do have to, dear. I think I've got Shad crazy enough about me so that tonight, when he chases good old Emil, and whatever foul female Emil may bring, out of the place, I'll get him to tell me something about who they're planning to pinch next. I'm not scared of Shad, my Julian of Dewey Lions, he did not smile. He said, with a gravity that had been unknown to the lively college youth, do you realize, with your kidding yourself about being able to handle Comrade Shad so well, that he's husky as a gorilla and just about as primitive? One of these nights God. Think of it. Maybe tonight exclamation mark he'll go right off the deep end and grab you and Bing. She was as grave. Julian, just what do you think could happen to me? The worst that could happen would be that I'd get raped, good lord, do you honestly suppose that since the new civilization began, say in 1914, anyone believes that kind of thing is more serious than busting an ankle? A fate worse than death. What nasty old side whisker deacon ever invented that phrase? And how he must have rolled it on his chapped old lips. I can think of plenty worse fates say, years of running an elevator. No wait. I'm not really flippant. I haven't any desire, beyond maybe a slight curiosity, to be raped at least, not by Shad, he's a little too strong on the bodily odor when he gets excited. Oh God, darling, what a nasty swine that man is. I hate him fifty times as much as you do. Uck but I'd be willing to have even that happen if I could save one decent person from his bloody blackjack. I'm not the playgirl of Pleasant Hill anymore, I'm a frightened woman from Mount Terror. It seemed, the whole thing, rather unreal to Sissy, a burlesqued version of the old melodramas in which the city villain tries to ruin Arnell, apropos of a bottle of champagne wine. Shad, even in a belted tweed jacket, a kaleidoscopic scotch sweater, from Minnesota, and white linen plus fours, hadn't the absent-minded seductiveness that becomes a city slicker. Anson Emil Storbmeyer had showed up at Chad's new private suite at the Star Hotel with a grass widow who betrayed her gold teeth and who had tried to repair the erosions in the fair field of her neck with overmuch topsoil of brick-tinted powder. She was pretty dreadful. She was harder to tolerate than the rumbling Chad a man for whom the chaplain might even have been a little sorry, after he was safely hanged. The synthetic widow was always nudging herself at Emil and when, rather wearily, obliged by poking her shoulder, she giggled, now you stop, Shad Sweet was clean, and had some air. Beyond that there was nothing much to say. The parlor was firmly furnished in oak chairs and settee with leather upholstery, and four pictures of Marquis's not doing anything interesting. The freshness of the linen spread on the brass pedestal in the other room fascinated Sissy uncomfortably. Shad served them rye highballs with ginger ale from a quart bottle that had first been opened at least a day ago sandwiches with chicken and ham that tasted of nitre, and ice cream with six colors but only two flavors both strawberry. Then he waited, not too patiently, looking as much like General Goring as possible, for Emil and his woman to get the devil out of here, and for Sissy to acknowledge his virile charms. He only grunted at Emil's pedagogical little jokes, and the man of culture abruptly got up and removed his lady, whinnying in farewell, now, Captain, don't you and your girlfriend do anything Papa wouldn't do? Come on now, baby come over here and give us a kiss, Shad roared, as he flopped into the corner of the leather settee. Now I don't know whether I will or not. It nauseated her a good deal, but she made herself as pertly provocative as she could. She minced to the settee, and sat just far enough from his hulking side for him to reach over and draw her toward him. She observed him cynically, recalling her experience with most of the boys. Though not with Julian. Well, not so much with Julian. They always, all of them went through the same procedure, heavily pretending that there was no system in their manual proposals, and to a girl of spirit, the chief diversion in the whole business was watching their smirking pride in their technique. The only variation, ever, was whether they started in at the top or the bottom. Yes. She thought so. Shad, not being so delicately fanciful as, say, Malcolm Tasbrough, started with an apparently careless hand on her knee, she shivered. His sinewy paw was to her like the slime and writhing of an eel. She moved away with a maidenly alarm which mocked the role of Matahari she had felt herself to be gracing, like me? He demanded, oh well sort of, oh, shucks. 
You think I'm still just a hired man? Even though I am a county commissioner now, and a battalion leader, and probably pretty soon I'll be a commander. He spoke the sacred names with awe. It was the twentieth time he had made the same plaint to her in the same words. And you still think I ain't good for anything except lugging in kindling, oh, Shad dear. Why, I always think of you as being just about my oldest playmate. The way I used to tag after you and ask you could I run the lawnmower. My. I always remember that. Do you, honest? He yearned at her like a lumpish farm dog, of course. And honest, it makes me tired, you're acting as if you were ashamed of having worked for us. Why, don't you know that, when he was a boy, daddy used to work as a farm hand, and split wood and tend lawn for the neighbors and all that, and he was awful glad to get the money. She reflected that this thumping an entirely impromptu lie was beautiful. That it happened not to be a lie, she did not know, that effect? Well. Honest? Well. So the old man used to hustle the rake too. Never knew that. You know, he ain't such a bad old coot just awful stubborn, you do like him, don't you, Shad? Nobody knows how sweet he is I mean, in these sort of complicated days, we've got to protect him against people that might not understand him, against outsiders, don't you think so, Shad? You will protect him, well, I'll do what I can, said the battalion leader with such fat complacency that Sissy almost slapped him. That is, as long as he behaves himself, baby, and don't get mixed up with any of these red rebels. And as long as you feel like being nice to a fella. He pulled her toward him as though he were hauling a bag of grain out of the wagon. Oh. Shad. You frighten me. Oh, you must be gentle. A big, strong man like you can afford to be gentle. It's only the sissies that have to get rough. And you're so strong. Well, I guess I can still feed myself. Say, talking about sissies. What do you see in a light-waisted molly coddle like Julian? You don't really like him, do you? Oh, you know how it is, she said, trying without too much obviousness to ease her head away from his shoulder. We've always been playmates, since we were kids. Well, you just said I was, too. Yes, that's so. Now in her effort to give all the famous pleasures of seduction without taking any of the risk, the amateur secret service operative, Sissy, had a slightly confused aim. She was going to get from Shad information valuable to the NU rapidly rehearsing it in her imagination, the while she was supposed to be weakened by the charm of leaning against Shad's meaty shoulder, she heard herself teasing him into giving her the name of some citizen whom the M. M's were about to arrest, slickly freeing herself from him, dashing out to find Julian O. Hang it, why hadn't she made an engagement with Julian for that night question mark well, he'd either be at home or out driving Dr. Olmsted Julian's melodramatically dashing to the home of the destined victim and starting him for the Canadian border before dawn. And it might be a good idea for the refugee to tack on his door a note dated two days ago, saying that he was off on a trip, so that Shad would never suspect her. All this in a second of hectic storytelling, neatly illustrated in color by her fancy, while she pretended that she had to blow her nose and thus had an excuse to sit straight. Edging another inch or two away, she purred, but of course it isn't just physical strength, Shad. You have so much power politically. My. I imagine you could send almost anybody in Fort Beulah off to concentration camp, if you wanted to. Well, I could put a few of them away, if they got funny. I'll bet you could and will, too. Who you going to arrest next, Shad? Huh? Oh come on. Don't be so tightwad with all your secrets. What are you trying to do, baby? Pump me? Why no, of course not, I just, sure. You'd like to get the poor old fathead going, and find out everything he knows and that's plenty, you can bet your sweet life on that. Nothing doing, baby, Shad, I'd just I'd just love to see an MM squad arresting somebody once. It must be dreadfully exciting. Oh, it's exciting enough, all right, all right. When the poor chumps try to resist, and you throw their radio out of the window. Or when the fellow's wife gets fresh and shoots off her mouth too much and so you just teach her a little lesson by letting her look on while you drip him up on the floor and beat him up maybe that sounds a little rough, but you see, in the long run it's the best thing you can do for these beggars, because it teaches them to not get ugly, but you won't think I'm horrid and unwomanly, will you question mark but I would like to see you hauling out one of those people, just once. Come on, tell a fellow. Who are you going to arrest next, naughty, naughty? Mustn't try to kid papa. No the womanly thing for you to do is a little lovemaking. Or oh, come on, let's have some fun, baby. You know you're crazy about me. Now he really seized her, his hand across her breasts. She struggled, thoroughly frightened, no longer cynical and sophisticated. 
She shrieked, oh don't don't. She wept, real tears, more from anger than from modesty. He loosened his grip a little, and she had the inspiration to sob, oh, Shad, if you really want me to love you, you must give me time. You wouldn't want me to be a hussy that you could do anything you wanted to with you, in your position? Oh, no, Shad, you couldn't do that, well, maybe, said he, with the smugness of a carp, she had sprung up, dabbling at her eyes and through the doorway, in the bedroom, on a flat-topped desk, she saw a bunch of two or three Yale keys. Keys to his office, to secret cupboards and drawers with corpo plans. Undoubtedly. Her imagination in one second pictured her making a rubbing of the keys, getting John Polycop, that omnifarious mechanic, to file substitute keys, herself and Julian somehow or other sneaking into corpo headquarters at night, perilously creeping past the guards, rifling Shad's every dread file, she stammered, do you mind if I go in and wash my face? All teary so silly. You don't happen to have any face powder in your bathroom. Say, what do you think I am? A hick, or a monk, maybe? You bet your life I've got some face powder right in the medicine cabinet two kinds housed it for service. Ladies taken care of by the day or hour, it hurt, but she managed something like a giggle before she went in and shut the bedroom door, and locked it. She tore across to the keys. She snatched up a pad of yellow scratch paper and a pencil, and tried to make a rubbing of a key as once she had made rubbings of coins, for use in the small grocery shop of C. Jessup and J. Falk Groshes. The pencil blur showed only the general outline of the key. The tiny notches which were the trick would not come clear. In panic, she experimented with a sheet of carbon paper, then toilet paper, dry and wet. She could not get a mold. She pressed the key into a prop hotel candle in a china stick by Shad's bed. The candle was too hard. So was the bathroom soap. And Shad was now trying the knob of the door, remarking damn. Then bellowing, where you doing in there? Gone to sleep? Be right out. She replaced the keys, threw the yellow paper and the carbon paper out of the window, replaced the candle and soap, slapped her face with a dry towel, dashed on powder as though she were working against time at plastering a wall, and sauntered back into the parlor. Shad looked hopeful. In panic she saw that now, before he comfortably sat down to it and became passionate again, was her one time to escape. She snatched up hat and coat, said wistfully, another night, Shad you must let me go now, dear. And fled before he could open his red muzzle. Round the corner in the hotel corridor she found Julian. He was standing taut, trying to look like a watchdog, his right hand in his coat pocket as though it was holding a revolver. She hurled herself against his bosom and howled, Good God! What did he do to you? I'll go in and kill him. Oh, I didn't get seduced. It isn't things like that that I'm bawling about. It's because I'm such a simply terribly awful spy. But one thing came out of it. Her courage nerved Julian to something he had longed for and feared, to join the M. M's, put on uniform, work from within, and supply Dor Emus with information. I can get Leo Quinn you know question mark dad's a conductor on the railroad question mark used to play basketball in high school question mark I can get him to drive Dr. Olmsted for me, and generally run errands for the NU he's got grit, and he hates the corpos. But look, sissy look, Mr. Jessup in order to get the M. M's to trust me. I've got to pretend to have a fierce bust up with you and all our friends. Look. Sissy and I will walk up Elm Street tomorrow evening, giving an imitation of estranged lovers. How about it, sis? Fine. Glowed that incorrigible actress, she was to be, every evening at eleven, in a birch grove just up Pleasant Hill from the Jessups, where they had played house as children. Because the road curved, the rendezvous could be entered from four or five directions. There he was to hand on to her his reports of M.M. plans, but when he first crept into the grove at night and she nervously turned her pocket torch on him, she shrieked at seeing him in M.M. uniform, as an inspector. That blue tunic and slanting forage cap which, in the cinema and history books, had meant youth and hope, meant only death now. She wondered if in 1864 it had not meant death more than moonlight and magnolias to most women. She sprang to him, holding him as if to protect him against his own uniform and in the peril and uncertainty now of their love, Sissy began to grow up. Chapter 29 The propaganda throughout the country was not all to the new underground, not even most of it, and though the pamphlet is for the NU, at home and exiled abroad, included hundreds of the most capable professional journalists of America, they were cramped by a certain respect for facts which never enfeebled the press agents for corporism. And the corpos had a notable staff. It included college presidents, 
some of the most renowned among the radio announcers who aforetime had crooned their affection for mouthwashes and non-insomniac coffee, famous ex-war correspondents, ex-governors, former vice presidents of the American Federation of Labor, and no less an artist than the Public Relations Council of a princely corporation of electrical goods manufacturers. The newspapers everywhere might no longer be so wishily-washily liberal as to print the opinions of non-corpos, they might give but little news from those old-fashioned and democratic countries, Great Britain, France, and the Scandinavian states, might indeed print almost no foreign news, except as regards the triumphs of Italy in giving Ethiopia good roads, trains on time, freedom from beggars and from men of honor, and all the other spiritual benefactions of Roman civilization. But, on the other hand, never had newspapers shown so many comic strips the most popular was a very funny one about a preposterous new underground crank, who wore mortuary black with a high hat decorated with crepe and who was always being comically beaten up by M. M's. Never had there been, even in the days when Mr. Hurst was free in Cuba, so many large red headlines. Never so many dramatic drawings of murders the murderers were always notorious anti-corpos. Never such a wealth of literature, worthy its twenty-four-hour immortality, as the articles proving, and proving by figures, that American wages were universally higher, commodities universally lower priced, war budgets smaller but the army and its equipment much larger, than ever in history. Never such righteous polemics as the proofs that all that non-corpos were communists, almost daily, Windrip, Saracen, Dr. Mugablin, Secretary of War Luthorne, or Vice President Pearlie Beecroft humbly addressed their masters, the great general public, on the radio, and congratulated them on making a new world by their example of American solidarity marching shoulder to shoulder under the grand old flag, comrades in the blessings of peace and comrades in the joys of war to come, much heralded movies, subsidized by the government and could there be any better proof of the attention paid by Dr. McGiblin and the other Nazi leaders to the arts than the fact that movie actors who before the days of the chief were receiving only 1500 gold dollars a week were now getting 5000? Showed the M. M's driving armored motors at 80 miles an hour, piloting a fleet of 1000 planes, and being very tender to a little girl with a kitten, everyone, including Doremus Jessup, had said in 1935, if there ever is a fascist dictatorship here, American humor and pioneer independence are so marked that it will be absolutely different from anything in Europe, for almost a year after Windrup came in, this seemed true. The chief was photographed playing poker, in shirt sleeves and with a derby on the back of his head, with a newspaper man, a chauffeur, and a pair of rugged steel workers. Dr. McGoblin in person led an Elks brass band and dived in competition with the Atlantic City bathing beauties. It was reputably reported that M. Ems apologized to political prisoners for having to arrest them, and that the prisoners joked amiably with the guards. At first, all that was gone, within a year after the inauguration, and surprised scientists discovered that whips and handcuffs hurt just as sorely in the clear American air as in the miasmic fogs of Prussia. Doemus, reading the authors he had concealed in the horsehair sofa the gallant communist, Carl Billinger, the gallant anti-communist, Genevin, and the gallant neutral. Laurent began to see something much like a biology of dictatorships, all dictatorships. The universal apprehension, the timorous denials of faith, the same methods of arrest sudden pounding on the door late at night, the squad of police pushing in, the blows, the search, the obscene oaths at the frightened women, the third degree by young snipe of officials, the accompanying blows and then the formal beatings, when the prisoner is forced to count the strokes until he faints, the leprous beds and the sour stew guards jokingly shooting round and round a prisoner who believes he is being executed, the waiting in solitude to know what will happen, till men go mad and hang themselves, thus had things gone in Germany, exactly thus in Soviet Russia, in Italy and Hungary and Poland, Spain and Cuba and Japan and China. Not very different had it been under the blessings of liberty and fraternity in the French Revolution. All dictators followed the same routine of torture, as if they had all read the same manual of sadistic etiquette. And now, in the humorous, friendly, happy-go-lucky land of Mark Twain, Doremus saw the homicidal maniacs having just as good a time as they had had in Central Europe. America followed, too, the same ingenious finances as Europe. Windrup had promised to make everybody richer, and had contrived to make everybody, except for a few hundred bankers and industrialists and soldiers, much poorer. He needed no higher mathematicians to produce his financial statements, any ordinary press agent could do them. To show a 100% economy in military expenditures, while increasing the establishment 700%, it had been necessary only to charge up all expenditures for the Minutemen to non-military departments, 
so that their training in the art of bayonet sticking was debited to the Department of Education. To show an increase in average wages one did tricks with categories of labor and required minimum wages, and forgot to state how many workers ever did become entitled to the minimum, and how much was charged as wages, on the books, for food and shelter for the millions in the labor camps, it all made dazzling reading. There had never been more elegant and romantic fiction. Even loyal corpos began to wonder why the armed forces, army and dem, ems together, were being so increased. Was a frightened Windrup getting ready to defend himself against a rising of a whole nation? Did he plan to attack all of North and South America and make himself an emperor? Or both? In any case, the forces were so swollen that even with its despotic power of taxation, the corpo government never had enough. They began to force exports, to practice the dumping of wheat, corn, timber, copper, oil, machinery. They increased production, forced it by fines and threats, then stripped the farmer of all he had, for export at depreciated prices. But at home the prices were not depreciated but increased, so that the more we exported, the less the industrial worker in America had to eat. And really zealous county commissioners took from the farmer, after the patriotic manner of many Midwestern counties in 1918, even his seed grain, so that he could grow no more and on the very acres where once he had raised superfluous wheat he now starved for bread. And while he was starving, the commissioners continued to try to make him pay for the corpo bonds which he had been made to buy on the installment plan. But still, when he did finally starve to death, none of these things worried him. There were bread lines now in Fort Beulah, once or twice a week, the hardest phenomenon of dictatorship for a Doremus to understand, even when he saw it daily in his own street, was the steady diminution of gaiety among the people. America, like England and Scotland, have never really been a gay nation. Rather it had been heavily and noisily jocular, with a substratum of worry and insecurity, in the image of its patron saint, Lincoln of the rollicking stories and the tragic heart. But at least there had been hearty greetings, man to man, there had been clamorous jazz for dancing, and the lively, slangy catcalls of young people, and the nervous blatting of tremendous traffic, all that false cheerfulness lessened now, day by day the corpos found nothing more convenient to milk than public pleasures. After the bread had molded, the circuses were closed. There were taxes or increased taxes on motorcars, movies, theatres, dances, and ice cream sodas. There was a tax on playing a phonograph or radio in any restaurant. Lee Saracen, himself a bachelor, conceived of supertaxing bachelors and spinsters, and contrary ways of taxing all weddings at which more than five persons were present. Even the most reckless youngsters went less and less to public entertainments, because no one not ostentatiously in uniform cared to be noted, these days. It was impossible to sit in a public place without wondering which spies were watching you. So all the world stayed home and jumped anxiously at every passing footstep, every telephone ring, every tap of an ivy sprig on the window. The score of people definitely pledged to the new underground were the only persons to whom Doremus dared talk about anything more incriminating than whether it was likely to rain though he had been the friendliest gossip in town. Always it had taken ten minutes longer than was humanly possible for him to walk to the informer office, because he stopped on every corner to ask after someone's sick wife, politics, potato crop, opinions about deism, or luck at fishing. As he read of rebels against the regime who worked in Rome, in Berlin, he envied them. They had thousands of government agents, unknown by sight and thus the more dangerous, to watch them, but also they had thousands of comrades from whom to seek encouragement exciting personal tattle, shop talk, and the assurance that they were not altogether idiotic to risk their lives for a mistress so ungrateful as revolution. Those secret flats in great cities perhaps some of them really were filled with the rosy glow they had in fiction. But the Fortbulas, anywhere in the world, were so isolated, the conspirators so uninspiringly familiar one to another, that only by inexplicable faith could one go on. Now that Lorinda was gone, there certainly was nothing very diverting in sneaking round corners trying to look like somebody else, merely to meet Buck and Dan Wilgers and that good woman, Sissy, Buck and he and the rest they were such amateurs. They needed the guidance of veteran agitators like Mr. Rayleigh and Mr. Bailey and Mr. Cayley, their feeble pamphlets, their smearily printed newspaper, seemed futile against the enormous blur of corpo propaganda. It seemed worse than futile, it seemed insane, to risk martyrdom in a world where fascists persecuted communists, communists persecuted social democrats, Social Democrats persecuted everybody who would stand for it, where Aryans who looked like Jews persecuted Jews who looked like Aryans and Jews persecuted their debtors, where every statesman and clergyman praised peace and brightly asserted that the only way to get peace was to get ready for war. 
What conceivable reason could one have for seeking after righteousness in a world which so hated righteousness? Why do anything except eat and read and make love and provide for sleep that should be secure against disturbance by armed policemen? He never did find any particularly good reason. He simply went on. In June, when the Fort Beulah cell of the new underground had been carrying on for some three months, Mr. Francis Tasbro, the golden quarryman, called on his neighbor, Doemus, how are you, Frank, fine, Remus, how's the old carping critic, fine, Frank, still carping, fine carping weather, at that, have a cigar, thanks, got a match, thanks, saw Sissy yesterday, she looks fine, yes, she's fine, I saw Malcolm driving by yesterday, how did he like it in the provincial university, at New York, oh, fine fine, he says the athletics are grand, they're getting Primo Carnera over to coach in tennis next year I think it's Carnera I think it's tennis but anyway, the athletics are fine there, Malcolm says. Say, ah, uh, Remus, there's something I've been meaning to ask you. I, other fact is I want you to be sure and not repeat this to anybody. I know you can be trusted with a secret, even if you are a newspaper man or used to be, I mean. But the fact is, and this is inside stuff, official, there's going to be some governmental promotions all along the line this is confidential, and it comes to me straight from the provincial commissioner, Colonel Hake. Luthorn is finished as secretary of war he's a nice fellow, but he hasn't got as much publicity for the corpos out of his office as the chief expected him to. Hake is to have his job, and also take over the position of high marshal of the Minutemen from Lee Saracen I suppose Saracen has too much to do. Well then, John Sullivan Reek is slated to be provincial commissioner that leaves the office of District Commissioner for Vermont New Hampshire empty, and I'm one of the people being seriously considered. I've done a lot of speaking for the corpos, and I know Dewey Haig very well I was able to advise him about erecting public buildings. Of course there's none of the county commissioners around here that measure up to a district commissionership not even Dr. Storbmeyer certainly not Shad leads you. Now if you could see your way clear to throw in with me, your influence would help, good heavens, Frank, the worst thing you could have happen, if you want the job is to have me favor you. The corpos don't like me. Oh, of course they know I'm loyal, not one of these dirty, sneaking anti-corpos, but I never made enough noise in the paper to please them. That's just it, Remus. I've got a really striking idea. Even if they don't like you, the corpos respect you, and they know how long you've been important in the state. We'd all be greatly pleased if you came out and joined us. Now just suppose you did so and let people know that it was my influence that converted you to corpism that might give me quite a leg up. And between old friends like us, Remus, I can tell you that this job of district commissioner would be useful to me in the quarry business, aside from the social advantages. And if I got the position, I can promise you that I'd either get the informer taken away from Storbmeyer and the dirty little stinker, itch it, and given back to you to run absolutely as you pleased providing, of course, you had the sense to keep from criticizing the chief and the state. Or, if you'd rather, I think I could probably wangle a jobs for you as military judge, they don't necessarily have to be lawyers, or maybe President Peasley's job as district director of education you would have a lot of fun out of that exclamation mark awfully amusing the way all the teachers kiss the director's foot. Come on, old man. Think of all the fun we used to have in the old days. Come to your senses and face the inevitable and join us and fix up some good publicity for me. How about it huh, huh? Doemus reflected that the worst trial of a revolutionary propagandist was not risking his life, but having to be civil to people like future Commissioner Taz Braw. He supposed that his voice was polite as he muttered, afraid I'm too old to try it, Frank, but apparently Taz Braw was offended. He sprang up and tramped away grumbling, oh, very well then, and I didn't give him a chance to say anything about being realistic or breaking eggs to make an omelette, regretted Doemus, the next day Malcolm Taz Braw meeting Sissy on the street, made his beefy most of cutting her. At the time the Jessups thought that was very amusing. They thought the occasion less amusing when Malcolm chased little David out of the Tasbro apple orchard, which he had been wont to use as the great western forest where at any time one was rather more than likely to meet Kit Carson, Robin Hood, and Colonel Lindbergh hunting together. Having only Frank's word for it, Doemus could do no more than hint in Vermont vigilance that Colonel Dewey Hake was to be made Secretary of War, and give Hake's actual military record, which included the facts that as a first lieutenant in France in 1918, he had been under fire for less than 15 minutes, and that his one real triumph had been commanding state militia during a strike in Oregon, when 11 strikers had been shot down, five of them in the back, then Doemus forgot Tasbro completely and happily, Chapter 30.
But worse than having to be civil to the fatuous Mr. Tasbrough was keeping his mouth shut when, toward the end of June, a newspaper man at Battington, Vermont, was suddenly arrested as editor of Vermont Vigilance and author of all the pamphlets by Doremus and Lorinda. He went to concentration camp. Buck and Dan Wilgers and Sissy prevented Doremus from confessing, and from even going to call on the victim, and when, with Lorinda no longer there as confidant, Doremus tried to explain it all to Emma, she said. Wasn't it lucky that the government had blamed somebody else? Emma had worked out the theory that the NU activity was some sort of a naughty game which kept her boy, Doremus, busy after his retirement. He was mildly nagging the corpos. She wasn't sure that it was really nice to nag the legal authorities, but still, for a little fellow, her Doremus had always been surprisingly spunky just like, she often confided to Sissy, a spunky little Scotch terrier she had owned when she was a girl Mr. McNabbit its name had been, a little Scotch terrier, but my so spunky he acted like he was a regular lion, she was rather glad that Lorinda was gone, though she liked Lorinda and worried about how well she might do with a tea room in a new town, a town where she had never lived. But she just couldn't help feeling, she confided not only to Sissy but to Mary and Buck, that Lorinda, with all her wild crazy ideas about women's rights, and workmen being just as good as their employers, had a bad influence on Doremus's tendency to show off and shock people. She mildly wondered why Buck and Sissy snorted so. She hadn't meant to say anything particularly funny. For too many years she had been used to Doremus's irregular routine to have her sleep disturbed by his returning from Buck's at the improper time to which she referred as at all hours, but she did wish he would be more on time for his meals, and she gave up the question of why. These days, he seemed to like to associate with ordinary people like John Polycop, Dan Wilgus, Daniel Babcock, and Pete Vu Tong Mai. Some people said Pete couldn't even read and write and Doremus so educated and all. Why didn't he see more of lovely people like Frank Tasbrough and Professor Staubmeyer and Mr. R. C. Crowley and this new friend of his, the Honorable John Sullivan Reek, why couldn't he keep out of politics? She'd always said there were no occupation for a gentleman, like David, now ten years old, and like twenty or thirty million other Americans, from one to a hundred. But all of the same mental age, Emma thought the marching M. M's were a very fine show indeed so much like movies of the Civil War, really quite educational, and while of course if Doremus didn't care for President Windrup, she was opposed to him also, yet didn't Mr. Windrup speak beautifully about pure language, church attendance, low taxation, and the American flag? The realists, the makers of omelettes, did climb, as Tasbro had predicted. Colonel Dewey Hake, Commissioner of the Northeastern Province, became Secretary of War and High Marshal of M. M's, while the former Secretary, Colonel Luthorne, retired to Kansas and the real estate business and was well spoken of by all businessmen for being thus willing to give up the grandeur of Washington for duty toward practical affairs and his family, who were throughout the press depicted as having frequently missed him. It was rumored in NU cells that Hake might go higher even than Secretary of War, that Windrup was worried by the forced growth of a certain effeminacy in Lee Saracen under the arc light of glory, Francis Dasbro was elevated to district commissionership at Hanover but Mr. Sullivan Reek did not in series go on to be provincial commissioner. It was said that he had too many friends among just the old line politicians whose jobs the corpos were so enthusiastically taking. No, the new provincial commissioner, viceroy and general, was military judge Effingham Swan, the one man whom Mary Jessup Greenhill hated more than she did Shad Lee Jew. Swan was a splendid commissioner. Within three days after taking office, he had John Sullivan Reek and seven assistant district commissioners arrested, tried, and imprisoned, all within twenty-four hours, and an eighty-year-old woman, mother of a new underground agent but not otherwise accused of wickedness, penned in a concentration camp for the more desperate traitors. It was in a disused quarry which was always a foot deep in water. After he had sentenced her, Swan was said to have bowed to her most courteously. The new underground sent out warning, from headquarters in Montreal, for a general tightening up of precautions against being caught distributing propaganda. Agents were disappearing rather alarmingly, Buck scoffed, but Doremus was nervous. He noticed that the same strange man, ostensibly a drummer, a large man with unpleasant A's, had twice got into conversation with him in the Hotel Wessex lobby, and too obviously hinted that he was anti-corpo and would love to have Doremus say something nasty about the chief and the M. M's, Doremus became cautious about going out to Buck's. He parked his car in half a dozen different wood roads and crept afoot to the secret basement. On the evening of the 28th of June, 1938, he had a notion that he was being followed, so closely did a car with red-tinted headlights, anxiously watched in his rear-view mirror, 
stick behind him as he took the Kismet Highway down to Bucks. He turned up a side road, down another. The spy car followed. He stopped, in a driveway on the left-hand side of the road, and angrily stepped out, in time to see the other car pass, with a man who looked like Shad Liju driving. He swung round then and, without concealment, bolted for Bucks, in the basement. Buck was contentedly tying up bundles of the vigilance, while Father Peref Ikes, in his shirt sleeves, vest open and black dicky swinging beneath his reversed collar, sat at a plain pine table, writing a warning to New England Catholics that though the corpos had, unlike the Nazis in Germany, been shrewd enough to flatter prelates, they had lowered the wages of French-Canadian Catholic mill hands and imprisoned their leaders just as severely as in the case of the avowedly wicked Protestants. Peref Ikes smiled up at Doemus, stretched, lighted a pipe, and chuckled, as a great ecclesiast, Doemus, is it your opinion that I shall be committing a venial or immortal sin by publishing this little masterpiece the work of my favorite author without the bishop's imprimatur, Stephen? Buck. I think they're on to us. Maybe we've got to fold up already and get the press and type out of here. He told of being shadowed. He telephoned to Julian, at MM headquarters, and, since there were too many French-Canadian inspectors about for him to dare to use his brand of French, he telephoned in the fine new German he had been learning by translation. Denks du Franz du Haben oi de Dilets tag von Wolf Mac here? And the college bred Julian had so much international culture as to be able to answer, Ah, ich meine auf Osaken morning free. Look Coed, how could they move? Where, Dan Wilgus arrived, in panic, an hour after, say. They're watching us. Doemus, Buck, and the priest gathered round the black Viking of a man. Just now when I came in I thought I heard something in the bushes, here in the yard, near the house, and before I thought, I flashed my torch on him, and by golly if it wasn't Aras Dilly, and not in uniform and you know how Aras loves his god excuse me, father how he loves his uniform. He was disguised. Sure. In overalls. Looked like a jackass that's gone under a clothesline. Well. He'd been rubbering at the house. Course these curtains are drawn, but I don't know what he saw and... The three large men looked to Doemus for orders. We got to get all this stuff out of here. Quick. Take it and hide it in Truman Webb's attic. Stephen, get John Polycop and Mungo Kit Eric and Pete Vutong on the phone get em here. Quick tell John to stop by and tell Julian to come as soon as he can. Dan, start dismantling the press. Buck, bundle up all the literature. As he spoke, Doemus was wrapping type in scraps of newspaper. And at three next morning, before light... Polycop was driving toward Truman Webb's farmhouse the entire equipment of the new underground printing establishment, in Buck's old farm truck, from which blatted, for the benefit of all ears that might be concerned, two frightened calves. Next day Julian ventured to invite his superior officers, Chad Liju and Emile Storbmeyer, to a poker session at Buck's. They came, with alacrity. They found Buck, Doemus, Mungo Kit Eric, and Doc Hitch at the last an entirely innocent participant in certain deceptions. They played in Buck's parlor. But during the evening Buck announced that anyone wanting beer instead of whiskey would find it in a tub of ice in the basement, and that anyone wishing to wash his hands would find two bathrooms upstairs. Shad hastily went for beer. Doc Hitch had even more hastily went to wash his hands. Both of them were gone much longer than one would have expected. When the party broke up and Buck and Doremus were alone, Buck shrieked with bucolic mirth. I could scarcely keep a straight face when I heard good old Shad opening the cupboards and taking a fine long look-see for pamphlets down in the basement. Well, Cam Jessup, that about ends their suspicion of this place as a den of traitors, I guess. God, but isn't Shad dumb? This was at perhaps 3 a.m. on the morning of June 30th, Doema stayed home, writing sedition, all the afternoon and evening of the 30th, hiding the sheets under pages of newspaper in the Franklin stove in his study so that he could touch them off with a match in case of a raid a trick he had learned from Carl Billinger's anti-Nazi fatherland. This new opus was devoted to murders ordered by Commissioner Effingham Swan. On the 1st and 2nd of July, when he sauntered uptown, he was rather noticeably encountered by the same weighty drummer who had picked him up in the Hotel Wessex lobby before, and who now insisted on their having a drink together. Doemus escaped, and was conscious that he was being followed by an unknown young man flamboyant in an apricot-colored polo shirt and gray bags, whom he recognized as having worn M.M. uniform at a parade in June. On July 3rd, rather panicky, Doemus drove to Truman Webb's, taking an hour of zigzagging to do it, and warned Truman not to permit any more printing till he should have a release. When Doemus went home, Sissy lightly informed him that Shad had insisted she go out to an M.M. picnic with him on the next afternoon, the 4th, 
and that, information or no, she had refused. She was afraid of him, surrounded by his ready playmates. That night of the third, Doremus slept only in six spasms. He was reasonlessly convinced that he would be arrested before dawn. The night was overcast and electric and uneasy. The crickets sounded as though they were piping under compulsion, in a rhythm of terror. He lay throbbing to their sound. He wanted to flee but how and where, and how could he leave his threatened family? For the first time in years he wished that he was sleeping beside the unperturbable Emma, beside her small earthy hillock of body. He laughed at himself. What could Emma do to protect him against minute men? Just scream. And what then? But he, who always slept with his door shut, to protect his sacred aloneness, popped out of bed to open the door, that he might have the comfort of hearing her breathe, and the fiercer Mary stir in slumber, and Sissy's occasional young whimper. He was awakened before dawn by early firecrackers. He heard the tramping of feet. He lay taut. Then he awoke again, at 7.30, and was slightly angry that nothing happened. The M. M's brought out their burnished helmets and all the rideable horses in the neighborhood some of them known as most superior plough horses for the great celebration of the new freedom on the morning of 4th of July. There was no post of the American Legion in the jaunty parade. That organization had been completely suppressed, and a number of American Legion leaders had been shot. Others had tactfully taken posts in the MM itself, the troops, in Hollow Square, with the ordinary citizenry humbly jammed in behind them and the Jessup family rather hoity-toity on the outskirts, were addressed by ex-Governor Risham Hubbard, a fine ruddy old rooster who could say cock-a-doodle-doo with more profundity than any fowl since he sop. He announced that the chief had extraordinary resemblances to Washington, Jefferson, and William B. McKinley, and to Napoleon on his better days. The trumpets blew. The M. M's gallantly marched off nowhere in particular, and Doremus went home, feeling much better after his laugh. Following noon dinner, since it was raining, he proposed a game of contract to Emma, Mary, and Sissy with Mrs. Candy as volunteer umpire, but the thunder of the hill country disquieted him. Whenever he was dummy, he ambled to a window. The rain ceased, the sun came out for a fool's, hesitating moment, and the wet grass looked unreal. Clouds with torn bottoms, like the hem of a ragged skirt, were driven down the valley, cutting off the bulk of Mount Faithful. The sun went out as in a mammoth catastrophe, and instantly the world was in unholy darkness, which poured into the room. Why, it's quite dark, isn't it? Sissy, turn on the lights, said Emma. The rain attacked again, in a crash, and to Doremus, looking out, the whole knowable world seemed washed out. Through the deluge he saw a huge car flash, the great wheels throwing up fountains. Wonder what make of car that is? Must be a sixteen-cylinder Cadillac, I guess, reflected Doremus. The car swerved into his own gateway, almost knocking down a gatepost, and stopped with a jar at his porch. From it leapt five minute men, black waterproof capes over their uniforms. Before he could quite get through the reflection that he recognized none of them, they were there in the room. The leader, an ensign, and most certainly Doremus did not recognize him, marched up to Doremus, looked at him casually, and struck him full in the face except for the one light pink of the bayonet when he had been arrested before, except for an occasional toothache or headache, or a smart when he had banged a fingernail, Doremus Jessup had not for thirty years known authentic pain. It was as incredible as it was horrifying, this torture in his eyes and nose and crushed mouth. He stood bent, gasping, and the ensign again smashed his face, and observed, you are under arrest, Mary had launched herself on the ensign, was hitting at him with a china ashtray. 2 M. Ems dragged her off, threw her on the couch, and one of them pinned her there. The other two guards were bulking over the paralyzed Emma, the galvanized sissy, Doremus vomited suddenly and collapsed, as though he were dead drunk. He was conscious that the five M. Ems were yanking the books from the shelves and hurling them on the floor, so that the covers split, and with their pistol butts smashing vases and lampshades and small occasional tables. One of them tattooed a rough M.M. Em on the white paneling above the fireplace with shots from his automatic. The ensign said only, careful, Jim, and kissed the hysterical sissy. Doremus struggled to get up. An M.M. kicked him in the elbow. It felt like death itself, and Doremus writhed on the floor. He heard them tramping upstairs. He remembered then that his manuscript about the murders by Provincial Commission Reffingham Swan was hidden in the Franklin stove in his study. The sound of their smashing of furniture in the bedrooms on the second floor was like that of a dozen woodchoppers gone mad, in all his agony. Doremus struggled to get up to set fire to the papers in the stove before they should be found. He tried to look at his women. He could make out Mary, tied to the couch. 
When had that ever happened? But his vision was too blurred, his mind too bruised, to see anything clearly. Staggering, sometimes creeping on his hands and knees, he did actually get past the men in the bedrooms and up the stairs to the third floor and his study. He was in time to see the ensign throwing his best beloved books and his letter files, accumulated these twenty years, out of the study window, to see him search the papers in the Franklin stove, look up with cheerful triumph and cackle, nice piece you've written here, I guess, Jessup. Commissioner Swan will love to see it, I demand see Commissioner Lee Judas Commissioner Tasbro friends of mine, stammered Doemus, don't know a thing about them. I'm running this show, the ensign chuckled, and slapped Doemus, not very painfully merely with a shamefulness as great as Doremus's when he realized that he had been so cowardly as to appeal to Shadden Francis. He did not open his mouth again, did not whimper nor even amuse the troopers by vainly appealing on behalf of the women, as he was hustled down two flights of stairs they threw him down the lower flight and he landed on his raw shoulder and out to the big car. The M.M. driver, who had been waiting behind the wheel, already had the engine running. The car whined away, threatening every instant to skid, but the door Emus who had been queasy about skidding did not notice. What could he do about it, anyway? He was helpless between two troopers in the back seat, and his powerlessness to make the driver slow up seemed part of all his powerlessness before the dictator's power. He who had always so taken it for granted that in his dignity and social security he was just slightly superior to laws and judges and policemen, to all the risks and pain of ordinary workers, he was unloaded, like a balky mule, at the jail entrance of the courthouse. He resolved that when he was led before Shad he would so rebuke the scoundrel that he would not forget it. But Doremus was not taken into the courthouse. He was kicked toward a large, black painted, unlettered truck by the entrance literally kicked, while even in his bewildered anguish he speculated, I wonder which is worse question mark the physical pain of being kicked, or the mental humiliation of being turned into a slave. Hell. Don't be sophistical. It's the pain in the behind that hurts most. He was hiked up a stepladder into the back of the truck from the unlighted interior a moan, my god, not you too, Dormouse. It was the voice of Buck Titus, and with him as prisoners were Truman Webb and Dan Wilgus. Dan was in handcuffs, because he had fought so, the four men were too sore to talk much as they felt the truck lurch away and they were thrown against one another. Once Doremus spoke truthfully, I don't know how to tell you how ghastly sorry I am to have got you into this. And once he lied, when Buck groaned, did those, dash semicolon hurt the girls? they must have ridden for three hours. Doremus was in such a coma of suffering that even though his back winced as it bounced against the rough floor and his face was all one neuralgia, he drowsed and woke to terror, drowsed and woke, drowsed and woke to his own helpless wailing, the truck stopped. The doors were opened on lights thick among white brick buildings. He hazily saw that they were on the one-time Dartmouth campus headquarters now of the Corpo District Commissioner, that Commissioner was his old acquaintance Francis Tasbro. He would be released they would be freed, all four. The incredulity of his humiliation cleared away. He came out of his sick fear like a shipwrecked man sighting an approaching boat, but he did not see Tasbro. The M. M's, silent save for mechanical cursing, drove him into a hallway, into a cell which had once been part of a sedate classroom, left him with a final clout on the head. He dropped on a wooden pallet with a straw pillow and was instantly asleep. He was too dazed he who usually looked recordingly at places to note then or afterward what his cell was like, except that it appeared to be filled with sulfuric fumes from a locomotive engine. When he came to, his face seemed frozen stiff. His coat was torn, and foul with the smell of vomit. He felt degraded, as though he had done something shameful. His door was violently opened, a dirt-clotted bowl of feeble coffee, with a crust of bread faintly smeared with oleum margarine, was thrust at him, and after he had given them up, nauseated. He was marched out into the corridor, by two guards, just as he wanted to go to the toilet. Even that he could forget in the paralysis of fear. One guard seized him by the trim small beard and yanked it, laughing very much. Always did want to see whether a billy goat whisker would pull out or not. Snickered the guard. While he was thus tormented, Doremus received a crack behind his ear from the other man, and a scolding command, Come on, goat. Want us to milk you? You dirty little so and so. What you in for? You look like a little kike tailor, you little... him? The other scoffed. Nor. He's some kind of a half-eared hick newspaper editor they'll sure shoot him sedition but I hope they'll beat hell out of him first for being such a bum editor, him? An editor? Say. Listen. I got a swell idea. Hey. Fellas. Four or five other M. M's, half-dressed, 
looked out from a room down the hall. This here is a writing fellow. I'm going to make him show us how he writes. Look it, the guard dashed down the corridor to a door with the sign gents hung out in front of it, came back with paper, not clean, threw it in front of door Emus, and yammered, come on, boss. Show us how you write your pieces. Come on, write us a piece with your nose. He was iron strong. He pressed door Emus's nose down against the filthy paper and held it there, while his mates giggled. They were interrupted by an officer, commanding, though leniently, come on, boys, cut out the monkey sheens and take this, to the bullpen. Trial this morning, door Emus was led to a dirty room in which half a dozen prisoners were waiting. One of them was Buck Titus. Over one eye Buck had a slatternly bandage which had so loosened as to show that his forehead was cut to the bone. Buck managed to wink jovially. Door Emus tried, vainly, to keep from sobbing. He waited an hour, standing, arms tight at his side, at the demands of an ugly-faced guard, snapping a dog whip with which he twice slashed Door Emus when his hands fell lax. Buck was led into the trial room just before him. The door was closed. Door Emus heard Buck cry out terribly, as though he had been wounded to death. The cry faded into a choked gasping. When Buck was led out of the inner room, his face was as dirty and as pale as his bandage, over which blood was now creeping. The man at the door of the inner room jerked his thumb sharply at Door Emus, and snarled, You're next, now he would face Taz Braw, but in the small room into which he had been taken and he was confused, because somehow he had expected a large courtroom there was only the ensign who had arrested him yesterday, sitting at a table, running through papers, while a stolid M.M. stood on either side of him, rigid, hand on pistol holster, the ensign kept him waiting, then snapped with disheartening suddenness, your name, you know it, the two guards beside Dor Emus each hit him, your name, Dor Emus Jessup, you're a communist, no I'm not, twenty-five lashes and the oil, not believing, not understanding, Dor Emus was rushed across the room, into a cellar beyond, a long wooden table there was dark with dry blood, stank with dry blood, the guards seized Dor Emus, sharply jerked his head back, pried open his jaws, and poured in a quart of castor oil. They tore off his garments above the belt, flung them on the sticky floor. They threw him face downward on the long table and began to lash him with a one-piece steel fishing rod. Each stroke cut into the flesh of his back, and they beat him slowly, relishing it, to keep him from fainting too quickly. But he was unconscious when, to the guard's great diversion, the castor oil took effect. Indeed he did not know it till he found himself limp on a messy piece of gunner sacking on the floor of his cell, they awakened him twice during the night to demand, you're a communist, hey? You better admit it. We're going to beat the living tower out of you till you do, though he was sicker than he had ever been in his life, yet he was also angrier, too angry to admit anything whatever, even to save his wrecked life. He simply snarled no. But on the third beating he savagely wondered if no was now a truthful answer, after each questioning he was pounded again with fists, but not lashed with a steel rod, because the headquarters doctor had forbidden it, he was a sporty looking young doctor in plus fours. He yawned at the guards, in the blood reeking cellar, better cut out the lashes or this, will pass out on you, Dor Emus raised his head from the table to gasp, you call yourself a doctor, and you associate with these murderers, oh, shut up, you little dash, dirty traitors like you deserve to be beaten to death and maybe you will be, but I think the boys ought to save you for the trial. The doctor showed his scientific mettle by twisting Dor Emus's ear till it felt as though it were torn off, chuckled, go to it, boys, and ambled away, ostentatiously humming, for three nights he was questioned and lashed once, late at night, by guards who complained of the inhuman callousness of their officers in making them work so late. They amused themselves by using an old harness strap, with a buckle on it, to beat him. He almost broke down when the examining ensign declared that Buck Titus had confessed their illegal propaganda, and narrated so many details of the work that Dor Emus could almost have believed in the confession. He did not listen. He told himself, no. Buck would die before he'd confess anything. It's all Aristilly's spying, the ensign cooed, now if you'll just have the sense to copy your friend Titus and tell us who's in the conspiracy besides him and you and Wilgus and Webb, we'll let you go. We know, all right toe. We know the whole plot exclamation mark but we just want to find out whether you've finally come to your senses and been converted, my little friend. Now who else was there? Just give us their names. We'll let you go. Or would you like the castor oil and the whip again? Dor Emus did not answer. Ten lashes, said the ensign. He was chased out for half an hour's walk on the campus every afternoon probably because he would have preferred lying on his hard cot, 
trying to keep still enough so that his heart would stop its deathly hammering. Half a hundred prisoners marched there, round and round senselessly. He passed Buck Titus. To salute him would have meant a blow from the guards. They greeted each other with quick eyelids, and when he saw those untroubled spaniel eyes, Doremus knew that Buck had not squealed. And in the exercise yard he saw Dan Wilgus, but Dan was not walking free, he was led out from the torture rooms by guards, and with his crushed nose, his flattened ear, he looked as though he had been pounded by a prize fighter. He seemed partly paralyzed. Doremus tried to get information about Dan from a guard in his cell corridor. The guard a handsome, clear-cheeked young man, noted in a valley of the White Mountains as a local beau, and very kind to his mother laughed, Oh, your friend will guess? That chump thinks he can lick his weight in wildcats. I hear he always tries to soak the guards. They'll take that out of him, all right, Doremus thought, that night he could not be sure, but he thought he heard Dan wailing, half the night. Next morning he was told that Dan, who had always been so disgusted when he had had to set up the news of a weakling's suicide, had hanged himself in his cell. Then, unexpectedly, Doremus was taken into a room, this time reasonably large, a former English classroom turned into a court, for his trial, but it was not District Commissioner Francis Dasbro who was on the bench, nor any military judge, but no less a protector of the people than the great new provincial commissioner, Effingham Swan. Swan was looking at Doremus's article about him as Doremus was led up to stand before the bench. He spoke in this harsh, tired-looking man was no longer the airy Rhodes scholar who had sported with Doremus once like a boy pulling the wings off flies. Jessop, do you plead guilty to seditious activities? Why Doremus looked helplessly about for something in the way of legal counsel, Commissioner Tasbro. Called Swan, so at last Doremus did see his boyhood playmate. Tasbro did nothing so commendable as to avoid Doremus's eyes. Indeed he looked at Doremus directly, and most affably, as he spoke his piece. Your Excellency, it gives me great pain to have to expose this man, Jessop, whom I have known all my life, and tried to help, but he always was a smart aleck he was a laughing stock in Fort Beulah for the way he tried to show off as a great political leader exclamation mark and when the chief was elected, he was angry because he didn't get any political office, and he went about everywhere trying to disaffect people I have heard him do so myself, that's enough. Thanks. County Commissioner Lee Ju. Captain Lee Ju. Is it or is it not true that the man Jessop tried to persuade you to join the violent plot against my person? But Shad did not look at Doremus as he mumbled, it's true. Swan crackled, gentlemen, I think that that, plus the evidence contained in the prisoner's own manuscript, which I hold here, is sufficient testimony. Prisoner, if it weren't for your age and your damn silly senile weakness, I'd sentence you to a hundred lashes, as I do all the other communists like you that threaten the corporate state. As it is, I sentence you to be held in concentration camp, at the will of the court, but with a minimum sentence or seventeen years. Doremus calculated rapidly. He was sixty-two now. He would be seventy-nine then. He never would see freedom again. And, in the power of issuing emergency decrees, conferred upon me as provincial commissioner, I also sentence you to death by shooting, but I suspend that sentence though only until such time as you may be caught trying to escape. And I hope you'll have just lots and lots of time in prison. Jessop, to think about how clever you were in this entrancing article you wrote about me. And to remember that any nasty cold morning they may take you out in the rain and shoot you. He ended with a mild suggestion to the guards, and twenty lashes. Two minutes later they had forced castor oil down him. He lay trying to bite at the stained wood of the whipping table, and he could hear the wish of a steel fishing rod as a guard playfully tried it out in the air before bringing it down across the crisscross wounds of his raw back. Chapter 31 as the open prison van approached the concentration camp at Trianon, the last light of afternoon caressed the thick birch and maples and poplars up the pyramid of Mount Faithful. But the grayness swiftly climbed the slope, and all the valley was left in cold shadow. In his seat the sick Doema drooped again in listlessness. The prim Georgian buildings of the girls' school which had been turned into a concentration camp at Trianon, nine miles north of Fort Beulah, had been worse used than Dartmouth where whole buildings were reserved for the luxuries of the corpos and their female cousins, all very snotty and parvenu. The Trianon school seemed to have been gouged by a flood. Marble doorsteps had been taken away. One of them now graced the residence of the wife of the superintendent, Mrs. Cowlick, a woman fat, irate, jeweled, religious, and given to announcing that all opponents of the chief were communists and ought to be shot offhand, windows were smashed. Hurrah for the chief had been chalked on brick walls and other chalked words each of four letters, had been rubbed out, not very thoroughly. The lawns and hollyhock beds were a mess of weeds, 
the buildings stood on three sides of a square, the fourth side and the gaps between buildings were closed with unpainted pine fences dropped with strands of barbed wire, every room except the office of Captain Cowlick, the superintendent, he was as near nothing at all as any man can be who has attained to such honours as being a captain in the quartermaster corps and the head of a prison, was smeared with filth. His office was merely dreary, and scented with whiskey, not, like the other rooms, with ammonia. Cowlick was not too ill-natured. He wished that the camp guards, or Lem. M's, would not treat the prisoners viciously, except when they tried to escape. But he was a mild man, much too mild to hurt the feelings of the M. M's and perhaps set up inhibitions in their psyches by interfering with their methods of discipline. The poor fellows probably meant well when they lashed noisy inmates for insisting they had committed no crime. And the good Cowlick saved Doremus's life for a while, let him lie for a month in the stuffy hospital and have actual beef in his daily beef stew. The prison doctor, a decayed old drunkard who had had his medical training in the late eighties and who had been somewhat close to trouble in civil life for having performed too many abortions, was also good-natured enough when sober, and at last he permitted Doremus to have Dr. Marcus Olmsted in from Fort Beulah, and for the first time in four weeks Doremus had news, any news whatsoever, of the world beyond prison, where in normal life it would have been agony to wait for one hour to know what might be happening to his friends, his family, now for one month he had not known whether they were alive or dead. Dr. Olmsted as guilty as Doremus himself of what the corpos called treason dead speak to him only a moment because the prison doctor stayed in the hospital ward all the while, drooling over whips card patients and daubing iodine more or less near their wounds. Almstead sat on the edge of his cot, with its foul blankets, unwashed for months, and muttered rapidly. Quick! Listen! Don't talk! Mrs. Jessup and your two girls are all right, they are scared, but no signs of their being arrested. Here Lorinda Pike is all right. Your grandson, David, looks fine though I'm afraid he'll grow up a corporal like all the youngsters. Buck Titus is alive at another concentration camp the one near Woodstock. Our NU cell at Fort Beulah is doing what it can no publishing, but we forward information get a lot from Julian Falk great joke, he's been promoted, MM squad leader now. Mary and Sissy and Father Perefix keep distributing pamphlets from Boston, they help the Quinn boy, my driver, and me to forward refugees to Canada. Yes, we carry on. About like an oxygen tent for a patient that's dying of pneumonia. It hurts to see you looking like a ghost, Doremus. But you'll pull through. You've got pretty good nerves for a little cuss. That aged in the keg prison doctor is looking this way. Bye. He was not permitted to see Dr. Olmsted again, but it was probably Olmsted's influence that got him, when he was dismissed from the hospital, still shaky but well enough to stumble about, a vastly desirable job as sweeper of cells and corridors, cleaner of lavatories and scrubber of toilets, instead of working in the woods gang. Up Mount Faithful, where old men who sank under the weight of logs were said to be hammered to death by guards under the sadistic ensign's doit, when Captain Cowlick wasn't looking. It was better, too, than the undesirable idleness of being disciplined in the doghouse where you lay naked, in darkness, and where bad cases were reformed by being kept awake for forty-eight or even ninety-six hours. Doremus was a conscientious toilet cleaner. He didn't like the work very much but he had pride in being able to scrub as skillfully as any professional pearl diver in a Greek lunchroom, and satisfaction in lessening a little the wretchedness of his imprisoned comrades by giving them clean floors, for, he told himself, they were his comrades. He saw that he, who had thought of himself as a capitalist because he could hire and fire, and because theoretically he owned his business, had been as helpless as the most itinerant janitor, once it seemed worthwhile to the big business which corporism represented to get rid of him. Yet he still told himself stoutly that he did not believe in a dictatorship of the proletariat any more than he believed in a dictatorship of the bankers and utility owners, he still insisted that any doctor or preacher, though economically he might be as insecure as the humblest of his flock, who did not feel that he was a little better than they, and privileged to enjoy working a little harder, was a rotten doctor or a preacher without grace. He felt that he himself had been a better and more honorable reporter than Doc Hitchett, and a thundering sight better student of politics than most of his shopkeeper and farmer and factory worker readers, yet bourgeois pride was so gone out of him that he was flattered, a little thrilled, when he was universally called Doremus and not Mr. Jessop by farmer and workman and truck driver and plain hobo, when they thought enough of his courage under beating and his good temper under being crowded with others in a narrow cell to regard him as almost as good as their own virile selves, Karl Pascal mocked him. I told you so, Doremus. You'll be a communist yet, yes, maybe I will, 
Karl after you communists kick out all your false prophets and belly acres and power drunkards, and all your press agents for the Moscow subway. Well, all right, why don't you join Max Eastman? I hear he's escaped to Mexico and has a whole big Purotskyite communist party of 17 members there. 17? Too many? What I want is mass action by just one member, alone on a hilltop. I'm a great optimist, Carl. I still hope America may someday rise to the standards of Kit Carson. As sweeper and scrubber, Doremus had unusual chances for gossip with other prisoners. He chuckled when he thought of how many of his fellow criminals were acquaintances, Carl Pascal, Henry Vida, his own cousin, Louis Rotenston, who looked now like a corpse, unforgettingly wounded in his old pride of having become a real American, Cliff Little, the jeweler, who was dying of consumption, Ben Tripper, who had been the jolliest workman in Medricol's gristmill, Professor Victor Loveland, of the defunct Isaiah College, and Raymond Pridewell, that old Tory who was still so contemptuous of flattery, so clean amid dirt, so hawk-eyed, that the guards were uncomfortable when they beat him. Pascal, the communist, Pridewell, the square Archie Republican, and Henry Vida, who had never cared a hang about politics, and who had recovered from the first shocks of imprisonment. These three had become intimates, because they had more arrogance of utter courage than anyone else in the prison. For home door Emus shared with five other men a cell twelve feet by ten and eight feet high, which a finishing school girl had once considered outrageously confined for one lone young woman. Here they slept, in two tiers of three bunks each, here they ate, washed, played cards, read, and enjoyed the leisurely contemplation which, as Captain Cowlick preached to them every Sunday morning, was to reform their black souls and turn them into loyal corpos. None of them, certainly not Doremus, complained much. They got used to sleeping in a jelly of tobacco smoke and human stench, to eating stews that always left them nervously hungry, to having no more dignity or freedom than monkeys in a cage, as a man gets used to the indignity of having to endure cancer. Only it left in them a murderous hatred of their oppressors so that they, men of peace all of them, would gladly have hanged every corpo, mild or vicious. Doremus understood John Brown much better, his cellmates were Carl Pascal, Henry Vida, and three men whom he had not known, a Boston architect, a farmhand, and a dope fiend who had once kept questionable restaurants. They had good talk especially from the dope fiend, who placidly defended crime in a world where the only real crime had been poverty. The worst torture to Doremus, aside from the agony of actual floggings, was the waiting, the waiting. It became a distinct, tangible thing, as individual and real as bread or water. How long would he be in? How long would he be in? Night and day, asleep and waking, he worried it, and by his bunk saw waiting the figure of waiting, a grey, foul ghost. It was like waiting in a filthy station for a late train, not for hours but for months. Would Swan amuse himself by having Doremus taken out and shot? He could not care much, now, he could not picture it, any more than he could picture kissing Lorinda, walking through the woods with Buck, playing with David and Foolish, or anything less sensual than the ever derisive visions of roast beef with gravy, of a hot bath, last and richest of luxuries where their only way of washing, except for a fortnightly shower, was with a dirty shirt dipped in the one basin of cold water for six men. Besides waiting, one other ghost hung about them the notion of escaping. It was of that, far more than of the beastliness and idiocy of the corpos, that they whispered in a cell at night. When to escape? How to escape? to sneak off through the bushes when they were out with the woods gang? By some magic to cut through the bars on their cell window and drop out and blessedly not be seen by the patrols? To manage to hang on underneath one of the prison trucks and be driven away? A childish fantasy. They longed for escape as hysterically and as often as a politician longs for votes. But they had to discuss it cautiously, for there were stool pigeons all over the prison. This was hard for Doremus to believe. He could not understand a man's betraying his companions, and he did not believe it till. Two months after Doremus had gone to concentration camp, Clifford Little betrayed to the guards Henry Vida's plan to escape in a hay wagon. Henry was properly dealt with. Little was released. And Doremus, it may be, suffered over it nearly as much as either of them, sturdily though he tried to argue that Little had tuberculosis and that the often beatings had bled out his soul. Each prisoner was permitted one visit to a fortnight and, in sequence, Doremus saw Emma, Mary, Sissy, David, but always an M.M. was standing two feet away, listening, and Doremus had from them nothing more than a flattering, we're all fine we hear Buck is all right we hear Lorinda is doing fine in her new tea room Philip writes he is all right. And once came Philip himself, his pompous son, more pompous than ever now as a corporate judge, 
and very hurt about his father's insane radicalism considerably more hurt when Doremus tartly observed that he would much rather have had the dog foolish for visitor, and there were letters all censored worse than useless to a man who had been so glad to hear the living voices of his friends, in the long run, these frustrate visits, these empty letters, made his waiting the more dismal, because they suggested that perhaps he was wrong in his nightly visions, perhaps the world outside was not so loving and eager and adventurous as he remembered it, but only dreary as his cell. He had little known Karl Pascal, yet now the argumentative Marxian was his nearest friend, his one amusing consolation. Karl could and did prove that the trouble with leaky valves, sour cow pastures, the teaching of calculus, and all novels was their failure to be guided by the writings of Lenin. In his new friendship, Doremus was old maidishly agitated lest Karl be taken out and shot. The recognition usually given to communists. He discovered that he need not worry. Karl had been in jail before. He was the trained agitator for whom Doremus had longed in new underground days. He had ferreted out so many scandals about the financial and sexual shenanigans of every one of the guards that they were afraid that even while he was being shot, he might tattle to the firing squad. They were much more anxious for his good opinion than for that of Captain Cowlick, and they timidly brought him little presents of chewing tobacco and Canadian newspapers, as though they were schoolchildren honeying up to teacher. When Arras Dilly was transferred from night patrols in Fort Beulah to the position of guard at Triana a reward for having given to Shad Liju certain information about R.C. Crowley which cost that banker hundreds of dollars Arras, that slinker, that Hable snooper, jumped at the sight of Carl and began to look pious and kind. He had known Carl before. Despite the presence of Stoit, Anson of Guards, an ex-cashier who had once enjoyed shooting dogs and who now, in the blessed escape of corporalism, enjoyed lashing human beings, the camp at Trianon was not so cruel as the district prison at Hanover. But from the dirty window of his cell door Emus saw horrors enough, one mid-morning, a radiant September morning with the air already savouring the peace of autumn, he saw the firing squad marching out his cousin, Henry Vida, who had recently tried to escape. Henry had been a granite monolith of a man. He had walked like a soldier. He had, in his cell, been proud of shaving every morning, as once he had done, with a tin basin of water heated on the stove, in the kitchen of his old white house up on Mount Terror. Now he stooped, and toward death he walked with dragging feet. His face of a Roman senator was smeared from the cow dung into which they had flung him for his last slumber, as they tramped out through the quadrangle gate, Anson's doit, commanding the squad, halted Henry, laughed at him, and calmly kicked him in the groin. They lifted him up. Three minutes later Doremus heard a ripple of shots. Three minutes after that the squad came back bearing on an old door a twisted clay figure with vacant open eyes. Then Doremus cried aloud. As the bearers slanted the stretcher, the figure rolled to the ground. But one thing worse he was to see through the accursed window. The guards drove in, as new prisoners, Julian Falk, in torn uniform, and Julian's grandfather, so fragile, so silvery so bewildered and terrified in his muddied clericals. He saw them kicked across the quadrangle into a building once devoted to instruction in dancing and the more delicate airs for the piano, devoted now to the torture room and the solitary cells, not for two weeks, two weeks of waiting that was like ceaseless ache. Did he have a chance, at exercise hour, to speak for a moment to Julian, who muttered, they caught me writing some inside dope about M.M. Graft. It was to have gone to Sissy. Thank God, nothing on it to show who it was for. Julian had passed on. But Doremus had had time to see that his eyes were hopeless, and that his neat, smallish, clerical face was blue-black with bruises. The administration, or so Doremus guessed, decided that Julian, the first spy among the M. M's who had been caught in the Fort Beulah region, was too good a subject of sport to be wastefully shot at once. He should be kept for an example. Often Doremus saw the guards kick him across the quadrangle to the whipping room and imagined that he could hear Julian's shrieks afterward. He wasn't even kept in a punishment cell, but in an open barred den on an ordinary corridor, so that passing inmates could peep in and see him, welt across his naked back, huddled on the floor, whimpering like a beaten dog, and Doremus had sight of Julian's grandfather sneaking across the quadrangle, stealing a soggy hunk of bread from a garbage can, and fiercely chewing at it, all through September Doremus worried lest Sissy, with Julian now gone from Fort Beulah, be raped by Shad Lee Jew. Shad would leer the while and gloat over his ascent from hired man to irresistible master. Despite his anguish over the Falks and Henry Vida and every uncouthest comrade in prison, Doremus was almost recovered from his beatings by late September. He began delightedly to believe that he would live for another ten years, was slightly ashamed of his delight, in the presence of so much agony, 
but he felt like a young man and and straightway Ensign Stoit was there, two or three o'clock at night it must have been, yanking Toimus out of his bunk, pulling him to his feet, knocking him down again with so violent a crack in his mouth that Toimus instantly sank again into all his trembling fear, all his inhuman groveling. He was dragged into Captain Cowlick's office. The captain was courtly. Mr. Jessop, we have information that you were connected with squad leader Julian Falk's treachery. He has, ah, uh, well, to be frank, he's broken down and confessed. Now you yourself are in no danger, no danger whatever, of further punishment, if you will just help us. But we really must make a warning of young Mr. Falk, and so if you will tell us all you know about the boy's shocking infidelity to the colours, we shall hold it in your favour. How would you like to have a nice bedroom to sleep in, all by yourself? A quarter hour later Doremus was still swearing that he knew nothing whatever of any subversive activities on the part of Julian, Captain Cowlick said, rather testily, well, since you refuse to respond to our generosity, I must leave you to Ensign's do it, I'm afraid. Be gentle with him, Ensign, yes, said the Ensign. The captain wearily trotted out of the room and Stoit did indeed speak with gentleness, which was a surprise to Doremus, because in the room were two of the guards to whom Stoit liked to show off. Jessop, you're a man of intelligence. No use you're trying to protect this boy, Falk, because we've got enough on him to execute him anyway. So it won't be hurting him any if you give us a few more details about his treason. And you'll be doing yourself a good turn, Doremus said nothing. Going to talk? Doremus shook his head. All right, then. Tit, yes. Bring in the guy that squealed on Jessop. Doremus expected the guard to fetch Julian, but it was Julian's grandfather who wavered into the room. In the camp quadrangle Doremus had often seen him trying to preserve the dignity of his frock coat by rubbing at the spots with a wet rag, but in the cells there were no hooks for clothes, and the priestly garment Mr. Falk was a poor man and it had not been very expensive at best was grotesquely wrinkled now. He was blinking with sleepiness, and his silver hair was a hurrah's nest, Stoit, he was thirty or so, said cheerfully to the two elders, well, now, you boys better stop being naughty and try to get some sense into your mildewed old brains and then we can all have some decent sleep. Why don't you two try to be honest, now that you've each confessed that the other was a traitor? What? Marveled Doremus, sure. Old Falk here says you carried his grandson's pieces to the Vermont Vigilance. Come on. Now, if you'll tell us who published that rag, I have confessed nothing. I have nothing to confess, said Mr. Falk. Stoit screamed, will you shut up? You old hypocrite. Stoit knocked him to the floor and as Mr. Falk weaved dizzily on hands and knees, kicked him in the side with a heavy boot. The other two guards were holding back the sputtering Doremus. Stoy jeered at Mr. Falk, well, you old bastard, you're on your knees, so let's hear you pray, I shall. In agony Mr. Falk raised his head, dust smeared from the floor, straightened his shoulders, held up trembling hands, and with such sweetness in his voice as Doremus had once heard in it when men were human, he cried, Father, thou hast forgiven so long forgive them not but curse them, for they know what they do. He tumbled forward, and Doremus knew that he would never hear that voice again. In Lavoie's Littéraire of Paris, the celebrated and genial professor of Belles Lettres, Guillaume Summit, wrote with his accustomed sympathy, I do not pretend to any knowledge of politics, and probably what I saw on my fourth journey to the States United this summer of 1938 was mostly on the surface and cannot be considered a profound analysis of the effects of corporism, but I assure you that I have never before seen that nation so great, our young and gigantic cousin in the West, in such bounding health and good spirits. I leave it to my economic confreres to explain such dull phenomena as wage scales, and tell only what I saw which is that the innumerable parades and vast athletic conferences of the Minutemen and the lads and lassies of the Corpor Youth Movement exhibited such rosy, contented faces, such undeviating enthusiasm for their hero, the chief, M. Windrip, that involuntarily I exclaimed, here is a whole nation dipped in the river of youth, everywhere in the country was such feverish rebuilding of public edifices and apartment houses for the poor as has never hitherto been known. In Washington, my old colleague, M. Le Secretary Megablin, was so good as to cry, in that virile yet cultivated manner of his which is so well known, our enemies maintain that our labor camps are virtual slavery. Come, my old one. You shall see for yourself. He conducted me by one of the marvelously speedy American automobiles to such a camp, near Washington, and having the workers assembled, he put to them frankly, are you low in the heart? As one man they chorused, no, with a spirit like our own brave soldiers on the ramparts of Verdun. During the full hour we spent there, 
I was permitted to roam at will, asking such questions as I cared to, through the offices of the interpreter kindly furnished by His Excellency, M. Le Dr. McGoblin, and every worker whom I thus approached assured me that never has he been so well fed, so tenderly treated, and so assisted to find an almost poetic interest in his chosen work as in this labor camp this scientific cooperation for the well-being of all. With a certain temerity I ventured to demand of M. McGoblin what truth was there in the reports so shamefully circulated, especially, alas, in our beloved France, that in the concentration camps the opponents of corporism are ill-fed and harshly treated. M. McGoblin explained to me that there are no such things as concentration camps, if that term is to carry any penological significance. They are, actually, schools, in which adults who have unfortunately been misled by the glib prophets of that milk and water religion, liberalism, are reconditioned to comprehend the new day of authoritative economic control. In such camps, he assured me, there are actually no guards, but only patient teachers, and men who were once utterly uncomprehending of corporism, and therefore opposed to it, and now daily going forth as the most enthusiastic disciples of the chief. Alas that France and Great Britain should still be thrashing about in the slough of parliamentarianism and so-called democracy, daily sinking deeper into debt and paralysis of industry, because of the cowardice and traditionalism of our liberal leaders, feeble and outmoded men who are afraid to plump for either fascism or communism, who dare not or who are too power-hungry to cast off outmoded techniques, like the Germans, Americans, Italians, Turks, and other really courageous peoples, and place the sane and scientific control of the all-powerful totalitarian state in the hands of men of resolution. In October, John Polycop, arrested on suspicion of having just possibly helped a refugee to escape, arrived in the Trianon camp, and the first words between him and his friend Carl Pascal were no inquiries about health, but a derisive interchange, as though they were continuing a conversation broken only half an hour before. Well, you old Bolshevik, I told you so. If you communists had joined with me and Norman Thomas to back Frank Roosevelt, we wouldn't be here now, rats. Why, it's Thomas and Roosevelt that started fascism. I ask you. Now shut up, John, and listen, what was the New Deal but pure fascism? What'd they do to the worker? Look here. No, wait now, listen, Doremus felt at home again, and comforted though he did also feel that foolish probably had more constructive economic wisdom than John Polycop, Carl Pascal, Herbert Hoover, Buzz Windrip, Lee Saracen, and himself put together, or if not, Foolish had the sense to conceal his lack of wisdom by pretending that he could not speak English. Chad Lee Jew, back in his hotel suite, reflected that he was getting a dirty deal. He had been responsible for sending more traitors to concentration camps than any other county commissioner in the province, yet he had not been promoted. It was late, he was just back from a dinner given by Francis Tasbro in honor of Provincial Commissioner Swan and a board consisting of Judge Philip Jessup, Director of Education Owen J. Peasley, and Brigadier Kippersley, who were investigating the ability of Vermont to pay more taxes. Shad felt discontented. All those damned snobs trying to show off. Talking at dinner about this bum show in New York this first corpo review, Cohen Stalin, written by Lee Saracen and Hector McGoblin. How those nuts had put on the agony about corpo art and drama freed from Jewish suggestiveness and the pure line of Anglo-Saxon sculpture and even, by God, about corporate physics. Simply trying to show off. And they had paid no attention to Shad when he had told his funny story about the stuck-up preacher in Fort Beulah, one Falk, who had been so jealous because the M. M's drilled on Sunday morning instead of going to his gospel shop that he had tried to get his grandson to make up lies about the M. M's, and whom Shad had amusingly arrested right in his own church not paid one bit of attention to him, even though he had carefully read all through the chief's zero hour so he could quote it, and though he had been careful to be refined in his table manners and to stick out his little finger when he drank from a glass, he was lonely, the fellows he had once best known, in pool room and barber shop, seemed frightened of him, now, and the dirty snobs like Tazbro still ignored him, he was lonely for Sissy Jessup, since her dad had been sent to Trianon, Chad didn't seem able to get her to come around to his rooms, even though he was the county commissioner and she was nothing now but the busted daughter of a criminal, and he was crazy about her. Why? He'd be almost willing to marry her, if he couldn't get her any other way. But when he had hinted as much or almost as much she had just laughed at him, the dirty little snob. He had thought, when he was a hired man, that there was a lot more fun in being rich and famous. He didn't feel one bit different than he had then. Funny. Chapter 32. Dr. Lionel Adams, Bachelor of Arts of Yale. PhD of Chicago, Negro, had been a journalist, American consul in Africa and, 
at the time of Basilius Windrup's election, professor of anthropology in Howard University. As with all his colleagues, his professorship was taken over by a most worthy and needy white man, whose training in anthropology had been as photographer on one expedition to Yucatan. In the dissension between the Booker Washington School of Negroes who counseled patients in the new subjection of the Negroes to slavery, and the radicals who demanded that they join the communists and struggle for the economic freedom of all, white or black, Professor Adams took the mild, Fabian former position. He went over the country preaching to his people that they must be realistic, and make what future they could, not in some utopian fantasy but on the inescapable basis of the ban against them. Near Burlington, Vermont, there is a small colony of Negroes, truck farmers, gardeners, houseworkers, mostly descended from slaves who, before the Civil War, escaped to Canada by the underground railway conducted by such zealots as Truman Webb's grandfather, but who sufficiently loved the land of their forcible adoption to return to America after the war. From the colony had gone to the great city's young colored people who, before the corp emancipation, had been nurses, doctors, merchants, officials. This colony Professor Adams addressed, bidding the young colored rebels to seek improvement within their own souls rather than in mere social superiority. As he was in person unknown to this Burlington colony, Captain Oscar Lee Jew, nicknamed Shad, was summoned to censor the lecture. He sat hulked down in a chair at the back of the hall. Aside from addresses by M.M. officers, and moral inspiration by his teachers in grammar school, it was the first lecture he had ever heard in his life, and he didn't think much of it. He was irritated that this stuck-up nigger didn't spiel like the characters of Octavus Roy Cohen, one of Shad's favorite authors, but had the nerve to try to sling English just as good as Shad himself. It was more irritating that the loud-mouthed pup should look so much like a bronze statue, and finally, it was simply more than a guy could stand that the big bum should be wearing a tuxedo, so when Adams, as he called himself, claimed that there were good poets and teachers and even doctors and engineers among the niggers, which was plainly an effort to incite folks to rebellion against the government, Shad signaled his squad and arrested Adams in the midst of his lecture, addressing him, you goddamn dirty, ignorant, stinking nigger. I'm going to shut your big mouth for you, for keeps. Dr. Adams was taken to the Trianon concentration camp. And since Doit thought it would be a good joke on those fresh beggars, almost communists, you might say, Jessup and Pascal to lodge the nigger right in the same cell with them. But they actually seemed to like Adams, talked to him as though he were white and educated. So Stoit placed him in a solitary cell, where he could think over his crime in having bitten the hand that had fed him. The greatest single shock that ever came to the Trianon camp was in November, 1938, when there appeared among them, as the newest prisoner, Shad Lee Ju. It was he who was responsible for nearly half of them being there. The prisoners whispered that he had been arrested on charges by Francis Tasbro, officially, for having grafted on shopkeepers, unofficially, for having failed to share enough of the graft with Tasbro. But such cloudy causes were less discussed than the question of how they would murder Shad now they had him safe. All Minutemen who were under discipline, except only such Reds as Julian Falk, were privileged prisoners in the concentration camps, they were safeguarded against the common, that is, criminal, that is, political inmates and most of them, once reformed, were returned to the M.M. ranks, with a greatly improved knowledge of how to flog malcontents. Shad was housed by himself in a single cell like a not-too-bad hall bedroom, and every evening he was permitted to spend two hours in the officer's mess room. The scum could not get at him, because his exercise hour was at a time different from theirs. Doremus begged the plotters against Shad to restrain themselves. Good lord, Doremus. Do you mean that after the sure enough battles we've gone through you're still a bourgeois pacifist that you still believe in the sanctity of a lump of hog meat likely do you? Demanded Carl Pascal. Well, yes, I do a little. I know that Shad came from a family of twelve underfed brats up on Mount Terror. Not much chance. But more important than that, I don't believe in individual assassination as an effective means of fighting despotism. The blood of the tyrants is the seed of the massacrant. Are you taking a cue from me and quoting sound doctrine when it's the time for a little liquidation? Said Carl. This one tyrant's going to lose a lot of blood, the Pascal whom Doremus had considered as, at his most violent, only a gas bag, looked at him with a stare in which all friendliness was frozen. Carl demanded of his cellmates, a different set now than at Doremus's arrival, shall we get rid of his typhus germ, lead you, John Polycop, Truman Webb, the surgeon, the carpenter, each of them nodded, slowly, without feeling. At exercise hour, the discipline of the men marching out to the quadrangle was broken when one prisoner stumbled, with a cry, knocked over another man, and loudly apologized just at the barred entrance of Shadley Jew's cell. 
the accident made a knot collect before the cell. Doemus, on the edge of it, saw Shad looking out, his wide face blank with fear. Someone, somehow, had lighted and thrown into Shad's cell a large wad of waste, soaked with gasoline. It caught the thin wallboard which divided Shad's cell from the next. The whole room looked presently like the firebox of a furnace. Shad was screaming, as he beat at his sleeves, his shoulders. Doemus remembered the scream of a horse clawed by wolves in the far north, when they got Shad out, he was dead. He had no face at all. Captain Cowlick was deposed as superintendent of the camp, and vanished to the insignificance whence he had come. He was succeeded by Shad's friend, the belligerent Snake Dizra, now a battalion leader. His first executive act was to have all the two hundred inmates drawn up in the quadrangle and to announce, I'm not going to tell you guys anything about how I'm going to feed you or sleep you till I've finished putting the fear of God into every one of you murderers. There were offers of complete pardon for anyone who would betray the man who had thrown the burning waste into Shad's cell. It was followed by enthusiastic private offers from the prisoners that anyone who did thus tattle would not live to get out. So, as Doremus had guessed, they all suffered more than Shad's death had been worth and to him, thinking of Sissy, thinking of Shad's testimony at Hanover, it had been worth a great deal, it had been very precious and lovely, a court of special inquiry was convened, with Provincial Commission Reffingham Swan himself presiding, he was very busy with all bad works, he used aeroplanes to be about them. Ten prisoners, one out of every twenty in the camp, were chosen by lot and shot summarily. Among them was Professor Victor Loveland, who, for all his rags and scars, was neatly academic to the last, with his eyeglasses and his slick toe-coloured hair parted in the middle as he looked at the firing squad, suspects like Julian Falk were beaten more often, kept longer in those cells in which one could not stand, sit, nor lie, then, for two weeks in December, all visitors and all letters were forbidden, and newly arrived prisoners were shut off by themselves, and the cellmates, like boys in a dormitory, would sit up till midnight in whispered discussion as to whether this was more vengeance by Snake Dizra, or whether something was happening in the world outside that was too disturbing for the prisoners to know. Chapter 33 When the Falks and John Polycop had been arrested and had joined her father in prison, when such more timid rebels as Mungo Kitterick and Harry Kinderman had been scared away from new underground activities, Mary Greenhill had to take over the control of the Fort Beulah cell, with only Sissy, Father Perefix, Dr. Olmsted and his driver, and half a dozen other agents left, and control it she did, with angry devotion and not too much sense. All she could do was to help in the escape of refugees and to forward such minor anti-corpo news items as she could discover, with Julian gone. The demon that had grown within her ever since her husband had been executed now became a great tumour, and Mary was furious at inaction. Quite gravely she talked about assassinations and long before the day of Mary Greenhill, daughter of Doremus, Gold-armoured tyrants in towers had trembled at the menace of young widows in villages among the dark hills. She wanted, first, to kill Shad Liju who, she did not know, but guessed, had probably done the actual shooting of her husband. But in this small place it might hurt her family even more than they had been hurt. She humorously suggested, before Shad was arrested and murdered, that it would be a pretty piece of espionage for Sissy to go and live with him. The once flippant Sissy, so thin and quiet ever since her Julian had been taken away was certain that Mary had gone mad, and at night was terrified. She remembered how Mary, in the days when she had been a crystal-hard, crystal-bright sportswoman, had with a riding crop beaten a farmer who had tortured a dog. Mary was fed up with the cautiousness of Dr. Olmsted and Father Perefix, men who rather liked a vague state called freedom but did not overmuch care for being lynched. She stormed at them. Call themselves men? Why didn't they go out and do something, at home? She was irritated by her mother who lamented hardly more about Doremus's jailing than she did about the beloved little tables that had been smashed during his arrest. It was equally the blasts about the greatness of a new provincial commissioner, Effingham Swan, in the Corpo Press and Memoranda in the Secret and new reports about his quick death verdicts against prisoners that made her decide to kill this dignitary. Even more than Shad, who had not yet been sent to Trianon, she blamed him for Fowler's fate. She thought it out quite calmly. That was the sort of thinking that the corpos were encouraging among decent homebody women by their program for revitalizing national American pride. Except with babies accompanying mothers, two visitors together were forbidden in the concentration camps. So, when Mary saw Doremus and, in another camp, Buck Titus, in early October, she could only murmur, in almost the same words to each of them, Listen. When I leave you I'll hold up David but, heavens, what a husky lump he's become exclamation mark at the gate so you can see him. 
if anything should ever happen to me, if I should get sick or something, when you get out you'll take care of David won't you, won't you? She was trying to be matter of fact, that they might not worry. She was not succeeding very well, so she drew out, from the small fund which her father had established for her after Fowler's death, enough money for a couple of months, executed a power of attorney by which either her mother or her sister could draw the rest, casually kissed David and Emma and Sissy goodbye, and chatty and gay as she took the train went off to Albany, capital of the northeastern province. The story was that she needed a change and was going to stay near Albany with Fowler's married sister. She did actually stay with her sister-in-law long enough to get her bearings. Two days after her arrival, she went to the new Albany training field of the Corpo Women's Flying Corps and enlisted for lessons in aviation and bombing. When the inevitable war should come, when the government should decide whether it was Canada, Mexico, Russia, Cuba, Japan, or perhaps Staten Island that was menacing her borders, and proceed to defend itself outwards, then the best women flyers of the Corps were to have commissions in an official army auxiliary. The old-fashioned rights granted to women by the liberals might, for their own sakes, be taken from them, but never had they had more right to die in battle. While she was learning, she wrote to her family reassuringly mostly postcards to David, bidding him mind whatever his grandmother said. She lived in a lively boarding house, filled with M.M. officers who knew all about and talked a little about the frequent inspection trips of Commissioner Swan, by aeroplane. She was complimented by quite a number of insulting proposals there. She had driven a car ever since she had been fifteen, in Boston traffic, across the Quebec plains, on Rocky Hill roads in a blizzard, she had made repairs at midnight, and she had an accurate eye, nerves drained outdoors, and the resolute steadiness of a madman evading notice while he plots death. After ten hours of instruction, by an MM aviator who thought the air was as good a place as any to make love in and who could never understand why Mary laughed at him, she made her first solo flight, with an admirable landing. The instructor said, among other things less apropos, that she had no fear, that the one thing she needed for mastery was a little fear. Meantime she was an obedient student in classes in bombing, a branch of culture daily more propagated by the corpos. She was particularly interested in the mill's hand grenade. You pulled out the safety pin, holding the lever against the grenade with your fingers, and tossed. Five seconds after the lever was thus loosened, the grenade exploded and killed a lot of people. It had never been used from planes, but it might be worth trying, thought Mary. MM officers told her that Swan, when a mob of steel workers had been kicked out of a plant and started rioting, had taken command of the peace officers, and himself, they chuckled with admiration of his readiness, hurled such a grenade. It had killed two women and a baby. Mary took her sixth solo flight on a November morning grey and quiet under snow clouds. She had never been very talkative with the ground crew but this morning she said it excited her to think she could leave the ground like a regular angel and shoot up and hang around that unknown wilderness of clouds. She patted a strut of her machine, a high-wing Leonard monoplane with open cockpit, a new and very fast military machine, meant for both pursuit and quick jobs of bombing. Quick jobs of slaughtering a few hundred troops in close formation. At the field, as she had been informed he would. District Commissioner Effingham Swan was boarding his big official cabin plane for a flight presumably into New England. He was tall, a distinguished, military-looking, polo-suggesting dignitary in masterfully simple blue serge with just a light flying helmet. A dozen yes-men buzzed about him secretaries, bodyguards, a chauffeur, a couple of county commissioners, educational directors, labor directors their hats in their hands, their smiles on their faces, their souls wriggling with gratitude to him for permitting them to exist. He snapped at them a good deal and bustled. As he mounted the steps to the cabin, Mary thought of Casey Jones and smiled, a messenger on a tremendous motorcycle blared up with the last telegrams. There seemed to be half a hundred of the yellow envelopes, Mary marveled. He tossed them to the secretary who was humbly creeping after him. The door of the Viceregal coach closed on the commissioner, the secretary, and two bodyguards lumpy with guns. It was said that in his plane Swan had a desk that had belonged to Hitler, and before him to Marat. To Mary, who had just lifted herself up into the cockpit, a mechanic cried, admiringly pointing after Swan's plane as it lurched forward, Gee, what a grand guy that is boss Swan. I hear where he's flying down to Washington to chin with the chief this morning Gee, think of it, with the chief, wouldn't it be awful if somebody took a shot at Mr. Swan and the chief? Might change all history, Mary shouted down, no chance of that. See those guards of his? Say, they could stand off a whole regiment they could lick Walt Throwbridge and all the other communists put together, I guess that's so. Nothing but God shooting down from heaven could reach Mr. Swan, ha, ha. That's good.
But couple days ago I heard where a fellow was saying he figured out God had gone to sleep, maybe it's time for him to wake up. Said Mary, and raised her hand. Her plane had a top of 285 miles an hour Swan's golden chariot had but 230. She was presently flying above and a little behind him. His cabin plane, which had seemed huge as the Queen Mary when she had looked up at its wings spread on the ground, now seemed small as a white dove, wavering above the patchy linoleum that was the ground. She drew from the pockets of her flying jacket the three mills hand grenades she had managed to steal from the school yesterday afternoon. She had not been able to get away with any heavier bomb. As she looked at them, for the first time she shuddered, she became a thing of warmer blood than a mere attachment to the plane, mechanical as the engine, better get it over before I go ladylike, she sighed, and dived at the cabin plane, no doubt her coming was unwelcome. Neither Death nor Mary Greenhill had made a formal engagement with Effingham Swan that morning, neither had telephoned, nor bargained with irritable secretaries, nor been neatly typed down on the great lord's schedule for his last day of life. In his dozen offices, in his marble home, in council hall and royal reviewing stand, his most precious excellence was guarded with steel. He could not be approached by vulgarians like Mary Greenhill save in the air, where emperor and vulgarian alike are upheld only by toy wings and by the grace of God. Three times Mary maneuvered above his plane and dropped a grenade. Each time it missed. The cabin plane was descending, to land, and the guards were shooting up at her. Oh well. She said, and dived bluntly at a bright metal wing. In her last ten seconds she thought how much the wing looked like the zinc washboard which, as a girl, she had seen used by Mrs. Candy's predecessor now what was her name question mark mummy or something. And she wished she had spent more time with David the last few months. And she noticed that the cabin plane seemed rather rushing up at her than she down at it. The crash was appalling. It came just as she was patting her parachute and rising to leap out too late. All she saw was an insane whirligig of smashed wings and huge engines that seemed to have been hurled up into her face. Chapter 34. Speaking of Julian before he was arrested. Probably the new underground headquarters in Montreal found no unusual value in his reports on MM grafting and cruelty and plans for apprehending any agitators. Still, he had been able to warn four or five suspects to escape to Canada. He had had to assist in several floggings. He trembled so that the others laughed at him, and he made his blows suspiciously light. He was set on being promoted to MM District Headquarters in Hanover, and for it he studied typing and shorthand in his free time. He had a beautiful plan of going to that old family friend, Commissioner Francis Tasbro, declaring that he wanted by his own noble qualities to make up to the divine government for his father's disloyalty, and of getting himself made Tasbro's secretary. If he could just peep at Tasbro's private files, then there would be something juicy for Montreal. Sissy and he discussed it exultantly in their leafy rendezvous. For a whole half hour she was able to forget her father and Buck in prison, and what seemed to her something like madness in Mary's increasing restlessness. Just at the end of September she saw Julian suddenly arrested. She was watching a review of M. M's on the green. She might theoretically detest the blue M M uniform as being all that Walt Trowbridge, frequently, called it, the old-time emblem of heroism and the battle for freedom sacrilegiously turned by Windrup and his gang into a symbol of everything that is cruel, tyrannical, and false, but it did not dampen her pride in Julian to see him trim and shiny, and officially set apart as a squad leader commanding his minor army of ten, while the company stood at rest, County Commissioner Shad Liju dashed up in a large car, sprang up, strode to Julian, bellowed, this guy this man is a traitor, tore the MM steering wheel from Julian's collar, struck him in the face, and turned him over to his private gunman, while Julian's mates groaned, guffawed, hissed, and yelped. She was not allowed to see Julian at Trianon. She could learn nothing save that he had not yet been executed. When Mary was killed, and buried as a military heroine, Philip came bumbling up from his Massachusetts judicial circuit. He shook his head a great deal and pursed his lips. I swear, he said to Emma and Sissy though actually he did nothing so wholesome and natural as to swear I swear I'm almost tempted to think, sometimes, that both father and Mary have, or shall I say had, a touch of madness in them. There must be, terrible though it is to say it. But we must face facts in these troublous days, but I honestly think, sometimes, there must be a strain of madness somewhere in our family. Thank God I have escaped it exclamation mark if I have no other virtues, at least I am certainly sane. Even if that may have caused the pater to think I was nothing but mediocre. And of course you are entirely free from it, mater. It's you that must watch yourself, Cecilia. Sissy jumped slightly, not at anything so grateful as being called crazy by Philip, but at being called Cecilia. After all, she admitted, 
that probably was her name, I hate to say it, Cecilia, but I've often thought you had a dangerous tendency to be thoughtless and selfish. Now Mater, as you know, I'm a very busy man, and I simply can't take a lot of time arguing and discussing, but it seems best to me, and I think I can almost say that it seems wise to Merilla, also, that, now that Mary has passed on, you should just close up this big house, or much better, try to rent it, as long as the poor Pater is as long as he's away. I don't pretend to have as big a place as this, but it's ever so much more modern, with gas furnace and up-to-date plumbing and all, and I have one of the first television sets in Rose Lane. I hope it won't hurt your feelings, and as you know, whatever people may say about me, certainly I'm one of the first to believe in keeping up the old traditions, just as poor dear old if Swan was, but at the same time, it seems to me that the old home here is a little on the dreary and old-fashioned side of course I never could persuade the pater to bring it up to date. But anyway, I want Davy and you to come live with us in Worcester, immediately. As for you, sissy, you will course understand that you are entirely welcome, but perhaps you would prefer to do something livelier, such as joining the women's corpo auxiliary. He was, sissy raged, so damned kind to everybody. She couldn't even stir herself to insult him much. She earnestly desired to, when she found that he had brought David an M.M. uniform, and when David put it on and paraded about shouting, like most of the boys he played with, Hail Windrip. She telephoned to Lorinda Pike at Beecher Falls and was able to tell Philip that she was going to help Lorinda in the tea room. Emma and David went off to Worcester at the last moment, at the station, Emma decided to be pretty teary about it, though David begged her to remember that they had Uncle Philip's word for it that Worcester was just the same as Boston, London, Hollywood, and a wild west ranch put together. Sissy stayed to get the house rented. Mrs. Candy, who was going to open her bakery now and who never did inform the impractical Sissy whether or no she was being paid for these last weeks, made for Sissy all the foreign dishes that only Sissy and Doremus cared for, and they not uncheerfully dined together, in the kitchen, so it was Shad's time to swoop. He came blusteringly calling on her, in November. Never had she hated him quite so much, yet never so much feared him, because of what he might do to her father and Julian and Buck and the others in concentration camps, he grunted, well, your boyfriend Jewel, that thought he was so cute, the poor heel, we got all the dope on his double crossing us, all right, he'll never bother you again, he's not so bad, let's forget him, shall I play you something on the piano, sure, shoot, I always did like high class music, said the refined commissioner, lolling on a couch, putting his heels up on a damask chair, in the room where once he had cleaned the fireplace. If it was his serious purpose to discourage Sissy in regard to the anti corpo institution, the dictatorship of the proletariat, he was succeeding even better than Judge Philip Jessop. Sir William Gilbert would have said of Shad that he was so very, very proletarian, she had played for but five minutes when he forgot that he was now refined, and bald, oh, cut out the highbrow stuff and come on and sit down, she stayed on the piano stool. Just what would she do if Shad became violent? There was no Julian to appear melodramatically at the nick-off time and rescue her. Then she remembered Mrs. Candy, in the kitchen, and was content. What the heck you snickering at? Said Shad. Oh I was just thinking about that story you told me about how Mr. Falk bleated when you arrested him. Yeah, that was comical. Old Reverend certainly blatted like a goat. Could she kill him? Would it be wise to kill him? Had Mary meant to kill Swan? Would they be harder on Julian and her father if she killed Shad? Incidentally, did it hurt much to get hanged? He was yawning. Well, sis, oh Lakid, how about you and me taking a little trip to New York in a couple weeks? See some high life. I'll get you the best suit in the best hotel in town, and we'll take in some shows I hear this Gwyn Stalin is a hot number real corpo art and I'll buy you some honest to god champagne wine. And then if we find we like each other enough, I'm willing for us, if you are, to get hitched, but, shad. We could never live on your salary. I mean I mean of course the corpos ought to pay you better mean, even better than they do, listen, baby. I ain't going to have to get along on any miserable county commissioner's salary the rest of my life. Believe me, I'm going to be a millionaire before very long, then he told her, told her precisely the sort of discreditable secret for which she had so long fished in vain. Perhaps it was because he was sober. Shad, when drunk, reversed all the rules and became more peasant-like and cautious with each drink. He had a plan. That plan was as brutal and as infeasible as any plan of Shad lead you for making large money would be. Its essence was that he should avoid manual labor and should make as many persons miserable as possible. It was like his plan, when he was still a hired man, to become wealthy by breeding dogs first stealing the dogs and, 
preferably, the kennels. As county commissioner he had not merely, as was the corpo custom, been bribed by the shopkeepers and professional men for protection against the M. M's. He had actually gone into partnership with them, promising them larger M.M. orders, and, he boasted, he had secret contracts with these merchants all written down and signed and tucked away in his office safe. Sissy got rid of him that evening by being difficult, while letting him assume that the conquest of her would not take more than three or four more days. She cried furiously after he had gone in the comforting presence of Mrs. Candy, who first put away a butcher knife with which, Sissy suspected, she had been standing ready all evening. Next morning Sissy drove to Hanover and shamelessly tattled to Francis Tasbro about the interesting documents Shad had in his safe. She did not ever see Shad lead you again. She was very sick about his being killed. She was very sick about all killing. She found no heroism but only barbaric bestiality in having to kill so that one might so far live as to be halfway honest and kind and secure. But she knew that she would be willing to do it again. The Jessup house was magniloquently rented by that noble Roman, that political Belge, ex-governor Isham Hubbard, who, being tired of again trying to make a living by peddling real estate and criminal law, was pleased to accept the appointment as successor to Shad Lee Jew. Sissy hastened to Beecher Falls and to Lorinda Pike. Father Perefix took charge of the NU cell, merely saying, as he had said daily since Bus Windrup had been inaugurated, that he was fed up with the whole business and was immediately going back to Canada. In fact, on his desk he had a Canadian timetable, it was now two years old. Sissy was in too snappish a state to stand being mothered, being fattened and sobbed over and brightly sent to bed. Mrs. Candy had done only too much of that. And Philip had given her all the parental advice she could endure for a while. It was a relief when Lorinda received her as an adult, as one too sensible to insult by pity received her, in fact, with as much respect as if she were an enemy and not a friend. After dinner, in Lorinda's new tea room, in an aged house which was now empty of guests for the winter except for the constant infestation of whimpering refugees, Lorinda, knitting, made her first mention of the dead Mary. I suppose your sister did intend to kill Swan, eh? I don't know. The corpos didn't seem to think so. They gave her a big military funeral, well, of course, they don't much care to have assassinations talked about and maybe sort of become a general habit. I agree with your father. I think that, in many cases, assassinations are really rather unfortunate a mistake in tactics. No. Not good. Oh, by the way, sissy, I think I'm going to get your further out of concentration camp. What? Lorinda had none of the matrimonial moans of Emma. She was as businesslike as ordering eggs. Yes. I tried everything. I went to see Tasbro. And that educational fellow, Peasley. Nothing doing. They want to keep Doema sin. But that rat, Arasdeli, is at Trianon as guard now. I'm bribing him to help your father escape. We'll have the man here for Christmas, only kind of late, and sneak him into Canada. Oh. Said Sissy. A few days afterward, Reading a coded new underground telegram which apparently dealt with the delivery of furniture, Lorinda shrieked, Sissy. All you know what has busted loose. In Washington. Lee Saracen has deposed Bus Windrup and grabbed the dictatorship, oh. Said Sissy, Chapter 35. In his two years of dictatorship, Basilius Windrup daily became more a miser of power. He continued to tell himself that his main ambition was to make all citizens healthy, in purse and mind and that if he was brutal it was only toward fools and reactionaries who wanted the old clumsy systems. But after 18 months of presidency he was angry that Mexico and Canada and South America, obviously his own property, by manifest destiny, should curtly answer his curt diplomatic notes and show no helpfulness about becoming part of his inevitable empire, and daily he wanted louder, more convincing yeses from everybody about him. How could he carry on his heartbreaking labor if nobody ever encouraged him? He demanded. Anyone, from Saracen to entire office messenger, who did not play valet to his ego he suspected of plotting against him. He constantly increased his bodyguard, and as constantly distrusted all his guards and discharged them, and once took a shot at a couple of them, so that in all the world he had no companion save his old aide Lee Saracen, and perhaps Hector McGoblin, to whom he could talk easily. He felt lonely in the hours when he wanted to shuck off the duties of despotism along with his shoes and his fine new coat. He no longer went out racketing. His cabinet begged him not to clown in barrooms and lodge entertainments, it was not dignified, and it was dangerous to be too near to strangers, so he played poker with his bodyguard, late at night, and at such times drank too much, and he cursed them and glared with bulging eyes whenever he lost, which, for all the goodwill of his guards about letting him win, 
had to be often, because he pinched their salaries badly and locked out the spoons. He had become as unbouncing and unbuzzing a buzz as might be, and he did not know it. All the while he loved the people just as much as he feared and detested persons, and he planned to do something historic. Certainly. He would give each family that $5,000 a year just as soon now as he could arrange it. And Lee Saracen, forever making his careful lists, as patient at his desk as he was pleasure-hungry on the couch at midnight parties, was beguiling officials to consider him their real lord and the master of corpism. He kept his promises to them, while Windrup always forgot. His office door became the door of ambition. In Washington, the reporters privily spoke of this assistant secretary and that general as Saracen men. His clique was not a government within a government, it was the government itself, minus the megaphones. He had the Secretary of Corporations, a former Vice President of the American Federation of Labor, coming to him secretly every evening, to report on labor politics and in especial on such proletarian leaders as were dissatisfied with Windrup as chief that is, with their own share in the swag. He had from the Secretary of the Treasury, though this functionary, one Webster Skittle, was not a lieutenant of Saracen but merely friendly confidential reports on the affairs of those large employers who, since under corporism it was usually possible for a millionaire to persuade the judges in the labor arbitration courts to look at things reasonably, rejoiced that with strikes outlawed and employers regarded as state officials, they would now be in secure power forever. Saracen knew the quiet ways in which these reinforced industrial barons used arrests by the M. M's to get rid of troublemakers, particularly of Jewish radicals a Jewish radical being a Jew with nobody working for him. Some of the barons were themselves Jews, it is not to be expected that race loyalty should be carried so insanely far as to weaken the pocketbook. The allegiance of all such Negroes is had the sense to be content with safety and good pay instead of ridiculous yearnings for personal integrity Saracen got by being photographed shaking hands with the celebrated Negro fundamentalist clergyman, the Reverend Dr. Alexander Nibbs, and through the highly publicized Saracen prizes for the Negroes with the largest families, the fastest time in floor scrubbing and the longest periods of work without taking a vacation. No danger of our good friends, the Negroes, turning red when they're encouraged like that, Saracen announced to the newspapers. It was a satisfaction to Saracen that in Germany, all military bands were now playing his national song, Buzz and Buzz along with the Horst Vessel hymn. For, though he had not exactly written the music as well as the words, the music was now being attributed to him abroad. As a bank clerk might, quite rationally, worry equally over the whereabouts of a hundred million dollars worth of the bank's bonds, and of ten cents of his own lunch money, so Buzz Windrup worried equally over the welfare that is, the obedience to himself of a hundred and thirty odd million American citizens and the small matter of the moods of Lee Saracen, whose approval of him was the one real fame. His wife Windrup did not see oftener than once a week, and anyway, what that rustic wench thought was unimportant, the diabolic Hector McGoblin frightened him. Secretary of War Luthorne and Vice President Pearly Beecroft he liked well enough, but they bored him, they smacked too much of his own small town boyhood, to escape which he was willing to take the responsibilities of a nation. It was the incalculable Lee Saracen on whom he depended, and the Lee with whom he had gone fishing and boozing and once, even, murdering, who had seemed his own self made more sure and articulate, had thoughts now which he could not penetrate. Lee's smile was a veil, not a revelation, it was to discipline Lee, with the hope of bringing him back that when Buzz replaced the amiable but clumsy Colonel Luthorne as Secretary of War by Colonel Dewey Hake, Commissioner of the Northeastern Province, Buzz's characteristic comment was that Luthorne was not pulling his weight, he also gave to Hake the position of High Marshal of the M. M's, which Lee had held along with a dozen other officers. From Lee he expected an explosion, then repentance and a new friendship. But Lee only said, very well, if you wish, and said it coldly, just how could he get Lee to be a good boy and come play with him again? Wistfully wondered the man who now and then planned to be emperor of the world, he gave Lee a thousand dollar television set. Even more coldly did Lee thank him, and never spoke afterward of how well he might be receiving the still shaky television broadcasts on his beautiful new set, as Dewey Hake took hold, doubling efficiency in both the regular army and the minute men, he was a demon for all night practice marches in heavy order, and the files could not complain, because he set the example, Buzz began to wonder whether Hake might not be his new confidant. He really would hate to throw Lee into prison, but still, Lee was so thoughtless about hurting his feelings, when he'd gone and done so much for him and all, Buzz was confused. He was the more confused when Pearly Beecroft came in and briefly said that he was sick of all this bloodshed and was going home to the farm, and as for his lofty vice-presidential office, Buzz knew what he could do with it, were these vast national dissensions no different from squabbles in his father's drugstore. Fretted Buzz. 
he couldn't very well have Beecroft shot, it might cause criticism. But it was indecent, it was sacrilegious to annoy an emperor, and in his irritation he had an ex-senator and twelve workmen who were in concentration camps taken out and shot on the charge that they had told irreverent stories about him. Secretary of State Saracen was saying goodnight to President Windrup in the hotel suite where Windrup really lived. No newspaper had dared mention it, but Buzz was both bothered by the stateliness of the White House and frightened by the number of Reds and Cranks and anti-corpos who, with the most commendable patience and ingenuity, tried to sneak into that historic mansion and murder him. Buzz merely left his wife there, for show, and, except at great receptions, never entered any part of the White House save the office annex. He liked this hotel suite, he was a sensible man, who preferred straight bourbon, codfish cakes, and deep leather chairs to burgundy, trout bleu, and Louis Quinn's. In this twelve-room apartment, occupying the entire tenth floor of a small unnotorious hotel, he had for himself only a plain bedroom, a huge living room which looked like a combination of office and hotel lobby, a large liquor closet, another closet with thirty-seven suits of clothes, and a bathroom with jars and jars of the pine-flavored bath salts which were his only cosmetic luxury. Buzz might come home in a suit dazzling as a horse blanket, one considered in alfalfa center a triumph of London tailoring, but, once safe, he liked to put on his red Morocco slippers that were down at the heel and display his red suspenders and baby blue sleeve garters. To feel correct in those decorations, he preferred the hotel atmosphere that, for so many years before he had ever seen the White House, had been as familiar to him as his ancestral corn cribs and main streets. The other ten rooms of the suite, entirely shutting his own off from the corridors and elevators, were filled night and day with guards. To get through to Buzz in this intimate place of his own was very much like visiting a police station for the purpose of seeing a homicidal prisoner. Haig seems to me to be doing a fine job in the war department, Lee, said the president. Of course you know if you ever want the job of High Marshal back, I'm quite satisfied, said the great Secretary of State, what do you think of having Colonel Luthorne back to help Haig out? He's pretty good on full details. Saracen looked as nearly embarrassed as the self-satisfied Lee Saracen ever could look. Why, R.A. supposed you knew it. Luthorne was liquidated in the purge ten days ago, good God. Luthorne killed? Why didn't I know it? It was thought better to keep it quiet. He was a pretty popular man. But dangerous. Always talking about Abraham Lincoln, so I just never know anything about what's going on. Why, even the newspaper clippings are pre-digested. By God, before I see M, it's thought better not to bother you with minor details, boss. You know that. Of course, if you feel I haven't organized your staff correctly, or now, don't fly off the handle, Lee. I just meant of course I know how hard you've tried to protect me so I could give all my brains to the higher problems of state. But Luthor and I kind of liked him. He always had quite a funny line when we played poker. Buzz Windrup felt lonely, as once a certain Chad Leeju had felt in a hotel suite that differed from Buzz's only in being smaller. To forget it he bawled, very brightly, Lee, do you ever wonder what'll happen in the future? Why, I think you and I may have mentioned it. But golly, just think of what might happen in the future, Lee. Think of it. Why, we may be able to pull off a North American kingdom. Buzz half meant it seriously or perhaps quarter meant it. How'd you like to be Duke of Georgia or Grand Duke, or whatever they call a grand exalted ruler of the Elks in this peerage business? And then how about an empire of North and South America after that? I might make you a king under me, then say something like king of Mexico. How'd you like that? Be very amusing, said Lee mechanically as Lee always did say the same thing mechanically whenever Buzz repeated this same nonsense. But you got to stick by me and not forget all I've done for you, Lee, don't forget that, I never forget anything. By the way, we ought to liquidate, or at least imprison, Pearlie Beecroft, too. He's still technically vice president of the United States, and if the lousy traitor managed some skullduggery so as to get you killed or deposed, he might be regarded by some narrow-minded literalists as president. No, no, no. He's my friend, no matter what he says about me. The dirty dog. Wailed Buzz. All right. You're the boss. Ignite, said Lee, and returned from this plumber's dream of paradise to his own golden black and apricot silk bower in Georgetown which he shared with several handsome young M.M. officers. They were savage soldiers, yet apartment at music and at poetry. With them, he was not in the least passionless, as he seemed now to Buzz Windrip. He was either angry with his young friends, and then he whipped them, or he was in a paroxysm of apology to them, and caressed their wounds. Newspaper men who had once seemed to be his friends said that he had traded the green eye shade for a wreath of violets. At cabinet meeting, 
Late in 1938, Secretary of State Saracen revealed to the heads of the government disturbing news. Vice President Beecroft and had he not told them the man should have been shot question mark had fled to Canada, renounced corporism, and joined Walt Trowbridge in plotting. There were bubbles from an almost boiling rebellion in the Middle West and Northwest, especially in Minnesota and the Dakotas, where agitators, some of them formerly of political influence, were demanding that their states secede from the corporate union and form a cooperative, indeed almost socialistic, commonwealth of their own, rats. Just a lot of irresponsible windbags, cheered President Windrip. Why? I thought you were supposed to be the camera I'd gink that kept up on everything that goes on, Lee. You forget that I myself, personally, made a special radio address to that particular section of the country last week. And I got a wonderful reaction. The Middle Westerners are absolutely loyal to me. They appreciate what I've been trying to do, not answering him at all, Saracen demanded that, in order to bring and hold all elements in the country together by that useful patriotism which always appears upon threat of an outside attack, the government immediately arranged to be insulted and menaced in a well-planned series of deplorable incidents on the Mexican border, and declare war on Mexico as soon as America showed that it was getting hot and patriotic enough. Secretary of the Treasury Skittle and Attorney General Porkwood shook their heads, but Secretary of War Hake and Secretary of Education McGoblin agreed with Saracen high-mindedly. Once, pointed out the learned McGoblin, governments had merely let themselves slide into a war, thanking Providence for having provided a conflict as a febrifuge against internal discontent, but of course, in this age of deliberate, planned propaganda, a really modern government like theirs must figure out what brand of war they had to sell and plan the selling campaign consciously. Now, as for him, he would be willing to leave the whole setup to the advertising genius of Brother Saracen. No, 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 cried Windrip. We're not ready for a war. Of course, we'll take Mexico some day. It's our destiny to control it and Christianize it. But I'm scared that your dance scheme might work just opposite to what you say. You put arms into the hands of too many irresponsible folks, and they might use em and turn against you and start a revolution and throw the whole darn gang of us out. No, no. I've often wondered if the whole Minutemen business, with their arms and training, may not be a mistake. That was your idea, Lee, not mine, Saracen spoke evenly, my dear Buzz, one day you thank me for originating that great crusade of citizen soldiers defending their homes as you love to call it on the radio and the next day you almost ruin your clothes, you're so scared of them. Make up your mind one way or the other, Saracen walked out of the room, not bowing. Windrup complained, I'm not going to stand for Lee's talking to me like that. Why, the dirty double-crosser, I made him. One of these days, he'll find a new Secretary of State around this joint. I suppose he thinks jobs like that grow on every tree. Maybe he'd like to be a bank president or something I mean, maybe he'd like to be Emperor of England. President Windrup, in his hotel bedroom, was awakened late at night by the voice of a guard in the outer room, you, sure, let him pass he's the Secretary of State. Nervously the president clicked on his bedside lamp. He had needed it lately, to read himself to sleep. In that limited glow he saw Lee Saracen, Dewey Hake, and Dr. Hector McGoblin march to the side of his bed. Lee's thin sharp face was like flour. His deep buried eyes were those of a sleepwalker. His skinny right hand held a bowie knife which, as his hand deliberately rose, was lost in the dimness. Windrup swiftly thought, sure would be hard to know where to buy a dagger, in Washington, and Windrup thought. All this is the dog and a dist foolishness just like a movie or one of these old history books when you were a kid, and Windrup thought, all in that same flash, good God, I'm going to be killed, he cried out, Lee. You couldn't do that to me, Lee grunted, like one who has detected a bad smell. Then the Basilius Windrup who could, incredibly, become president really awoke, Lee. Do you remember the time when your old mother was so sick, and I gave you my last cent and loaned you my fliver so you could go see her? and I hitchhiked to my next meeting? Lee, hell. I suppose so. General, yes. Answered Dewey Hake, not very pleasantly, I think we'll stick him on a destroyer or something and let him sneak off to France or England. The lousy coward seems afraid to die. Of course, we'll kill him if he ever does dare to come back to the States. Take him out and phone the Secretary of the Navy for a boat and get him on it, will you? Very well, sir, said Hake, even less pleasantly, it had been easy. The troops, who obeyed Hake, as Secretary of War, had occupied all of Washington. Ten days later Buzz Windrup was landed in Havre and went sighingly to Paris. It was his first view of Europe except for one 21-day cook's tour. He was profoundly homesick for Chesterfield cigarettes, 
flapjacks, moon mullins, and the sound of some real human being saying you, what's biting you? Instead of this perpetual sappy ooh, in Paris he remained, though he became the sort of minor hero of tragedy, like the ex-king of Greece, Kierinsky, the Russian Grand Dukes, Jimmy Walker, and a few ex-presidents from South America and Cuba, who is delighted to accept invitations to drawing rooms where the champagne is good enough and one may have a chance of finding people, now and then, who will listen to one's story and say sir. At that, though, Buzz chuckled. He had kinda put it over on those crooks, for during his two sweet years of despotism he had sent four million dollars abroad, to secret, safe accounts. And so Buzz Windrup passed into wobbly paragraphs in recollections by ex-diplomatic gentlemen with monocles. In what remained of ex-president Windrup's life, everything was ex. He was even so far forgotten that only four or five American students tried to shoot him. The more dull settly they had once advised and flattered Buzz, the more ardently did most of his former followers, Mugablin and Senator Porkwood and Dr. Amaruk Trout and the rest, turn in loud allegiance to the new president, the Honorable Lee Saracen. He issued a proclamation that he had discovered that Windrup had been embezzling the people's money and plotting with Mexico to avoid war with that guilty country, and that he, Saracen, in quite alarming grief and reluctance, since he more than anyone else had been deceived by his supposed friend, Windrup, had yielded to the urging of the cabinet and taken over the presidency, instead of Vice President Beecroft. The exiled traitor, President Saracen immediately began appointing the fancier of his young officer friends to the most responsible offices in state and army. It amused him, seemingly, to shock people by making a pink-cheeked, moist-eyed boy of twenty-five commissioner of the federal district, which included Washington and Maryland. Was he not supreme, was he not semi-divine, like a Roman emperor? Could he not defy all the muddy mob that he, once a socialist, had, for its weak shiftlessness, come to despise? Would that the American people had just one neck? He plagiarized, among his laughing boys, in the decorous White House of Coolidge and Harrison and Rutherford Birchard Hayes he had orgies, an old name for parties, with weaving limbs and garlands and wine in pretty fair imitations of Roman beakers. It was hard for imprisoned men like Doremus Jessup to believe it, but there were some tens of thousands of corpos, in the M. M's, in civil service, in the army, and just in private ways, to whom Saracen's flippant regime was tragic. They were the idealists of corporism, and there were plenty of them, along with the bullies and swindlers, they were the men and women who, in 1935 and 1936, had turned to Windrup and Co., not as perfect, but as the most probable saviors of the country from, on one hand, domination by Moscow and, on the other hand, the slack indolence, the lack of decent pride of half the American youth, whose world, these idealists asserted, was composed of shiftless distaste for work and refusal to learn anything thoroughly, of blatting dance music on the radio, maniac automobiles, slobbering sexuality, the humor and art of comic strips of a slave psychology which was making America a land for sterner men to loot, General Emmanuel Kuhn was one of the corpo idealists, such men did not condone the murders under the corpo regime, but they insisted, this is a revolution, and after all, when in all history has there been a revolution with so little bloodshed? They were aroused by the pageantry of corporism, enormous demonstrations, with the red and black flags of flaunting magnificence like storm clouds. They were proud of new corpo roads, hospitals, television stations, aeroplane lines, they were touched by processions of the corpo youth, whose faces were exalted with pride in the myths of corpo heroism and clean Spartan strength and the semi-divinity of the all-protectant father, President Windrip. They believed, they made themselves believe, that in Windrup had come alive again the virtues of Andy Jackson and Farragut and Jeb Stewart, in place of the mob cheapness of the professional athletes who had been the only heroes of 1935, they planned, these idealists, to correct, as quickly as might be, the errors of brutality and crookedness among officials. They saw arising a corpo art, a corpo learning, profound and real, divested of the traditional snobbishness of the old-time universities, valiant with youth and only the more beautiful in that it was useful. They were convinced that corporism was communism cleansed of foreign domination and the violence and indignity of mob dictatorship, monarchism with the chosen hero of the people for monarch, fascism without grasping and selfish leaders, freedom with order and discipline, traditional America without its waste and provincial cockiness. Like all religious zealots, they had blessed capacity for blindness, and they were presently convinced that, since the only newspapers they ever read certainly said nothing about it, there were no more of blood-smeared cruelties in court and concentration camp, no restrictions of speech or thought. They believed that they never criticized the corporate regime not because they were censored, but because that sort of thing was, like obscenity, 
such awfully bad form, and these idealists were as shocked and bewildered by Saracen's coup d'etat against Windrup as was Mr. Basilius Windrup himself. The grim Secretary of War, Haig, scolded at President Saracen for his influence on the nation, particularly on the troops. Lee laughed at him. But once he was sufficiently flattered by Haig's tribute to his artistic powers to write a poem for him. It was a poem which was later to be sung by millions, it was, in fact, the most popular of the soldiers' ballads which were to spring automatically from anonymous soldier bards during the war between the United States and Mexico. Only, being as pious a believer in modern advertising as Saracen himself, the efficient Hay wanted to encourage the spontaneous generation of these patriotic folks' ballads by providing the automatic springing and the anonymous bard. He had as much foresight, as much prophetic engineering, as a motor car manufacturer, Saracen was as eager for war with Mexico, or Ethiopia or Siam or Greenland or any other country that would provide his pet young painters with a chance to portray Saracen being heroic amid curious vegetation, as Hake, not only to give malcontents something outside the country to be cross about, but also to give himself a chance to be picturesque. He answered Hake's request by writing a rollicking military chorus at a time while the country was still theoretically entirely friendly with Mexico. It went to the tune of Mademoiselle from Armenti Ears or Armentiers. If the Spanish in it was a little shaky, still, millions were later to understand that Habla Oa stood for inverted question mark Habla Stid, signifying Parle's vows. It ran thus, as it came from Saracen's purple but smoking typewriter. Senorita from Guadeloupe, Kiastid, Senorita go roll your hoop. Or come to bed, Senorita from Guadeloupe, if Padre sees us we're in the soup. Hinky, Dinky, Habla Oa, Senorita from Monterey. Savvy Yank, Senorita what's that you say, you're Swede, eight Ank, but Senorita from Monterey. You won't Habla when we hit the hay. Hinky, Dinky, Habla Oa, Senorita from Mazatlan. Once we've met, you'll smile all over your khaki pan. You won't forget, for days you'll holler, oh, what a man, and you'll never marry a Mexican, hinky, dinky, Habla oa. If at times President Saracen seemed flippant, he was not at all so during his part in the scientific preparation for war which consisted in rehearsing MM choruses and trolling out the city with well-trained spontaneity. His friend Hector McGoblin, now Secretary of State, told Saracen that this manly chorus was one of his greatest creations. McGoblin though personally he did not join in Saracen's somewhat unusual midnight diversions, was amused by them, and he often told Saracen that he was the only original creative genius among this whole bunch of stuffed shirts, including Haig, you want to watch that Gus Haig, Lee, said McGiblin. He's ambitious, he's a gorilla, and he's a pious Puritan, and that's a triple combination I'm scared of. The troops like him, rats. He has no attraction for them. He's just an accurate military bookkeeper, said Saracen. That night he had a party at which, for a novelty, rather shocking to his intimates, he actually had girls present, performing certain curious dances. The next morning Haig rebuked him, Ian Saracen had a hangover was stormed at. That night, just a month after Saracen had usurped the presidency, Haig struck. There was no melodramatic dagger and uplifted arm business about it, this time though Haig did traditionally come late, for all fascists, like all drunkards, seem to function most vigorously at night. Haig marched into the White House with his picked storm troops, found President Saracen in violet silk pajamas among his friends, shot Saracen and the most of his companions dead, and proclaimed himself president. Hector McGoblin fled by aeroplane to Cuba, then on. When last seen, he was living high up in the mountains of Haiti, wearing only a singlet, dirty white drill trousers, grass sandals, and a long tan beard, very healthy and happy, occupying a one-room hut with a lovely native girl practicing modern medicine and studying ancient voodoo. When Dewey Haig became president, then America really did begin to suffer a little, and to long for the good old democratic, liberal days of Windrup. Windrup and Saracen had not minded mirth and dancing in the streets so long as they could be suitably taxed. Haig disliked such things on principle. Except, perhaps, that he was an atheist in theology, he was a strict orthodox Christian. He was the first to tell the populace that they were not going to get any $5,000 a year but, instead, reap the profits of discipline and of the scientific totalitarian state not in mere paper figures but in vast dividends of pride, patriotism, and power. He kicked out of the army all officers who could not endure marching and going thirsty, and out of the civil branch all commissioners including one Francis Tasbro who had garnered riches too easily and too obviously. He treated the entire nation like a well-run plantation on which the slaves were better fed than formerly, 
less often cheated by their overseers, and kept so busy that they had time only for work and for sleep, and thus fell rarely into the debilitating vices of laughter, song, except war songs against Mexico, complaint, or thinking. Under Hake there were less floggings in MM posts and in concentration camps, for by his direction officers were not to waste time in the sport of beating persons, men, women, or children, who asserted that they didn't care to be slaves on even the best plantation, but just to shoot them out of hand, Haig made such use of the clergy Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, and liberal agnostic as Windrup and Saracen never had. While there were plenty of ministers who, like Mr. Falk and Father Stephen Perefix, like Cardinal Fallhaber and Pastor Niemöller in Germany, considered it some part of Christian duty to resent the enslavement and torture of their appointed flocks, there were also plenty of reverend celebrities, particularly large city pastors whose sermons were reported in the newspapers every Monday morning, to whom corporism had given a chance to be noisily and lucratively patriotic. These were the chaplains at heart, who, if there was no war in which they could humbly help to purify and comfort the poor brave boys who were fighting, were glad to help provide such a war. These more practical shepherds, since like doctors and lawyers they were able to steal secrets out of the heart, became valued spies during the difficult months after February, 1939 when Hake was working up war with Mexico. Canada? Japan? Russia? They would come later, for even with an army of slaves, it was necessary to persuade them that they were freemen and fighters for the principle of freedom, or otherwise the scoundrels might cross over and join the enemy. So reigned the good King Hake, and if there was anyone in all the land who was discontented, you never heard him speak not twice. And in the White House, where under Saracen shameless youths had danced, under the new reign of righteousness and the black jack, Mrs. Hake, a lady with eyeglasses and a smile of resolute cordiality, gave to the WCTU, the YWCA, and the Ladies' League Against Red Radicalism, and their inherently incidental husbands, a magnified and hand-colored Washington version of just such parties as she had once given in the Hake Bungalow in Atlantine, Oregon, Chapter 36. The ban on information at the Triamon camp had been raised, Mrs. Candy had come calling on door Emus complete with coconut layer cake and he had heard of Mary's death the departure of Emma and Sissy, the end of Windrup and Saracen. And none of it seemed in the least real not half so real and, except for the fact that he would never see Mary again, not half so important as the increasing number of lice and rats in their cell. During the ban, they had celebrated Christmas by laughing, not very cheerfully, at the Christmas tree Carl Pascal had contrived out of a spruce bow and tin foil from cigarette packages. They had hummed stin act softly in the darkness, and Doremus had thought of all their comrades in political prisons in America, Europe, Japan, India. But Cal, apparently, thought of comrades only if they were saved, baptized communists. And, forced together as they were in a cell, the growing bitterness and orthodox piety of Cal became one of Doremus's most hateful woes, a tragedy to be blamed upon the corpos, or upon the principle of dictatorship in general, as savagely as the deaths of Mary and Dan Wilgers and Henry Vida. Under persecution, Carl lost no ounce of his courage and his ingenuity in bamboozling the MM guards, but day by day he did steadily lose all his humor, his patience, his tolerance, his easy companionship, and everything else that made life endurable to men packed in a cell. The communism that had always been his King Charles's head, sometimes amusing, became a religious bigotry as hateful to Doremus as the old bigotries of the Inquisition or the fundamentalist Protestants, that attitude of slaughtering to save men's souls from which the Jessup family had escaped during these last three generations. It was impossible to get away from Carl's increasing zeal. He chattered on at night for an hour after all the other five had growled, Oh, shut up. I want to sleep. You'll be making a corpo out of me. Sometimes, in his proselytizing, he conquered. When his cellmates had long enough cursed the camp guards, Carl would rebuke them, you're a lot too simple when you explain everything by saying that the corpos, especially the M. M's, are all fiends. Plenty of M are. But even the worst of M, even the professional gunmen in the M M ranks, don't get as much satisfaction out of punishing us heretics as the honest, dumb corpos who've been misled by their leaders mouthing about freedom, order, security, discipline, strength. All those swell words that even before Windrup came in the speculators started using to protect their profits. Especially how they used the word liberty. Liberty to steal the diddies off the babies. I tell you, an honest man gets sick when he hears the word liberty today, after what the Republicans did to it. And I tell you that a lot of the MM guards right here at Trianon are just as unfortunate as we are a lot of them are just poor devils that couldn't get decent work, 
Back in the golden age of Frank Roosevelt bookkeepers that had to dig ditches, auto agents that couldn't sell cars and went sour, ex louis in the Great War that came back to find their jobs pinched off them and that followed Windrip, quite honestly, because they thought, the saps, that when he said security he meant security. They'll learn. And having admirably discoursed for another hour on the perils of self-righteousness among the corpos, Comrade Pascal would change the subject and discourse upon the glory of self-righteousness among the communists particularly upon those sanctified examples of communism who lived in bliss in the holy city of Moscow, where, Doremus judged, the streets were paved with unappreciable rubles, the holy city of Moscow. Karl looked upon it with exactly such uncritical and slightly hysterical adoration as other sectarians had in their day devoted to Jerusalem, Mecca, Rome, Canterbury, and Benes. Fine, all right, thought Doemus. Let him worship their sacred fonts it was as good a game as any for the mentally retarded. Only, why then should they object to his considering a sacred Fort Beulah, or New York, or Oklahoma City? Carl once fell into a froth because Doemus wondered if the iron deposits in Russia were all they might be. Why certainly. Russia, being holy Russia, must, as a useful part of its holiness, have sufficient iron, and Carl needed no mineralogist's reports but only the blissful eye of faith to know it. He did not mind Carl's worshipping holy Russia. But Carl did, using the word naive, which is the favourite word and just possibly the only word known to communist journalists, derisively mind when Doremus had a mild notion of worshipping holy America. Carl spoke often of photographs in the Moscow news of nearly naked girls on Russian bathing beaches as proving the triumph and joy of the workers under Bolshevism, but he regarded precisely the same sort of photographs of nearly naked girls on Long Island bathing beaches as proving the degeneration of the workers under capitalism. As a newspaper man, Doremus remembered that the only reporters who misrepresented and concealed facts more unscrupulously than the capitalists were the communists. He was afraid that the world struggle today was not of communism against fascism, but of tolerance against the bigotry that was preached equally by communism and fascism. But he saw too that in America this struggle was befogged by the fact that the worst fascists were they who disowned the word fascism and preached enslavement to capitalism under the style of constitutional and traditional Native American liberty. For they were thieves not only of wages but of honor. To their purpose they could quote not only scripture but Jefferson that Karl Pascal should be turning into a zealot, like most of his chiefs in the Communist Party, was grievous to Doremus because he had once simple-heartedly hoped that in the mass strength of communism there might be an escape from cynical dictatorship. But he saw now that he must remain alone, a liberal, scorned by all the noisier prophets for refusing to be a willing cat for the busy monkeys of either side. But at worst, the liberals, the tolerant, might in the long run preserve some of the arts or civilization no matter which brand of tyranny should finally dominate the world. More and more, as I think about history, he pondered, I am convinced that everything that is worthwhile in the world has been accomplished by the free, inquiring, critical spirit, and that the preservation of this spirit is more important than any social system whatsoever. But the men of ritual and the men of barbarism are capable of shutting up the men of science and of silencing them forever. Yes, this was the worst thing the enemies of honor, the pirate industrialists and then their suitable successors, the corpos with their black jacks, had done, it had turned the brave, the generous, the passionate and half-literate Karl Pascals into dangerous fanatics. And how well they had done it. Doremus was uncomfortable with Karl. He felt that his next turn in jail might be under the wardenship of none other than Karl himself, as he remembered how the Bolsheviks, once in power, had the most smugly imprisoned and persecuted those great women. Spiridonova and Breshkovskaya and Ismailovich, who, by their conspiracies against the Tsar, their willingness to endure Siberian torture on behalf of freedom for the masses, had the most brought on the revolution by which the Bolsheviks were able to take control and not only again forbid freedom to the masses, but this time inform them that, anyway, freedom was just a damn silly bourgeois superstition, so Doremus, sleeping two and a half feet above his old companion, felt himself in a cell within a cell. Henry Vida and Clarence Little and Victor Loveland and Mr. Falk were gone now, and to Julian, penned in solitary, he could not speak once a month. He yearned for escape with a desire that was near to insanity. Awake and asleep it was his obsession, and he thought his heart had stopped when squad leader Arasdili muttered to him, as Doremus was scrubbing a lavatory floor, say. Listen, Mr. Jessup. Miss Pike is fixing it up and I'm going to help you escape just soon as things is right. It was a question of the guards on sentry go outside the quadrangle. As sweeper, Doremus was reasonably free to leave his cell, and Arras had loosened the boards and barbed wire at the end of one of the alleys leading from the quadrangle between buildings. But outside, 
He was likely to be shot by a guard on sight, for a week Arrows watched. He knew that one of the night guards had a habit of getting drunk, which was forgiven him because of his excellence in flogging troublemakers but which was regarded by the more judicious as rather regrettable. And for that week Arrows fed the guard's habit on Lorinda's expense money, and was indeed so devoted to his duties that he was himself twice carried to bed. Snake Disra grew interested but Snake also, after the first couple of drinks, liked to be democratic with his men and to sing the old spinning wheel. Arras confided to Doremus, Miss Pike she don't dast send you a note, lest somebody get hold of it, but she says to me to tell you not to tell anybody you're going to take a sneak, or it'll get out. So on the evening when Arras jerked a head at him from the corridor, then rasped, surly seeming, hear you, Jessup you left one of the cans all dirty. Doremus looked mildly at the cell that had been his home and study and tabernacle for six months, glanced at Carl Pascal reading in his bunk slowly waving a shoeless foot in a sock with the end of it gone, at Truman Webb darning the seat of his pants, noted the grey smoke in filmy tilting layers about the small electric bulb in the ceiling, and silently stepped out into the corridor. The late January night was foggy. Arrows handed him a worn MM overcoat, whispered, third alley on right, moving van on corner opposite the church, and was gone. On hands and knees Doremus briskly crawled under the loosened barbed wire at the end of the small alley and carelessly stepped out, along the road. The only guard in sight was at a distance, and he was wavering in his gait. A block away, a furniture van was jacked up while the driver and his helper painfully prepared to change one of the tremendous tires. In the light of a corner arc, Doremus saw that the driver was that same hard-faced long-distance cruiser who had carried bundles of tracts for the new underground. The driver grunted, get in hustle. Doremus crouched between a bureau and a wing chair inside. Instantly he felt the tilted body of the van dropping, as the driver pulled out the jack, and from the seat he heard, All right. We're off. Crawl up behind me here and listen, Mr. Jessup. Can you hear me? The M. M's don't take so much trouble to prevent you gents and respectable fellows from escaping. They figure that most of you are too scary to try out anything, once you're away from your offices and front porches and sedans but I guess you may be different, some ways, Mr. Jessup. Besides, they figure that if you do escape, they can pick you up easy afterwards, because you ain't on to hiding out, like a regular fellow that's been out of work sometimes and maybe gone on the bum. But don't worry. We'll get you through. I tell you, there's nobody got friends like a revolutionist. And enemies, then first did it come to Doremus that, by sentence of the late lamented Effingham Swan, he was subject to the death penalty for escaping. But oh, what the hell? He grunted, like Carl Pascal, and he stretched in the luxury of mobility, in that galloping furniture truck, he was free. He saw the lights of villages going by. Once, he was hidden beneath hay in a barn, again, in a spruce grove high on a hill, and once he slept overnight on top of a coffin in the establishment of an undertaker. He walked secret paths. He rode in the back of an itinerant medicine peddler's garand, concealed in fur cap and high-collared fur coat in the sidecar of an underground worker serving as an M.M. squad leader. From this he dismounted, at the driver's command, in front of an obviously untenanted farmhouse on a snaky back road between Manadnock Mountain and the Everill Lake save very slatten of an old unpainted farmhouse, with sinking roof and snow up to the frowsy windows. It seemed a mistake, Doremus knocked, as the motorcycle snarled away, and the door opened on Lorinda Pike and Sissy, crying together, Oh, my dear, he could only mutter, Well, when they had made him strip off his fur coat in the farmhouse living room, a room with peeling wallpaper, and altogether bare except for a cot, two chairs, a table, the two moaning women saw a small man, his face dirty, pasty, and sunken as by tuberculosis, his once fussily trimmed beard and moustache ragged as wisps of hay, his overlong hair a rustic jag at the back, his clothes ripped and filthy and old, sick, discouraged tramp. He dropped on a straight chair and stared at them. Maybe they were genuine maybe they really were the maybe he was, as it seemed, in heaven, looking at the two principal angels, but he had been so often fooled so cruelly in his visions these dreary months. He sobbed, and they comforted him with softly stroking hands and not too confoundedly much babble, I've got a hot bath for you, and I'll scrub your back, and then some hot chicken soup and ice cream, as though one should say, the Lord God awaits you on his throne and all whom you bless shall be blessed, and all your enemies brought to their knees. Those sainted women had actually had a long tin tub fetched to the kitchen of the old house, filled it with water heated in kettle and dishpan on the stove, and provided brushes, soap, a vast sponge, and such a long caressing bath towel as Doremus had forgotten existed. 
and somehow, from Fort Beulah, Sissy had brought plenty of his own shoes and shirts and three suits that now seemed to him fit for royalty. He who had not had a hot bath for six months, and for three had worn the same underclothes, and for two, in clammy winter, no socks whatever, if the presence of Lorinda and Sissy was token of heaven, to slide inch by slow ecstatic inch into the tub was its proof, and he lay soaking in glory, when he was half-dressed, the two came in, and there was about as much thought of modesty, or need for it, as though he were the two-year-old babe he somewhat resembled. They were laughing at him, but laughter became sharp whimpers of horror when they saw the gridiron and meat of his back. But nothing more demanding than oh, my dear. Did Lorinda say, even then, though Sissy had once been glad that Lorinda spared her any mothering, Doremus rejoiced in it. Snake Dizra and the Trianon concentration camp had been singularly devoid of any mothering. Lorinda salved his back and powdered it. She cut his hair, not too unskillfully. She cooked for him all the heavy, earthy dishes of which he had dreamed, hungry in a cell, Hamburg steak with onions, corn pudding, buckwheat cakes with sausages, apple dumplings with hard and soft sauce, and cream of mushroom soup. It had not been safe to take him to the comforts of her tea room at Beecher Falls, already M. M's had been there, snooping after him. But Sissy and she had, for such refugees as they might be forwarding for the new underground, provided the stingy farmhouse with half a dozen cots, and rich stores of canned goods and beautiful bottles, Doremus considered them, of honey and marmalade and barley duke. The actual final crossing of the border into Canada was easier than it had been when Buck Titus had tried to smuggle the Jessup family over. It had become a system, as in the piratical days of bootlegging, with new forest paths, bribery of frontier guards, and forged passports. He was safe. Yet just to make safety safer, Lorinda and Sissy, rubbing their chins as they looked Doremus over, still discussing him as brazenly as though he were a baby who could not understand them, decided to turn him into a young man, dye his hair and moustache black and shave the beard, I think. I wish we had time to give him a nice Florida tan with an alpine lamp, too, considered Lorinda. Yes, I think he'll look sweet that way, said Sissy, I will not have my beard off. He protested. How do I know what kind of a chin I'll have when it's naked? Why, the man still thinks he's a newspaper proprietor and one of Fort Beulah's social favorites. Marveled Sissy as they ruthlessly set to work, only real reason for these damn wars and revolutions anyway is that the women folks get a chance ouch. Be careful exclamation mark to be dear little amateur mothers to every male they can get in their clutches. Hair dye, said Doremus bitterly, but he was shamelessly proud of his youthful face when it was denuded, and he discovered that he had a quite tolerably stubborn chin and Sissy was sent back to Beecher Falls to keep the tea room alive, and for three days Lorinda and he gobbled steaks and ale, and played pinocle, and lay talking infinitely of all they had thought about each other in the six desert months that might have been sixty years. He was to remember the sloping farmhouse bedroom and a shred of rag carpet and a couple of rickety chairs and Lorinda snuggled under the old red comforter on the cot, not as winter poverty but as youth and adventurous love, then, in a forest clearing, with snow along the spruce boughs, a few feet across into Canada, he was peering into the eyes of his two women, curtly saying goodbye, and trudging off into the new prison of exile from the America to which, already, he was looking back with a long pain of nostalgia. Chapter 37. His beard had grown again he and his beard had been friends for many years, and he had missed it of late. His hair and moustache had again assumed respectable grey in place of the purple dye that under electric lights had looked so bogus. He was no longer impassioned at the sight of a lamb chop or a cake of soap, but he had not yet got over the pleasure and slight amazement at being able to talk as freely as he would, as emphatically as might please him, and in public. He sat with his two closest friends in Montreal, two fellow executives in the Department of Propaganda and Publications of the New Underground, Walt Trowbridge, General Chairman, and these two friends were the Honorable Pearlie Beecroft, who presumably was the President of the United States, and Joe Elfrey, an ornamental young man who, as Mr. Cayley, had been a prize agent of the Communist Party in America till he had been kicked out of that almost imperceptible body for having made a united front with socialists, Democrats, and even choir singers when organizing an anti-corpo revolt in Texas, over their ale. In this cafe, Beecroft and Elfrey were at it as usual, Elfrey insisting that the only solution of American distress was dictatorship by the livelier representatives of the toiling masses, strict and if need be violent, but, this was his new heresy, not governed by Moscow. Beecroft was gaseously asserting that all we needed was a return to precisely the political parties, the drumming up of votes, and the oratorical legislating by Congress, of the contented days of William B. McKinley, but as for Doremus, 
He leaned back not vastly caring what nonsense the others might talk so long as it was permitted them to talk at all without finding that the waiters were remem spies, and content to know that, whatever happened, Trowbridge and the other authentic leaders would never go back to satisfaction in government of the prophets, by the prophets, for the prophets. He thought comfortably of the fact that just yesterday, he had this from the chairman's secretary, Walt Trowbridge had dismissed Wilson J. Shale, the Duke loyal man, who had come, apparently with sincerity, to offer his fortune and his executive experience to Trowbridge and the cause, nope. Sorry, Will. But we can't use you. Whatever happens even if Hake marches over and slaughters all of us along with all our Canadian hosts you and your kind of clever pirates are finished. Whatever happens, whatever details of a new system of government may be decided on, whether we call it a cooperative commonwealth or state socialism or communism or revived traditional democracy, there's got to be a new feeling that government is not a game for a few smart, resolute athletes like you, Will, but a universal partnership, in which the state must own all resources so large that they affect all members of the state, and in which the one worst crime won't be murder or kidnapping but taking advantage of the state in which the seller of fraudulent medicine, or the liar in Congress, will be punished a whole lot worse than the fellow who takes an axe to the man who's grabbed off his girl. Eh? What's going to happen to magnates like you, Will? God knows. What happened to the dinosaurs, so was Doremus in his service well content. Yet socially he was almost as lonely as in his cell at Trianon, almost as savagely he longed for the not exorbitant pleasure of being with Lorinda, Buck, Emma, Sissy, Steve Perefix. None of them save Emma could join him in Canada, and she would not. Her letters suggested fear of the UN Westerian wildernesses of Montreal. She wrote that Philip and she hoped they might be able to get Doremus forgiven by the Corpos. So he was left to associate only with his fellow refugees from Corpism, and he knew a life that had been familiar, far too familiar, to political exiles ever since the first revolt in Egypt sent the rebels sneaking off into Assyria. It was no particularly indecent egotism in Doremus that made him suppose, when he arrived in Canada, that everyone would thrill to his tale of imprisonment, torture, and escape. But he found that ten thousand spirited tellers of woe had come there before him, and that the Canadians, however attentive and generous hosts they might be, were actively sick of pumping up new sympathy. They felt that their quota of martyrs was completely filled, and as to the exiles who came in penniless, and that was a majority of them, the Canadians became distinctly weary of depriving their own families on behalf of unknown refugees and they couldn't even keep up forever a gratification in the presence of celebrated American authors, politicians, scientists, when they became common as mosquitoes, it was doubtful if a lecture on deplorable conditions in America by Herbert Hoover and General Pershing together would have attracted 40 people. Ex-governors and judges were glad to get jobs washing dishes, and ex-managing editors were hoeing turnips. And reports said that Mexico and London and France were growing alike apologetically bored, so Doremus, me agely living on his $20 a week salary from the NU, met no one save his own fellow exiles, in just such salons of unfortunate political escapists as the White Russians, the Red Spaniards, the Blue Bulgarians, and all the other polychromatic insurrectionists frequented in Paris. They crowded together, twenty of them in a parlour twelve by twelve, very like the concentration camp cells in area, inhabitants, and eventual smell, from 8 p.m. till midnight and made up for lack of dinner with coffee and donuts and exiguous sandwiches, and talked without cessation about the corpos. They told as actual facts stories about President Hayek which had formerly been applied to Hitler, Stalin, and Mussolini the one about the man who was alarmed to find he had saved Hayek from drowning and begged him not to tell, in the cafes they seized the newspapers from home. Men who had had an eye gouged out on behalf of freedom, with the roomy remaining one peered to see who had won the Missouri Avenue Bridge Club prize, they were brave and romantic tragic and distinguished, and Doremus became a little sick of them all and of the final brutality of fact that no normal man can very long endure another's tragedy, and that friendly weeping will someday turn to irritated kicking. He was stirred when, in a hastily built American interdenominational chapel, he heard a starveling who had once been a pompous bishop read from the pine pulpit, by the rivers of Babylon, the we sat down, yea, we wept, when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy, here in Canada the Americans had their weeping wall and daily cried with falls, gallant hope, next year in Jerusalem, 
Sometimes Doemus was vexed by the ceaseless demanding wails of refugees who had lost everything, sons and wives and property and self-respect, vexed that they believed they alone had seen such horrors, and sometimes he spent all his spare hours raising a dollar and a little weary friendliness for these sick souls, and sometimes he saw as fragments of paradise every aspect of America such oddly assorted glimpses as Mead at Gettysburg and the massed blue petunias in Emma's lost garden, the fresh shine of rails as seen from a train on an April morning and Rockefeller Center. But whatever his mood, he refused to sit down with his harp by any foreign waters whatever and enjoy the importance of being a celebrated beggar, he'd get back to America and chance another prison. Meantime he neatly sent packages of literary dynamite out from the NU offices all day long, and efficiently directed a hundred envelope addresses who once had been professors and pastry cooks. He had asked his superior, Pearlie Beecroft, for assignment in more active and more dangerous work, as secret agent in America out west, where he was not known. But headquarters had suffered a good deal from amateur agents who babbled to strangers, or who could not be trusted to keep their mouths shut while they were being flogged to death. Things had changed since 1929. The NU believed that the highest honor a man could earn was not to have a million dollars but to be permitted to risk his life for truth, without pay or praise, Doremus knew that his chiefs did not consider him young enough or strong enough, but also that they were studying him. Twice he had the honor of interviews with Trowbridge about nothing in particular surely it must have been an honor, though it was hard to remember it, because Trowbridge was the simplest and friendliest man in the whole portentous spy machine. Cheerfully Doremus hoped for a chance to help make the poor, overworked, worried corpo officials even more miserable than they normally were, now that war with Mexico and revolts against corporism were jingling side by side. In July, 1939, when Doremus had been in Montreal a little over five months, and a year after his sentence to concentration camp, the American newspapers which arrived at NU headquarters were full of resentment against Mexico. Bands of Mexicans had raided across into the United States always, curiously enough, when our troops were off in the desert, practice marching or perhaps gathering seashells. They burned a town in Texas fortunately all the women and children were away on a Sunday school picnic, that afternoon. A Mexican patriot, a time he had also worked as an Ethiopian patriot, a Chinese patriot, and a Haitian patriot, came across, to the tent of an airman brigadier, and confessed that while it hurt him to tattle on his own beloved country, conscience compelled him to reveal that his Mexican superiors were planning to fly over and bomb Laredo's, San Antonio, Bispi, and probably Tacoma, and Bangor, Maine. This excited the Corpo newspapers very much indeed and in New York and Chicago they published photographs of the conscientious traitor half an hour after he had appeared at the brigadier's tent. Where, at that moment, 46 reporters happened to be sitting about on neighboring cactuses, America rose to defend her hearthstones, including all the hearthstones on Park Avenue, New York, against false and treacherous Mexico, with its appalling army of 67,000 men with 39 military aeroplanes. Women in Cedar Rapids hid under the bed, elderly gentlemen in Cataraugus County, New York, concealed their money in elm tree bowls, and the wife of a chicken raiser seven miles any of Esteline, South Dakota, a woman widely known as a good cook and a trained observer, distinctly saw a file of 92 Mexican soldiers pass her cabin, starting at 3.17 a.m. on July 27, 1939, to answer this threat, America, the one country that had never lost to war and never started an unjust one, rose as one man, as the Chicago Daily Evening Corporate put it. It was planned to invade Mexico as soon as it should be cool enough, or even earlier, if the refrigeration and air conditioning could be arranged. In one month, five million men were drafted for the invasion, and started training. Thus perhaps too flippantly did Joe Cayley and Doremus discuss the declaration of war against Mexico. If they found the whole crusade absurd, it may be stated in their defense that they regarded all wars always as absurd, in the baldness of the lying by both sides about the causes, in the spectacle of grown-up men engaged in the infantile diversions of dressing up in fancy clothes and the marching to primitive music. The only thing not absurd about wars, said Doremus and Cayley, was that along with their skittishness they did kill a good many millions of people. Ten thousand starving babies seemed too high a price for a Sam Brown belt for even the sweetest, touchinest young lieutenant. Yet both Doremus and Cayley swiftly recanted their assertion that all wars were absurd and abominable, both of them made exception of the people's wars against tyranny, as suddenly America's agreeable anticipation of stealing Mexico was checked by a popular rebellion against the whole corpo regime. The revolting section was, roughly, bounded by Salt Sainte Marie, Detroit, Cincinnati, Wichita, San Francisco, and Seattle, 
though in that territory large patches remained loyal to President Hake, and outside of it, other large patches joined the rebels. It was the part of America which had always been most radical that indefinite word, which probably means most critical of piracy. It was the land of the populists, the non-partisan league, the farmer labor party, and the Lafollette family so vast as to form a considerable party in itself. Whatever might happen, exulted Doremus, the revolt proved that belief in America and hope for America were not dead. These rebels had most of them, before his election, believed in Buzz Windrup's 15 points, believed that when he said he wanted to return the power pilfered by the bankers and the industrialists to the people, he more or less meant that he wanted to return the power of the bankers and industrialists to the people. As month by month they saw that they had been cheated with marked cards again. They were indignant, but they were busy with cornfield and sawmill and dairy and motor factory, and it took the impertinent idiocy of demanding that they march down into the desert and help steal a friendly country to jab them into awakening and into discovering that, while they had been asleep, they had been kidnapped by a small gang of criminals armed with high ideals, well-buttered words and a lot of machine guns. So profound was the revolt that the Catholic Archbishop of California and the radical ex-governor of Minnesota found themselves in the same faction. At first it was a rather comic outbreak comic as the ill-trained, ununiformed, confusedly thinking revolutionists of Massachusetts in 1776. President General Hake publicly jeered at them as a ridiculous ragtag rebellion of hobos too lazy to work. And at first they were unable to do anything more than scold like a flock of crows, throw bricks at detachments of M. M's and policemen, wreck troop trains, and destroy the property of such honest private citizens as own corpo newspapers. It was in August that the shock came, when General Emmanuel Kuhn, chief of staff of the regulars, flew from Washington to St. Paul, took command of Fort Snelling, and declared for Walt Trowbridge as temporary president of the United States, to hold office until there should be a new, universal, and uncontrolled presidential election. Trowbridge proclaimed acceptance with the proviso that he should not be a candidate for permanent president. By no means all of the regulars joined Kuhn's revolutionary troops. There are two sturdy myths among the liberals, that the Catholic Church is less puritanical and always more aesthetic than the Protestant, and that professional soldiers hate war more than do congressmen and old maids, but there were enough regulars who were fed up with the exactions of greedy, mouth-dripping corpo commissioners and who threw in with General Kuhn so that immediately after his army of regulars and hastily trained Minnesota farmers had won the Battle of Mankato, the forces at Leavenworth took control of Kansas City, and planned to march on St. Louis and Omaha, while in New York, Governors Island and Fort Wadsworth looked on, neutral, as unmilitary-looking and mostly Jewish guerrillas seized the subways, power stations, and railway terminals. But there the revolt halted, because in the America, which had so warmly praised itself for its widespread popular free education, there had been so very little education, widespread, popular, free, or anything else, that most people did not know what they wanted indeed knew about so few things to want at all. There had been plenty of schoolrooms, there had been lacking only literate teachers and eager pupils and school boards who regarded teaching as a profession worthy of as much honor and pay as insurance selling or embalming or waiting on table. Most Americans had learned in school that God had supplanted the Jews as chosen people by the Americans, and this time done the job much better, so that we were the richest, kindest, and cleverest nation living, that depressions were but passing headaches and that labor unions must not concern themselves with anything except higher wages and shorter hours and, above all, must not set up an ugly class struggle by combining politically, that, though foreigners tried to make a bogus mystery of them, Politics were really so simple that any village attorney or any clerk in the office of a metropolitan sheriff was quite adequately trained for them, and that if John D. Rockefeller or Henry Ford had set his mind to it, he could have become the most distinguished statesman, composer, physicist, or poet in the land. Even two and a half years of despotism had not yet taught most electors humility, nor taught them much of anything except that it was unpleasant to be arrested too often. So, after the first gay eruption of rioting, the revolt slowed up. Neither the corpus nor many of their opponents knew enough to formulate a clear, sure theory of self-government, or irresistibly resolve to engage in the sore labor of fitting themselves for freedom. Even yet, after Windrip, most of the easygoing descendants of the wisecracking Benjamin Franklin had not learned that Patrick Henry's Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death meant anything more than a high school yell or a cigarette slogan. The followers of Trowbridge and General Kuhn the American Cooperative Commonwealth they began to call themselves did not lose any of the territory they had seized, they held it, driving out tall corpo agents, and now and then added a county or two. But mostly their rule, and equally the corpo's rule, was as unstable as politics in Ireland, 
so the task of Wall Trowbridge, which in August had seemed finished, before October seemed merely to have begun. Doremus Jessop was called into Trowbridge's office, to hear from the chairman, I guess the time's come when we need underground agents in the states with sense as well as guts. Report to General Barnes for service proselytizing in Minnesota. Good luck, Brother Jessop. Try to persuade the orators that are still holding out for discipline and clubs that they ain't so much stalwart as funny, and all that Doremus thought was, kind of a nice fellow, Drobridge. Glad to be working with him, as he set off on his new task of being a spy and professional hero without even any funny passwords to make the game romantic. Chapter 38. His packing was done. It had been very simple, since his kit consisted only of toilet things, one change of clothes, and the first volume of Spengler's Decline of the West. He was waiting in his hotel lobby for time to take the train to Winnipeg. He was interested by the entrance of a lady more decorative than the females customarily seen in this modest inn, a hand-tooled presentation copy of a lady, in crushed levant and satin doublure, a lady with mascara dial ashes, a permanent wave and a cobweb frock. She ambled through the lobby and leaned against a fake marble pillar, wielding a long cigarette holder and staring at Doemus. She seemed amused by him, for no clear reason, could she be some sort of corpus spy? She lounged toward him, and he realized that she was Linda Bike. While he was still gasping, she chuckled, Oh, no, darling, I'm not so realistic in my art as to carry out this role too far. It just happens to be the easiest disguise to win over the Corpo Frontier Guards if you'll agree it really is a disguise. He kissed her with a fury which shocked the respectable hostelry. She knew, from their new agents, that he was going out into a very fair risk of being flogged to death. She had come solely to say farewell and bring him what might be his last budget of news. Buck was in concentration camp he was more feared and more guarded than Doremus had been, and Linda had not been able to buy him out. Julian, Cal, and John Polycop were still alive still imprisoned. Father Perefix was running the NU cell in Fort Beulah, but slightly confused because he wanted to approve of war with Mexico, a nation which he detested for its treatment of Catholic priests. Lorindo and he had, apparently, fought bloodily all one evening about Catholic rule in Latin America. As is always typical of liberals, Lorindo managed to speak of Father Perefix at once with virtuous loathing and the greatest affection. Emma and David were reporters as well content in Worcester, though there were murmurs that Philip's wife did not too thankfully receive her mother-in-law's advice on cooking. Sissy was becoming a deft agitator who still, remembering that she was a born architect, drew plans for houses that Julian and she would some day adorn. She contrived blissfully to combine assaults on all capitalism with an entirely capitalistic conception of the year-long honeymoons Julian and she were going to have. Less surprising than any of this were the tidings that Francis Tasbro, very beautiful in repentance, had been let out of the Corpo prison to which he had been sent for too much grafting and was again a district commissioner, well thought of, and that his housekeeper was now Mrs. Candy, whose daily reports on his most secret arrangements were the most neatly written and sternly grammatical documents that came into Vermont NU headquarters. Then Arinda was looking up at him as he stood in the vestibule of his westbound train and crying, You look so well again. Are you happy? Oh, be happy. Even now he did not see this defeminized radical woman crying. She turned away from him and raced down the station platform too quickly. She had lost all her confident bows of flip elegance. Leaning out from the vestibule he saw her stop at the gate, diffidently raise her hand as if to wave at the long anonymity of the train windows, then shakily march away through the gates. And he realized that she hadn't even his address, that no one who loved him would have any stable address for him now anymore. Mr. William Barton Dobbs, a traveling man for harvesting machinery, an erect little man with a small gray beard and a Vermont accent, got out of bed in his hotel in a section in Minnesota which had so many Bavarian American and Yankee descended farmers, and so few radical Scandinavians, that it was still loyal to President Haig. He went down to breakfast, cheerfully rubbing his hands. He consumed grapefruit and porridge but without sugar, there was an embargo on sugar. He looked down and inspected himself, he sighed, I'm getting too much of a pod, with all this outdoor work and being so hungry. I've got to cut down on the grub, and then he consumed fried eggs, bacon, toast, coffee made of acorns, and marmalade made of carrot scones. Troops had shut off coffee bins and oranges, he read, meantime, the Minneapolis Daily Corporate. It announced a great victory in Mexico in the same place, he noted, in which there had already been three great victories in the past two weeks. Also, a shameful rebellion had been put down in Andalusia. Alabama, it was reported that General Goring was coming over to be the guest of President Hake, 
and the pretender Trowbridge was said by a reliable source to have been assassinated, kidnapped, and compelled to resign. No news this morning, regretted Mr. William Barton Dobbs. As he came out of the hotel, a squad of Minutemen were marching by. They were farm boys, newly recruited for service in Mexico. They looked as scared and soft and big-footed as a rout of rabbits. They tried to pipe up the newest oldest war song, in the manner of the Civil War ditty when Johnny comes marching home again. When Johnny comes home from Greece land. Hooray, hurrah. His ears will be full of desert sand. Hooray, hurrah. But he'll speak it as spaghetti pretty sweet, and he'll bring us a gun and a scenery. And we'll all get stewed when, Johnny comes marching home. Their voices wavered. They peeped at the crowd along the walk, or looked sulkily down at their dragging feet, and the crowd, which once would have been yelping hail hake, was snickering you beggars ll never get a grease of land. And even, from the safety of a second story window, hooray, hurrah for Trowbridge, poor devils, thought Mr. William Barton Dobbs, as he watched the frightened toy soldiers. Not too toy like to keep them from dying, yet it is a fact that he could see in the crowd numerous persons whom his arguments, and those of the sixty odd new secret agents under him, had converted from fear of the M. M's to jeering. In his open Ford convertible he never started it but he thought of how he had put it over on Sissy by getting a Ford all his own door Emus drove out of the village into stubble-lined prairie. The meadow lark's liquid ecstasy welcomed him from barbed wire fences. If he missed the strong hills behind Fort Beulah, he was yet exalted by the immensity of the sky, the openness of prairie that promised he could go on forever, the gaiety of small sloughs seen through their fringes of willows and cottonwoods, and once, aspiring overhead, an early flight of mallards, he whistled boisterously as he bounced on along the section line road, he reached a gaunt yellow farmhouse it was to have had a porch, but there was only an unpainted nothingness low down on the front wall to show where the porch would be. To a farmer who was oiling a tractor in the piglitted farmyard he chirped, named William Barton Dobbs representing the Des Moines Combine and Up-to-Date Implement Company. The farmers galloped up to shake hands, breathing, by golly this is a great honor, Mr. J. Dobbs, that's right. Excuse me. In an upper bedroom of the farmhouse, seven men were waiting, perched on chair and table and edges of the bed, or just squatted on the floor. Some of them were apparently farmers, some unambitious shopkeepers. As Doremus bustled in, they rose and bowed. Good morning gentlemen. A little news, he said. Coon has driven the corpos out of Yankton and Sioux Falls. Now I wonder if you're ready with your reports? To the agent whose difficulty in converting farm owners had been their dread of paying decent wages to farm hands, Doremus presented for use the argument, as formalized yet passionate as the observations of a life insurance agent upon death by motor accident, that poverty for one was poverty for all. It wasn't such a very new argument, nor so very logical, but it had been a useful carrot for many human mules, for the agent among the Finnish American settlers, who were insisting that Trowbridge was a Bolshevik and just as bad as the Russians. Doremus had a mimeographed quotation from the Izvestia of Moscow damning Drobridge as a social fascist quack. For the Bavarian farmers down the other way, who were still vaguely pro-Nazi, Doremus had a German emigre paper published in Prague, proving, though without statistics or any considerable quotation from official documents, that, by agreement with Hitler, President Haig was, if he remained in power, going to ship back to the German army all German Americans with so much as one grandparent born in the fatherland. Do we close with a cheerful hymn and the benediction, Mr. Dobbs? Demanded the youngest and the most flippant and quite the most successful agent, I wouldn't mind. Maybe it wouldn't be so unsuitable as you think. But considering the loose morals and economics of most of you comrades, perhaps it would be better if I closed with a new story about Hake and May West that I heard, day before yesterday. Bless you all. Goodbye. As he drove to his next meeting, Doremus fretted. I don't believe that Prague's story about Haig and Hitler is true. I think I'll quit using it. Oh, I know I know, Mr. Dobbs, as you say, if you did tell the truth to a Nazi, it would still be a lie. But just the same I think I'll quit using it. Lorinda and me, that thought we could get free of Puritanism. Those cumulus clouds are better than a galleon. If they'd just move Mount Terror and Fort Beulah and Lorinda and Buck here, this would be paradise. Oh, Lord, I don't want to but I suppose I'll have to order the attack on the M.M. post at Ozakis now, they're ready for it. I wonder if that shotgun charge yesterday was intended for me? Didn't really like Lorinda's hair fixed up in that New York style at all, he slept that night in a cottage on the shore of a sandy bottomed lake ringed with bright birches. His host and his host's wife, worshippers of Trowbridge, 
had insisted on giving him their own room, with the patchwork quilt and the hand-painted pitcher and bowl. He dreamed as he still did dream, once or twice a week that he was back in his cell at Trianon. He knew again the stink, the cramped and warty bunk, the never-relaxed fear that he might be dragged out and flogged. He heard magic trumpets. A soldier opened the door and invited out all the prisoners. There, in the quadrangle, General Emmanuel Kuhn, who, to Doremus's dreaming fancy, looked exactly like Sherman, addressed them. Gentlemen, the Commonwealth Army has conquered. Haig has been captured. You are free, so they marched out, the prisoners, the bent and scarred and crippled, the vacant tired and slobbering, who had come into this place as erect and daring men, Doremus, Dan Wilgus, Buck, Julian, Mr. Falk, Henry Vida, Carl Pascal, John Polycop, Truman Webb. They crept out of the quadrangle gates, through a double line of soldiers standing rigidly at present arms yet weeping as they watched the broken prisoners crawling past, and beyond the soldiers, Doremus saw the women and children. They were waiting for him the kind arms of Lorinda and Emma and Sissy and Mary, with David behind them, clinging to his father's hand, and Father Perefix. And Foolish was there, his tailor proud plume, and from the dream-blurred crowd came Mrs. Candy, holding out to him a coconut cake, then all of them were fleeing. Frightened by Shad Lee Ju, his host was slapping Doremus's shoulder, muttering, Just had a phone call. Corbo Posse out after you, so Doremus rode out, saluted by the meadow larks, and onward all day, to a hidden cabin in the northern woods where quiet men awaited news of freedom, and still Doremus goes on in the red sunrise, for a Doremus Jessup can never die. The end.